Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Song of the Dragon, The Annals of Dracus, Book One, by Tracy Hickman. Performed by Phil Giganti. For Jerry, my hero. Chapter 9 Mala The lightning edges of the fold flashed as Dracus stepped through onto the floor of the small temple. It was a minor community fold that served the local houses of the Akaran frontier, the farthest reaches of the imperial western provinces. Three weeks and a lifetime ago, Dracus had marched into this same fold with over eighty of the House Timuron Centauri. Now he stepped down the wide treads again onto the same tall grasses and low undulating hills. The gentle early morning breeze drifted across the slopes, rustling the young wheat in the fields that surrounded him. Dracus drew in a deep breath, taking in the familiar smells of the dewy earth and the faint tang of the seashore to the south that lingered in the air. His field pack was suddenly lighter. He longed to hold on to the peace he felt and linger in its embrace for a few moments more. So this is where you are kept a slave, then? The dwarf said quietly, his voice sounding harsh in the morning stillness. No, dwarf. Dracus sighed with contentment. This is my home. He looked back at his companions. As Chumara... Ethis and Thuri had no real faces for him to read, but Belog held his head high, the furrows of his broad brow now relaxed. The manticore, too, was glad to be home. So few, Dracus thought, would return to share that joy. Less than half his own Octian had survived, and the rest of their centauri had fared little better. Part of him longed to return to the camps at the foot of the Aryan mountains to see the impress warriors of his centauri and bring what remained of them back to these same fields, but his orders from the tribune were unequivocal, and in the morning air he was satisfied that it was so. Dracus glanced back through the fold, the liquid image of the previous marshalling field, a small plaza surrounding the crystal pillar of an imperial aether well still had several centauri trying to sort themselves out through the various folds around the open courtyard. Dracus turned his back on the war and smiled again. It was easy to discern the sets of parallel house totems, planted by the house mages and much smaller than the imperial versions, marking the paths from the temple to the various dispersed houses of the settlement. Dracus did not hesitate, choosing one of the paths and starting between the fields of knee-deep green blades of the young wheat, toward the top of one of the low, undulating hills surrounding them. The dwarf frowned, struggling to keep up as well as peer over the sea of stalks that suddenly surrounded him. Are you sure this is the right path? Yes, dwarf, I'm sure. I could walk these hills blind, totem or no, Dracus said, pointing off to his right. Over there is where I received my first field training when I was young. And there, he pointed off to the left. Those are the fields where I labored with my father and mother for the glory of the house until I was of age to train for war. A low-lying morning mist stretched across the shallow tide pools of an inlet to the south, draping the shoreline in subdued hues of blue and gray. Tall reeds slept in the shadows that ran up the undulating slope from the shoreline, quickly giving way to the curving lengths of field that filled the gentle rising of the hills with ordered patterns. Here the colors were awakening under a salmon-colored sky of low-lying clouds, set ablaze by the sun that was only now breaking over the eastern hills. Dracus reveled in it all. Belag, do you remember our first encampment? Those Cronossus campaigns, the manticore asked. No, I mean during our first training. Dracus shook his head. Down in the hollow, below the orchard. Jugar jumped nervously at the deafening trumpet sound coming from the amused Belog. He glanced up at the human next to him. I take it our manticore friend was amused by something? Dracus and Belog made the mistake of making their camp on the wrong side of the lake, said Thuri, shrugging all four of his shoulders. An easy enough mistake in the darkness, but when they awoke the next morning, they found themselves surrounded by their opposing warriors. 
by Thorgrin's beard. The dwarf swore in awe. However did you survive? Dracus laughed. <laughs> it wasn't a real battle, dwarf. We were just in training. Half the centauri were to engage the other half in one of the fallow fields. Mostly it was about teaching us centauri discipline, how to form Arctia into a force of centauri, that sort of thing. So, now what did you do? Jugar urged. He and Belog stood up and demanded the opposing warriors surrender. Ethis answered for the chuckling human. Fortunately, Sajinka pulled them out before any real damage was done. To either side, Belog grunted. Dracus smiled again. They were nearly to the crest of the one hill he had looked forward to above all others. Here, dwarf, he said with quiet ease. We are home. Rising on the next hilltop, the glorious edifice of House Timuron pierced the sky, blocking the rays of the newly risen sun. The magnificent structure was cast in stark contrast, its purple-shadowed face outlined in a blaze of new day. The Avatria of House Timuron, the towering central structure of all elven homes, was enormous. Rising almost fifty feet above the ground, its form resembled the graceful shape of an unopened rosebud floating freely above the subatria buildings on the ground beneath it. The Avatria's curving petals swept upward from its rounded base to rise to a slight flare at its pinnacle. Ornate latticework between the petals framed the panes of crystal, from which the elven family could look out upon their domain and know it was their own. Causing the avatria of an elven house to float in the air in such a manner was a common architectural feat among the elves, an ostentatious display meant to show that the house was of such wealth and prominence that it could use the mystical power of its aether on extravagance. Of course, as all elves coveted ostentatious behavior, every elven house, regardless of its size, had long ago adopted the form. Beneath the avatria, and seeming to support but never touch it with its sweeping curves and surrounding minarets, was the subatria, the ground buildings of the servants and slaves. In ancient times, the subatria was a warrior's fortification, a curtain wall of defense against enemies, while the elven lords sat secure and separate in their avatria stronghold. There still remained many of the features of the warrior's battlements, though distance from the wars of conquest had long ago softened the lines. Dracus raised his eyes to the top of the fifteen-foot-tall subatria walls. A lone human figure stood there, silhouetted against the dawn-lit enormity of the Avatria, and looked longingly to the west, looking for him. Mala, he murmured. Dracus, she called as he came through the warrior's gate. The high, curving interior of the curtain wall cast shadows onto the packed dirt of the narrow passage within the subatria, even during the midpoint of the day. It was known in all elven structures as the Chakrilia, the warrior's way, and its path curving around the center of the building led to the cells, mess halls, kitchens, and practice arenas, where the impress warriors were kept. Dracus had marched out through this canyon-like passage five days before, its breadth filled shoulder to shoulder with his fellow warriors. Now he felt small with so few of them standing in its cavernous expanse. But the sound of her voice cast all the loss, the pain and the loneliness from his thoughts. She was reaching for him through the crossed iron bands of the closed portcullis, separating the centauri wing from the other areas of the subatria. Dracus swung his field pack off his shoulders and tossed it quickly toward the base of the wall, where Belog and the others were already setting theirs down. He ran over to her, casting a quick worried glance down the length of the Chakrilia as he took her hand. "'You're not supposed to be here,' he said. "'And you've grown hair.' Mala Shay Timuran gazed up at him through her large emerald eyes as Dracus pressed her palm to his cheek. She leaned forward against the bars, the sink mark of the household easily read on the crown of her shaved head. She was half a foot shorter than he, her waist narrow, but her hips full and desirable, achingly beyond his reach. Yes, he laughed, but no doubt I'll be properly shaved and cleaned up before long. So you did return to me after all, she said, 
turning her face up to look into his eyes again. I prayed to all the gods each day that they would bring you back to me. All of the gods? Dracus smiled at her through the squared openings of the portcullis. Well, she admitted, her small mouth twisting mischievously. Perhaps not all of them, but certainly each of the house gods. You pray to all the gods and you're bound to offend one of them, so... Are we to be paired? Dracus choked slightly. Uh, what? I, I just came through the gate and... You said before you left that if the campaign was successful, Lord Timuron would look favorably on mating the two of us. Mala said matter-of-factly, her eyes taking on a look that Dracus always considered dangerous. The plunder was brought by the caravan porters yesterday, and you're here before any of the rest of the cohort, so... You must have honored the house, am I right? Amala, Dracus said, pulling back a little as he spoke. I don't think that's why we're here. Oh, but wouldn't it be wonderful if it were? She said with a gentle smile. You honored by Lord Timuron and the two of us paired? Maybe even ascending to the sixth estate? We'd no longer be slaves and could contribute to the Imperium on our own. Yes, it... Uh, would be wonderful, but I don't think... I'm not saying that it will happen, you know that, don't you, Dracus? Of, of course, beloved, but... It's just that it's such a wonderful dream. Dracus held her hand tightly for a few moments, uncertain what to say as he looked into her eyes. She had a lovely heart-shaped face with a small chin. Her cheekbones gave her face a sharp beauty. Everything about her he found desirable, but it was her eyes in which he always lost his thoughts and his heart to her. How could he tell her that things had gone terribly wrong in the campaign, that he was not even certain whether he had won the prized crown or not? Yes, they are wonderful dreams, Mala, and I'm very pleased to hear that the plunder arrived. Dracus reluctantly let her go. The Tribune has sent us back here to present the treasures to— What is that? Mala interrupted pointing toward the somewhat worse-for-wear pile of flamboyant clothing shuffling toward her. Oh, Dracus said, this is a dwarven fool, in more ways than one, I suspect. He's part of our spoils. We'll present him tonight for house devotions. Greetings, good woman, Jugar said, bowing as deeply as his restraints would allow. My new companion, Dracus, has given me only the most glowing reports of your beauty and your sagacious and erudite conversational skills, and I see now that he has portrayed them to me with crystalline accuracy. I am charmed and gratified to make your acquaintance. Mala stared at the dwarf. The dwarf answered her with a broad-toothed smile. Does he always talk like this? Mala said to Dracus from the corner of her mouth. Only when he's quiet, Dracus sighed. In the distance above them, a chime sounded twice. I must go, Mala said at once, pulling her hands back through the bars and quickly moving down the sweeping curve of the corridor that led from the Chakrilia toward the central garden of the Subatria. Will they pair us tonight, after devotions? Dracus smiled and called after her. If it is the Emperor's will. And why should it not be? Mala said brightly before dashing down the polished stones on her bare feet. What should the emperor have against me? Dracus smiled and turned, to find the dwarf gazing up at him thoughtfully. You have a problem, dwarf. Dracus was feeling suddenly annoyed with his diminutive trophy. Oh, not at all, not at all. Jugar replied thoughtfully. She seems like the absolutely perfect woman. She is perfect, Dracus said with pride. Then I'm very sorry for you, Jugar said. What did you say? Ah, well, the dwarf continued. You can't make a country without cracking a few heads, eh? Perhaps you should tell me something about this ceremony tonight. I wouldn't want to make a mistake and embarrass you. That reminds me. How are you feeling now, Dracus? Fine. The human shrugged and then stopped. He did feel fine. The song was completely gone from his head. Chapter 10 
cleansing. <sighs> so, how long did they say it would take? Jugar asked nervously through chattering teeth. The naked dwarf squatted with his back wedged into the corner of the dim room, holding a large brass ladle firmly in front of his manhood, and appearing resolved never to move it. An iron grating overhead allowed square columns of light to fall into the room, casting the dwarf and the human in shadows of stark relief. Draca stood naked on the stone platform surrounding the circular trough in the center of the room. Clear water constantly overflowed its edges, splashing down over the stones before falling through a metal grating in the floor. He held his own ladle in one hand, scooping water from the trough and pouring it over his head, cascading it down his powerful body. He then set the ladle down and picked up a pumice stone from the floor, lightly scraping at the dirt on his broad chest and forearms. "'How long for what?' Dracus asked casually. "'You know for what?' The dwarf's voice almost broke in his nervous exasperation. How long before that woman brings our clothes back? Oh, that. Dracus smiled to himself. He did not know much about dwarves beyond the easiest way to kill them and how they reacted in battle. He had imagined a great many things about them, but being prudish was not one of them. He was finding this fool of a dwarf to be most entertaining. As Senia said that she would have them cleaned at once and bring them when they were fit to wear, although she appeared to have her doubts about getting your costume presentable. But then she had her doubts about you getting presentable either. Jugar glowered back at the human in silence for a time. Then his features softened slightly. Wait. Hold still for a moment. Dracus turned toward the dwarf. What is it? Turn back around. A little more, the dwarf murmured, his eyes fixed intently on Dracus. Now, lean forward just a little. There. What are you up to, dwarf? Hold still, please. The sound of the water murmured across the silence. May I finish now? Dracus asked impatiently. Yes. The dwarf responded thoughtfully. Several heartbeats passed before he spoke again. Those scars on your back. How did you get those? Dracus poured another ladle of water over his head, brushing the remaining grains of pumice from his skin as he spoke. Which scars? Those rather nasty-looking scars on your back, Jugar replied. Who gave those to you? I'm an Empress warrior, dwarf, Dracus scoffed. We all have scars. So I have observed. Jugar continued, but these are particularly nasty-looking. I would venture to say that such scars would be most memorable indeed. So, when did you get them? Dracus absently reached his right hand around his side, running his fingers along the ridges of his skin. Why, I— <sighs> Isn't that something? I don't remember. Have you ever— Seen them, Jugar said through his still chattering teeth. Seen them? Now how would I see them? They're on my back. You don't know your own past, Dracus, my friend. Jugar's eyes squinted as he considered them. So perhaps you'll believe me if I tell you something about your future. Your beloved Lord Timoran has not called you back to gratefully accept your bountiful conquest, but to take out his rage on you. Dracus set the ladle down slowly, the features of his face hidden in shadows. That is no prophecy, dwarf. I could have told you that. I will be shamed before him. You will be more than shamed, Dracus. The dwarf continued, his gruff voice firm and sure. He will strike you, lay open your flesh to agonizing pain, and all your tears and protest and pleadings of your love for him will be soundless in his ears. He will not stop. Dracus stalked over toward Jugar, the silhouette of his muscular frame looming over where the dwarf crouched. The foolish curse of a dwarven fool! My master has never so much as touched me in anger! The dwarf looked up, the softened look of his eyes framed in the square of light from above. He would kill you if he could, Dracus. 
this very afternoon. But someone will intervene on your behalf and will save your life, though in doing so you will wish that you had died. Only gods can know the future, Dracus said flatly. The dwarf shrugged. That which has happened before will happen again. You've only forgotten. Remember my words, Dracus, and maybe then, my friend, you will come to me and know the truth. Dracus thought for a moment, and then shook his head violently, sending particles flying from his shaved head. So you're back to that again. Now I'm supposed to have forgotten nearly dying. One thing you should not forget. That Asenia and I will throw you into this trough personally if you don't get over here and scrape off some of that dwarven stench. Dwarves do not bathe, Jugar grumbled emphatically. That I most certainly believe, Dracus replied easily. But in this case you may want to make an exception. We're being summoned before Lord Timuron himself, and he takes no more delight in the smell of dwarven slaves than any other conquered race. Dracus and Jugar stepped into the warrior's courtyard. The impress warrior felt renewed after the bath, despite the dwarf's bizarre and gloomy predictions. Bathing was a ritual that was so basic among the elves that it made him feel a part of the empire that he so fervently wished to join. The tunic that he wore was that of a slave, but it was clean, and in that he felt a sort of purity, elevated somehow above the commonplace. He strode quickly across the packed dirt floor and through the open portcullis, with the garishly dressed dwarf struggling to keep up. They passed under the tall archway and onto the darkly stained sands of the small arena floor. Our lives to the Imperial will! came the echoing call from across the arena floor. Dracus smiled as he looked to the far side of the arena. Jarak! How did you get back so soon? I have you to think, brother warrior, the manticore replied as he crossed toward the human. Our master's eagerness to see you has left the folds in complete disarray. The fold masters, in their haste to comply, have been moving any units from House Timuron they can find. Dracus could see warriors straggling in behind Jarak. He shook his head. So the victorious centauri of House Timuron is home at last, eh? Hardly. Jerak said with disdain. I managed to come through with three Octia, but the rest of the Centauri is spread all through the fold system. It's a mess that will take days to unravel. I'm sure you'll manage it, Dracus said. I'm sure the only thing I'm going to manage is a bath, the manticore returned, a playful edge to his smile as he passed the human. You can straighten out the Octian. You're the Centauri master now. Well, if that is so, then I'm turning over this dwarf to you, Dracus said, gesturing toward Jugar. Excuse me, Captain Dracus, the dwarf sputtered. But, but, but I'm... Dracus, just Dracus, he sighed. I've not been appointed captain yet, dwarf. But, but, but Dracus, I've not been presented to your master as yet, as part of your rightful treasure which you so valiantly liberated from the dwarven realms. You'll be presented with the rest of the prize treasure tonight at House Devotions, Dracus said, interrupting the dwarf. Before then, Jarak here is going to see that you get properly shaved and branded for the slave you have become. He's full of words, Jarak said with disdain. Which is why I'm turning him over to you, Dracus said, flashing a tight grin. I've been summoned. Jerok gripped Jugar's shoulder tightly enough to elicit a grunt from the dwarf. I'll see it's done. Dracus turned away, taking several steps before he stopped and turned back toward the manticore. Oh, Jerok, I was glad to see you at the Ninth Throne. It was getting a little close up there, and I needed a friendly face in the mob. We'd have never gotten away with the prize without you. You saved our honor. I don't know what you mean. The manticore replied with a shrug of his great shoulders. We were stuck on that pillar of rock you left us on for another six hours before a proxy showed up to get us out. It must have been some other incredibly handsome warrior you saw at the throne. Dracus's smile waned at the thought. 
He turned instinctively to look up at the Avatria towering above them. He pushed Jugar's predictions out of his mind and crossed the arena to the Chakrila and his audience with his master. Shah Timuran sat upon the elevated throne and glared down through his black, pupilless eyes. Dracus kept as still as the cold marble stone on which he knelt. Since he had been ushered into the large oval room by the house slaves, he had waited on his knees, his head bent over in submission. Even so, he felt the chill stare of his master's blank onyx eyes. No slaves spoke in the presence of his or her master until specifically bidden to do so. No slave looked upon the master until directly addressed. So he had remained, with increasing pain shooting up his legs as the moments dragged into eternity. He was keenly aware of his surroundings. The audience hall was situated within the floating of Atria, its arching walls rising upward in the shape of wide alabaster leaves whose tips cradled crystal panes, each casting columns of light from a delicate lattice overhead. Curved stairs led down into the room from two archways situated between the leaves, while the throne itself floated at the far end of the oval floor. Standing still as statues at the perimeter of the room were a number of the elves from the household, paid servants who worked in the Avatria or as overseers in the subatria below. These were pressed against the curved walls well away from their master's position in the hall. One slave, the Lyric, had little choice in the matter. A waif-like human woman clad in a loose-fitting translucent robe, she was chained by a golden collar to the throne of the master. Dracus vaguely remembered seeing her, though if she had a name he did not know it. The Lyric squatted as far from the throne as the chain would allow. Only Tsi Timuri, Timuran's wife, and their daughter, Tsi Shabin, stood next to the throne with any affectation of desire. Everyone waited. At long last, Shah Timuran spoke. Drakis, he said, his grating, high-pitched voice hanging on to the last syllable, drawing it out like the sound of a snake. My master, Drakus answered, his words sounding too loud in his own ears. He looked up. Shah Timuran was tall even by elven standards, making even more pronounced the narrow features of his race. His sharp, narrow chin jutted out from the angular features of his face. The back of his head was elongated compared to the other creatures of the world, a protuberance that the imperial will had pronounced at once as unquestioned evidence of both the physical and mental superiority of their race. His elegantly elongated ears framed his face, and the hair that rimmed his protruding crown fell back in long white strands. He still wore a common lime-colored work tunic beneath the mantle of his house. The mantle was a required sign of his authority whenever formally holding audience, though today it had apparently been hastily donned. He held his long baton restlessly in his hands, the imperial medallion fixed to its head turning repeatedly, flashing occasionally in the column of light cast down from overhead. But it was the featureless black eyes staring down the thin hooked nose that held Dracus in such awe that he forgot to answer. Dracus! Shah Timuran repeated from behind a thin veil of patience. By your will, my lord. So, you have returned to us from the war, the elven lord said with quiet detachment. My great warrior, now leader of my Centauri, it seems. Chukong has fallen, and yet somehow, somehow, you managed to survive. Draco swallowed. My lord, my brother warrior Chukong was great indeed, and led the Centauri of your house to great honor. We followed him into the heart of the dwarven throne, and— Shah Timuran held up his long-fingered left hand, his right still gripping the baton. His voice wheezed with the sound of rusted blades sliding together. 
We have heard the stories of that final battle. Indeed, all the elven world, it seems, is talking about the fall of the dwarves. News of it having reached the imperial ear itself. How could it be helped since the house of Tajeran has ensured it to be impossible not to hear the tale? Shah Timuron's long, pale fingers twitched along the handle of the baton. Tajeran. Ah, that noble house of my neighbor. Shah Timuron stood now from his throne his voice rising with each step of his bare, narrow feet. A neighbor who shall never let me forget that a warrior of my own house, my own house, held the crown of the dwarves in his hands and tossed it into his hands. But, my lord, Dracus blinked in confusion. Lord Timuron was a kind master who prized him. Lord Timuron had never spoken harshly with him in all the years of his life. If you will but hear me, you will understand. Throw it to him! Lord Timuron screamed, his voice squealing with a sound like scraping glass. Tossed it to my neighbor's warriors as if it were scraps from the table! Instinctively, Dracus leaned back from the onslaught catching himself with one hand behind him before he could fall to the floor. Shah Timuron stood over the startled warrior, his hands shaking with fury. But, my lord, your warriors, we saved them for you, and I thought I was throwing the crown to— Save them! Shah Timuron's lips twitched into a hideous grimace. You thought— In a sudden eruption of rage, the elf lord's baton slammed against Dracus's face its medallion cracking his jaw. The sharp edges of its ornamental wings cut furrows across his cheeks and nose that instantly erupted with welling blood. Dracus's head pitched sideways with the blow, its power twisting him around until he fell with his face against the marble. Through the haze enveloping his mind, Dracus saw his blood staining the marble beneath him. Marble, he noticed only now, that had been deeply stained before. The pain of his broken face was nothing compared to the confusion that overwhelmed his mind. Dracus had fought and killed many creatures, human and otherwise, who had done him far less harm. Yet all he could think was that Timuron was good. Timuron was kind. Timuron was father to them all. Surely there had been some mistake. His master, he thought, did not understand. He pushed himself up, kneeling on the floor his hands clasped together as he turned to grovel before the elf lord. I didn't want them saved, you stupid, thoughtless humani! I wanted the crown! But now my neighbor has the crown, and in his appreciation of your gift, he arranged to have you delivered to me at once, so that all the Myrdin die would know which house of the western provinces gave away the greatest prize of the war! Shah Timuron shouted through a rage that seemed boundless, beyond control or thought. His hands were working the length of the baton handle now, twisting it and pulling at it. You embarrass my house! You embarrass my name! You make me the heart of every citizen's laughter from one end of the empire to the other! And you think that is worth saving the pointless, worthless lives of a few slaves? You will pay for the insult. Someone always has to pay, Dracus. Someone always has to pay. Who money always have to pay? The baton handle separated under Shah Timuran's hands, revealing as they pulled apart the long strands of a living fire reed. The nine fronds of the plant extended nearly six feet in length, a whip waving menacingly in the air as Timuran raised his arm above his head. Dracus's eyes went wide. His speech was slurred by the sudden swelling of his cracked jaw, but he spoke past the pain. My lord, the bounty we brought you, the greatest treasure of the dwarves. Bounty! Shah Timuran snapped. 
You bring me a dwarf and fool and an ugly piece of rock and call it bounty! Shah Timuron's arm swung. The fronds flashed suddenly through the columns of light, wrapping around Dracus's back. The razor-sharp hooks of the fire reed cut through his tunic, burrowing down into the flesh of his back. Searing pain engulfed the human as Shah Timuron pulled, raking the fronds across his back, their barbs tearing his flesh and leaving his nerve endings raw and exposed. Dracus's tears mixed with the blood flowing from his face. Please, he choked. I'll do anything for you. <laughs> Tell me, and it shall be done. Shaw Timuron, his hand raised for another blow, gazed for a moment at Dracus through the solid blackness of his eyes. Then, with a coldness Dracus had never known, Shaw Timuron slowly smiled. The fire reed whip cracked again through the hall, ripping at Dracus's back and tearing new furrows in his skin and muscles. Master! Please! Dracus sobbed like the confused child he was. Tell me what you want! The blows rained down on him faster now, the pain becoming an overwhelming, encompassing reality. Dracus panicked within himself, repeating the same words over and over again through the cries and sobs that were wrenched from his soul. Please! Oh! I'll do anything! Tell me what you want! The last thing Dracus knew was the sound of the whip grating against his own bones, and the sound of Shah Timuran's angry laughter. Chapter 11 Taboo Truly, Drakey, I'm finding this tiresome, spoke the reedy high voice, calling him back from oblivion. Drakus's sight returned to him slowly, along with his awareness. He was staring up into a hazy, dim green fog as pungent, conflicting smells assaulted his nostrils. I'm not dead, he thought, but I should have been. I thought perhaps you had finally managed to anger father enough to butcher you at last. The voice spoke once more with its dangerous, high-pitched purr. I'll admit that I was tempted to just let him kill you, trouble that you are. But after all the effort I've put into you, I just couldn't let you go. Not yet. Dracus seemed to float in a misty emerald void. He tried to move, but his muscles refused to respond to his mind, even in the smallest degree. His eyelids remained open, and his burning eyes were relieved only by the flow of tears that welled up in a constant and unbidden cascade. Panic threatened to pull his mind back into the abyss from which he had just emerged, but he thought of Mala and pushed the horror back down. He ached everywhere and his back felt as though it were burned raw. But it was more a general pain, he realized, than the deep cuts that had nearly stolen his breath for the last time. Shah Timuran's unbridled rage still hurt and confused Dracus. In all Dracus's long memories of his enslavement, not once could he remember Lord Timuran striking him in anger. Yet Dracus had seen enough war to know the meaning and intent behind those black, featureless eyes. It was unmistakable. Shah Timuran meant not just to punish Dracus, not to teach him discipline, but to beat him to death for the simple pleasure of doing it. What are you thinking of, slave? The voice whispered into his ear. Are you thinking of your little slave girl, Humani? Does it excite you to think of her? Dracus felt the black panic rising inside him once more. Where am I? What happened to me? Why, after all these years, would Shah Timuran wish me dead today? If he wants me dead, what is to stop him? As he struggled to keep his fears at bay, the words of the dwarf came back to him, and he clung to them for a time like the last bit of rope 
before the fall into a bottomless chasm. He would kill you if he could, Drake, as this very afternoon. But someone will intervene on your behalf, and will save your life, though in doing so you will wish that you had died. Are you listening to me, Drakey? The voice was murmuring in his other ear now. He could feel the hot breath on his ear as she spoke, and would have pulled away if he could. Oh, we've shared so much over the years. I've always kept our dark little secret, haven't I? But you, you've been bad to me, Humani. Very bad indeed. The dim ceiling overhead was coming into focus now, and again through his tear-blurred vision, the outline of arches converging in a dome above him with frescoes of vines set between the columns. It was useless. He did not recognize the room at all. It followed the elven pattern of design, but what its purpose was, or even where it was, he could not say. But the voice. He knew that voice. See, Shaban's voice. You left me here with nothing to comfort me. The elven princess pouted. And nothing with which to occupy my time in this forsaken frontier. Drakus felt the brush of silk against his right arm. The pinched face of the elf woman drifted into view as she sat next to him, leaning across him as she rested her weight on her hand. See, Shaban was young for an elf woman, impossible to guess in actual time, but easily placed as equal to human females of sixteen or seventeen years. She was far from a child, and yet not quite acceptable in elven adult company an age of being between. Her head had the characteristic elongation of her race, though the back of her skull had a gentle taper to it that other elves found quite becoming. She wore her long, silver-white hair up after the royal fashion, exposing her shoulders while at the same time covering the baldness of the female elven crown with carefully pinned curls. Indeed, her angular features, narrow face, and long, tapered ear-tips were— Dracus had heard, considered stunningly beautiful by elf kind. She looked revolting to Dracus. So I suppose you're wondering what you always wonder about now. She had been said through a crooked smile. She had been in a flowing household dress when he had last seen her in the throne room. Now she wore a vibrant blue silk robe, wrapped with a wide sash about her narrow waist. She sat upright and placed her bony hand on Dracus's chest. There isn't much time, so I'll just tell you. Dracus was suddenly, horrifyingly aware that he was completely naked. We are in the healing room in the Avetria. Shabin continued in languid tones. You're lying on a bed of healer's blade, and thanks to the aether well of my father, your wounds are being bound back together. I managed to stop Father's little self-indulgent rage before you were of no further use to anyone ever again. I had the servants bring you here, and I dismissed them so that I might tend to your healing myself. They never told on us before, so they certainly won't now. She moved her hand lightly up his chest. The door is barred, so no one will bother us. Her breaths came more quickly. He tried to think. Shabin was Timuron's only child, a pampered young woman whom he could only recall having seen watching the combats from the wall around the training arena. She had applauded him once some years ago. This much he could recall. But beyond seeing her smiling at him as she stood next to Shah Timuron at court for the presentation of each bounty, he had no recollection of her at all. You are always my favorite. Chabin said, the long, carefully manicured fingernail of her right hand scraping across the skin of his wide chest. See, Narusin, she's that insufferable girl over in House Tajeran. She always used to brag about her little games with a humani from her father's stables. Her father found out about it, though, and burned that slave to ash right on the spot. Narusin was devastated about it for weeks. 
Shabin giggled to herself with a strange, gurgling sound. <laughs> it still calls her that I've got you to play with, and I remind her of it every chance I get. By the gods, Dracus thought, this can't be happening to me. Marla! He had to get away, but he could not. His body remained unresponsive to his mind, the nerves working, his heart beating, his lungs dragging in air, but he could not willfully move. None of this made sense to him. It was a bad dream from which he could not awaken. The dwarf! His world had turned upside down ever since they found the dwarf. Perhaps the dwarf was the key to ending this horrible nightmare. Maybe the dwarf was cursed, or was a wizard, or a deity or demon who came into the world to plague him. I know you'll come to me tonight when you're better healed. It takes time to knit the tissue back together properly. Shabin cooed. The young elven woman reached down and began to unwrap the sash at her waist. But we have a little time right now, and you've been away too long. The sash fluttered down out of her hand. The silken robe parted slightly, revealing the skin of the young elf female from her narrow neck down past the hollow of her stomach. I know. I should have waited until after house devotions, she said through a sigh. But why wait? Shabin pulled her knees up under her, kneeling next to the human warrior's immobile form. She unpinned her hair, which fell down around her shoulders, revealing the long, bald strip typical of her race between her forehead and the back of her elongated crown. Shabin laughed darkly, then slipped the robe from her shoulders. Dracus drew in a sharp breath. Shabin was easily numbered among the greatest elven beauties in all the western provinces. To Dracus, her wraith-like angular and bony form appeared hideously cadaverous, a living corpse whose fingers now lightly stroked his chest and body. Ah, tell you what, Drakey, she murmured, why don't you just think of that humani woman you're always going on about, that precious mala of yours, and know that I I was the first to have you, that I am always the first to have you. Dracus could not, dared not, scream. Chapter 12 Hall of the Past Dracus stepped furtively through the archway and into the ornate hallway beyond. He noted with shocking clarity the pastel-colored walls curving upward from the polished stone floor. He felt the cool stones beneath his feet. Dracus concentrated on each of these aspects in turn, with fierce, single-minded determination, because if he did not, he would start to think, Has she quite finished with you? Dracus looked up into the face of Tsi Timuri, Timuran's wife and the mother of Tsi Shabin. He shook at the sight of her. Answer me, slave! Yes, mistress, Dracus mumbled. The older elven woman folded her narrow arms across her chest. Her long fingernails filed to sharp points, digging slightly into the flesh of her upper arms. She leaned back slightly her face all angular planes of displeasure around tight lips and glistening, featureless eyes of black. Her iron-gray hair may have been luxuriously long, but it was tightly constrained into an almost rigid form close to her long head. "'Can you walk?' she asked at last. "'Yes. No, I, I think I can, mistress.' "'Go on, then. Walk!' she said nodding down a long, curving hallway. The elderly elf woman gave him a shove, pushing him down the curve of the hallway. He saw clearly the disdainful curl of her withered lips and her accusing eyes. He tried to navigate the hall, but his legs were still weak and required his full attention to remain under him. 
The best he could manage was a staggering gait as he moved painfully before the contemptuous elf, prodding him forward. That was worse than usual, Timori said behind him. You should stay out of his way until devotions. For now, try to remain as unnoticeable as possible. Thank you, mistress, Dracus managed to say. That is most kind of you. Kindness has nothing to do with it, Timori snapped. I will have order in my house. If that means pandering to my daughter's sick perversions, or my husband's for that matter, so be it. Someone has to pay for these indulgences for the sake of this house. And better you than me, slave. Better you than me. See, Timori's voice trailed off behind him, but Dracus did not mind. The words had only been spoken to fill an empty place, and never meant for him at all. Now get out of my sight until devotions, or I will kill you with my own hands, Timori hissed. No matter how much my daughter considers you her personal pet. He realized with a start that he had come to the end of the hall, and was staring out from the framework of the servant's portal. Go! Yes, mistress. There were four portals that accessed the Avatria as it floated above the walled garden, each one connected by a delicate and ornate bridge to four matching towers that rose up from the walls of the subatria below. These towers were of varying heights, the two tallest reserved exclusively for the use of Shah Timuran's family, and the third for elven guests or officials, as well as the elven servants of the Avatria. These were each comprised of smooth vertical shafts and relied on the small pedestal fountains at their bases, small aether springs linked to the house well, to levitate or descend according to the blessings of the elven gods whose powers they invoked. The fourth and lowest of the towers contained the only physical staircase between the abatria and the subatria. This was the same staircase, he suddenly recalled, that he had bounded up so hopefully just a few hours before, the same rope-woven bridge that he had crossed gladly into the lower floors of the floating elven home, with dreams of a better future bright in his mind. He placed one foot in front of the other, and then frantically gripped the railing of the bridge. The cedar planks that had been roped together to form the suspended bridge had once passed so surely under his feet, but now they felt shifting and treacherous. He swallowed hard, closing his eyes for a few moments, hoping for a momentary respite in the darkness within himself. Then he opened them and peered over the side. The servant's bridge was just over thirty feet above the floor of the garden below, he judged. Surely that was sufficient room to ensure his death. All he had to do was vault the flimsy railings of the rope bridge. It would all be so easy and so quick. Mala would never have to know why he had done it. Mala... The thought of her gave him pause. She would not know why indeed, and the not knowing would hurt her too. So he looked away from the siren call of oblivion and made his way on unsure feet the rest of the way across the bridge. He would have to find a way to keep his shame from Mala, because he would rather bear the pain of it himself than be the cause of pain to her. Somehow, he made his way down the long, interminable circles of the spiral stairs until they ended at one side of the house garden. He turned at once, keeping his watering eyes fixed on the curve of the garden wall, his left hand reaching up to feel its surface as he made his way quickly around its perimeter. He bumped suddenly into the hulking form of a Manticorean gardener, a fat brute he remembered as Ruukog, who snarled at him. Dracus mumbled his apologies and ducked past the lion man quickly. He had to get out of the garden. Mala often was assigned to work here, and he could not bear to see her. Not yet, at any rate. He had to think through this, figure out how it was that his good life and prospects for a better one had suddenly turned to ash in a single day. No, he realized, not in a single day. Things had been going wrong ever since he had departed for the Battle of the Ninth Throne three weeks before. The terrible losses in the battle— friends and comrades with whom he had shared innumerable campaigns, as well as the loss of their proxy at the climax of the battle itself and the subsequent loss of the crown. Then there was the bizarre dwarf, whose endless prattle had suddenly, terribly come true, and turned his blessed life into a cursed one. 
Hail Dracus! Dracus snapped his head toward the sound. The wall of the house garden had ended abruptly at a long vaulted hallway curving back around to his left. The walls were covered with the picture writing of the elves and lined with enormous elven statues of each of the previous masters of the line of Timuron. The figures looked down with disapproval on the two figures coming toward Dracus from its far end, a short squat figure and a manticore. Dracus did not immediately recognize the dwarf, for he was shaven after the fashion of slaves. His once long and luxurious beard was gone, as was his mane of hair. His jowly and receding chin gave his face an almost infantile appearance, like a fat human baby who had been too well fed. His extravagant clothing was replaced with the common tunic, and his newly shaved head now bore the tattooed mark of a house slave. "'It is good to see you again, Dracus,' the dwarf said with careful lightness in his voice, his eyes fixed on the human. "'I have been worried about you, you know.' Dracus could only stare at the dwarf. Dracus, are you well? Only then did he realize that the manticore was Belog. Dracus took in a long, shuddering breath and looked up into the face of the towering manticore. The creature's yellow eyes narrowed suspiciously. Is there something wrong? He doesn't know, Dracus realized. Shah Timuran has not told any of the Empress warriors about my beating. No one has told them. Perhaps Mala doesn't know either. No, everything is fine, he lied. Shah Timuran was, was pretty upset about losing the crown, especially to his neighbor. But everything is fine. Belog considered this for a time, and then nodded with a grunt. Hmm. You are square, then. Yes, I am square, Dracus replied, but he looked away as he spoke. What are you doing with the dwarf? Jerok told me to bring him for shearing and branding. Ah, Dracus nodded. I see. So he couldn't stand him either. Where are you taking him now? They both turned to look at Jugar. He had wandered back down the long curve of the great hall, staring up at the wall above him with both of his thick hands clasped tightly behind his back. It's back to the barracks with him until he is impressed this evening at devotions, Belog said, although his furry brows were knitted in thought. I don't like him, Dracus. There's something unsettling about him. He can see the future, Dracus thought. Yes, that is unsettling. Just another conquest to the glory of the house, Timuron, Dracus said. Look, if you don't mind, I'll take the dwarf back. There are some questions I need to ask him. The manticore looked suddenly relieved. Gladly. How the gods put so many words into so short a soul, I'll never know. Better you listen to him than me. Then off with you. I'll see you at devotions. The manticore was already padding quickly back around the garden toward the north hall and the Chakrilia beyond. Dracus kept his eye on the dwarf. His figure seemed almost comical now that it was shaved and branded. This short, ugly creature had done more than bring them back to a world that was horrifying. He had predicted its horrors long before they had become fact. Dracus knew that the ways of the gods were strange and unfathomable to the mortals whose fates they played, but he could not deny that this dwarf had conjured questions in his mind that he had to ask and have answered. Dracus stepped up to the dwarf, and with a quick glance down the hall, spoke rapidly in hushed tones. Are you a god? The dwarf turned his chubby face toward the human. What did you say? I said. Dracus spoke with only a slightly raised volume. Are you a god? The dwarf smiled in return. Ah, you want to know if I am a god? Yes, Dracus replied. I see. Well, that depends, the dwarf said, turning back once more to examine the picture writing carved into the wall in front of him. Dracus stammered for a moment before he could continue. What is that supposed to mean? 
Jugar turned back to the human, his pleasant smile still fixed between his round cheeks. Oh, Trachus, my dear friend, if someone ever asks if you are a god, the only appropriate answer is, that depends. Trachus felt the warmth of his frustration rising into his face. Here, come walk with me for a while and I'll explain, Jugar said, turning to face back down the hall away from the garden. Trachus straightened slightly and fell into slow step next to the dwarf, who still had his hands clasped in thought behind his back. Let us assume that someone asks you, Dracus, if you are a god. If you were to answer them at once with a no, then you would disappoint anyone who might have supported you. And being embarrassed at their mistake and suddenly feeling you are much less than they expected of you, well, they would lose respect for you and not follow you at all. If they are your enemies and ask that question, then saying no is just an invitation to have your land invaded and your people slaughtered. You follow me so far? I think so, Dracus said anxiously. But I don't see what this has to do with... On the other hand, if you were to answer yes right away, and all your supporters were following you based on your word that you were a god, and then it turned out that you weren't a god, but just some fellow who didn't want to disappoint everyone by not being a god, well, they'd probably stone you right there on the spot and end your career rather abruptly. Then your enemies would come in and invade your land anyway and slaughter your people, so the result would be much the same, right? Yes, but so the only reasonable answer is, that depends, the dwarf concluded. It doesn't commit you to performing like a deity and lets anyone who might follow you do so with a clear conscience. It also keeps your enemies guessing, an altogether reasonable outcome for everyone involved. But you see the future. Know it before it happens, Dracus said under his breath. Or do you cause it to happen? Determining my fate. Jugar stopped, looking up earnestly into Dracus's face. No. No one determines your fate but you. But you... You knew... The dwarf let out a great sigh. Ah, <sighs> yes, I knew, Dracus. And I am sorry for it, my boy. But how... How did you know... The dwarf looked around them once more, gesturing as he did. "'Have you ever been here, Dracus? Do you recognize the place?' Dracus glanced around. "'Of course it is the Hall of the Past. Do you know what it is for?' Dracus shook his head. "'Why can't you just answer my question?' "'I am answering your question,' the dwarf continued. "'Do you know what it is for?' Dracus looked around him. Pictographs and hieroglyphics ornamented the walls, each set in various sized framing cuts, making a mosaic on the wall. There were the figures of elves, larger than the rest and more prominent. There were smaller figures of manticores and chimera, as well as humans. There were other creatures, too, which he thought mystical, for he had never seen them in battle. They are the histories and honors of the House of Timuron after the manner of the elven language. That's right. Jugar nodded. Can you read them? Read them? Dracus scoffed. <laughs> you are a fool. I may be a fool, the dwarf replied, but I can read these. Here, for example. And he pointed three quarters of the way up the slope of the wall. Here is where a Timuron participated in the expedition to the God's Wall and slaughtered ten thousand humans in the native kingdom. And here... His fat finger pointed a little to the left of the previous frame. Is where two brothers of the Timuron line were killed as they fought a dragon. A what? Dracus asked. A dragon, the dwarf continued. It is a creature of power and majesty not seen among breathing dwarves or men in three hundred years. They are, in fact, the source of the song that has troubled you of late. See over here and the dwarf once more shifted the direction of his pointing finger, is where the humans of the royal line were all called to their doom by the betrayal of the dragons that once had served them so well. It is written here that they sing this song now in lament. Foolish nonsense, Dracus spat. And this wisdom from a slave who cannot read? Jugar sighed once more, shaking his head. Ah... 
I knew your fate today, Dracus, because I could read you as I read the markings on these walls. Dracus shook his head in disbelief. Your back, Dracus. I read your back. Jugar continued sadly. When we were in the baths, those scars were too deep and the markings too regular to be anything but the fire reed whip of an elven housemaster. Combat scars would have been more varied and, truthfully, would have killed you had they come on the field. Uh, but they were also knitted back together with both elven skill and the power of Aether. That meant that someone in this household had saved you from death before, and many times. Many times? Dracus shook his head. This is the first time my master has ever beaten me. This is the first time you have ever remembered your master beating you. Jugar corrected. Dracus paused. Then how did you know about... about... about your house, mistress? Dracus glanced shamefully away once again. Those same scars. They were healed with elven powers of the Aether, too clean and regular to have been otherwise, and it had to be someone who cared not only about how you healed, but how you looked. Jugar shrugged. It happens in elven households, especially those of the higher estates. It is forbidden, of course, but the practice has gotten about among the younger generation of the elves that a warrior's, uh, well, the attentions will bring more power to their use of the aether. So now it has become a common, dirty little secret practiced in most households between elven youth who have too little else to occupy their time and the warrior slaves who have no choice but to submit or die and be forgotten. Elven society goes on turning its blind eye to the practice and is content to pretend it does not exist. By the looks of your back, this has been a cycle going on for some time. Shabin, Timuron, I don't remember anything like this. But you can remember, Jugar said earnestly. He reached up and grabbed Dracus by the shoulders. You can know the truth for yourself. You don't need the word of an old dwarf or anyone else for that matter. You want to know about the gods? I'll tell you about the gods. The gods know the future because they understand the past. You cannot see where you're going if you forget where you've been. You can be like the gods. You can come to know who you truly are, who you've truly been, and you can shape your own destiny. All you have to do is not participate in devotions tonight. That's insane, Dracus said, pulling back. Everything that has gone wrong in my life lately has been because I haven't been able to perform my devotions. House devotions are your problem, Dracus. Chugar growled in frustration. It's how they keep you the happy little slave. They make you forget the pain and the suffering and the loss and the agony of your existence every night. But if that's what you want... If you want to remain the blissful slave boy who wants to forget that his master regularly beats him into the shadow of death just for the pleasure it brings him, whose daughter plays with him like her personal filthy toy, if you want to be the slave who just dreams of a better life that will forever be promised and never delivered, if that is what you want, then take house devotions tonight and go back to sleep, Dracus. The dwarf spat on the polished floor. But if you do, you'll condemn all of us to sleep forever. Chapter 13 The Altar House devotions were the touchstone of every elven household. Each evening... From the over five thousand elves of the first and second estates assembled to see and be seen in the glowing courts of the Imperial Cloud Palace, to the handful of fourth and fifth estate elves gathered in a humble garden on the farthest frontiers of the Empire, every citizen and slave of Ronas gathered about their respective altars to offer their devotions. The ceremony was universal and unerringly prescribed. At the house altar, usually situated in the Sabatria Garden, although any large space where the house Aetherwell was located would suffice, every member of the household would gather. Each would arrange themselves according to their estate, those of the highest rank nearest the altar, with lesser estates in successive groups behind them, ending with those of the seventh estate, the slaves of the empire. The rites were conducted by the lord of the house, 
and began with the invoking of the emperor's blessing on the proceedings and rededicating the household to bring its actions and thoughts in accord with the emperor's will. This was followed by beseeching the blessing of the particular gods worshipped by that family upon the house and its servants. Each god placated in turn, their praises lauded and then chorused in turn by the assembly. Then the glories of the house were praised, and in the case of recent battles, its treasures were displayed to the house as evidence of their power and entitled rank in the empire. Only when the status of the house had been thus properly accounted did the devotions proper begin. It was the ranking member of the highest estate who first knelt before the altar, placed his hands on its surface, and murmured his devotions. Occasionally a house might be blessed with the visit of a member of a higher estate, and in such rare instances he would take precedence in the ceremony. But in nearly all cases the lord of the house was first to offer devotions, and such was true of House Timuron. His words and thoughts were thus communicated through the medium of the altar and its connected aether well to the realms of both the gods and the blessed emperor. The words of the supplication were always in the ancient elven tongue and conjured the aether magic, filling the house aether well with light during the Lord's devotions. Then by turns, each subsequent member of the household knelt before the altar, pressed their hands against the stone, and paid homage to the gods and the emperor whom the gods had chosen. For the slaves of the empire who were the last to approach the altar and universally the greatest in numbers, it was always a moment of rest and hope. To touch the altar was to touch, for the briefest of moments, the power of the empire and the gods. It left them with the profound feeling of being bound to something greater than themselves, and during the long days of their servitude granted them each night a sublime rest beyond anything else in their experience. It was this thought that carried every slave through the day, the anticipation of the ecstasy that came with the devotions each night. It was the embodiment of their hope to rise in status and some day become citizens themselves. No slave ever willingly missed devotions. Dracus could not keep his hands still. Standing against the curving wall around the central garden, he was uncomfortable inside his own skin though he could no longer feel the scars on his back. They still burned in his mind, causing his back muscles to spasm involuntarily, flinching again with each imagined strike of the fire reed. What's wrong with you? Belog rumbled under his breath. It was as close to a whisper as the manticore could manage as he stood next to the human. You look as though you were about to die. Drakus shook his head quickly. His eyes were locked on the altar. It stood at the bottom of the great curved bowl that formed the central garden of House Timuron, just at the base of the towering crystalline facets of the aether wall. The well plunged into the earth below like a dagger, anchoring the entire household with the land on which it rested and connected it with the house wells around them. Those in turn were connected to the wells of the houses beyond, in theory, until all the wells of the empire connected to the great well of the emperor in the heart of Ronos itself. He glanced above the garden to where the towering Evatria, supported by the force of the aether emanating from the well, floated just clear of the upper reaches of the subatria's garden wall. The underside of the Evatria was a hemisphere of fitted alabaster, carved with intricate patterns of inlaid blue sapphire. It was achingly beautiful, and cold as a tomb. His tomb. You can live if you choose, the dwarf urged from Dracus's left. You can know the truth, the truth about the elves, the truth about yourself. Dracus shot the dwarf a withering look, and then turned back to face the altar. Timuron was in the ceremonial robes that he wore each night, though he looked far less resplendent than Dracus remembered him in his mind's eye. He was just finishing his invocation of the Emperor's will. Now with his hands reaching above him, toward the base of the Avatria, it seemed, he called upon the gods Jolnar and Ron for their blessings upon his house in bringing to it the power of destiny and victory in battle. He looked away. Timuron had always been like a father to him, a demanding yet benevolent and wise master. 
He could barely conceive of the cruelty that he had experienced at his master's hand. And yet it had happened. And according to the dwarf, from the evidence on his own back, it had happened many times before. He suddenly realized that he had not actually seen his own back, nor was he likely to do so. All he had was the word of this dwarf, who so far had been filled only with words. Jugar had made a lot of promises and had not truly delivered yet on a single one. Perhaps, he considered, it was all an elaborate trick by the dwarf. But the beating the dwarf had predicted had been no trick. His near death had been no trick. And his healing, and what happened afterward. Dracus glanced at C. Shaben where she stood next to her father. Her black eyes were featureless, and yet he was sure they were staring directly at him. He shuddered again, forcing the memories out of his mind and looking away. His eyes settled on the members of the household arrayed about the garden for the devotion. The garden was largely empty, due in no small part to the fact that most of the centauri were still spread out among the folds between here and the battlefield, nearly one hundred and thirty leagues to the north. Nearest to the center of the garden were the elven guild overseers of the fourth estate, craftsmen who were in charge of the various divisions within the household. Sejenka stood among them, his patched eye giving him a more sinister look than the rest of the overseers. Dracus realized that he must have arrived that same afternoon. Had he come to watch the human die? He didn't remember him being at his audience with Shah Timuron, but he could easily have not noticed him. Behind them stood the fifth estate elves, the free workers of the household. These primarily included those who served in the Avatria, since slaves were not welcome in those confines, but also included a number of free guardians, elves who took care of the safety of House Timuron while the Centauri was fighting for its greater honor. Dracus's practiced eye considered them at a glance. Their stance was practiced ease, but they moved well and touched their sheathed weapons with familiarity. The seasoned warrior in Dracus measured the guardians as worthy opponents. There were no sixth estate in the Timuron house, a fact that only now bothered Dracus. So the last, arrayed around the edge of the garden, were the lowest of the seven estates, the slaves. The household slaves of the Sabatria stood apart from the warriors of the Centauri. Dracus looked down the rows arrayed to their right and quickly caught sight of a familiar face smiling back at him. Mala, he thought, how can I tell her what has happened to me? How can I pretend that it did not happen at all? She must have seen something in his face, for her smile fell at once into an expression of question and concern. He looked away again focusing once more on the altar and the ritual of the devotion in its relentless and prescribed cycle of words, gestures, and chanted phrases. There, arrayed about the altar, were the treasures that he had sent back as their bounty from the war. The pieces of armor that had been so impressive in their original setting now seemed short and comical when placed at the feet of the elves. One of the suits of armor had been carefully arranged to be holding out the black onyx shard that Jugar had called the Heart of Air. Here in the glorious garden of his master, it seemed like a pitiful offering, and it had nearly cost him his life. How could his entire world have turned so terribly wrong? The dwarf had prophesied it with frightening fated accuracy, or possibly caused it. And yet all along the dwarf had insisted that Dracus could know the truth of it for himself— that he didn't have to take the dwarf's word or believe in anything but himself. Dracus stared at the altar. He didn't want to know the truth. He wanted to embrace his ignorance. Dracus wanted to just forget everything that had happened. There was comfort in that, he thought. The memories of what had happened to him over the last few days, of the senseless slaughter of friends and enemy alike— of the horrific violence done just to capture a crown of a kingdom that had already been conquered, not to even consider the violence done to both his body and his spirit that very afternoon. All these things had caused him to wonder how he could possibly ever sleep again, let alone face Mala. That the altar might offer him blissful forgetfulness of all that was deeply alluring to him. He knew he could not live with the truth of his memories— so perhaps it was better to live a lie without them. 
Lord Timuron had finished his devotions, as had his family. The overseers were passing the altar now, each in turn kneeling and making their devotion as Timuron looked on. Those who were finished moved up the carefully manicured path out of the bowl of the garden and waited patiently for the rest of the household to join them. Dracus, the dwarf muttered behind him, all our lives are in your hands. You don't have to be a slave. You can be free. You can know the truth. I don't want to know the truth, Dracus said with a shuddering breath. He turned with Belog as the centauri was preparing to take its turn at the devotions. I want to forget the truth. Forget the truth? The dwarf sputtered. They began moving forward slowly. The free guardians had already finished their devotions. The slaves of the Sabatria were approaching the altar. I cannot believe I'm hearing this. You, of all humans, giving up your future, your great destiny, just to save yourself a little pain. Dracus snorted. He looked again to the altar. Mala was kneeling, her bald head bowing down before the altar as her hands pressed down into its surface. A little pain, he thought. You have no idea how much pain I'm giving up. The dwarf had followed his gaze. Ah, uh, yes, and what about that girl of yours? He watched as Mala walked up the path to join the other house slaves waiting at the base of the garden wall. She turned, and her eyes met his. She looked back at him without expression. What or who will they make her forget? Jugar urged, a vicious edge to his voice. You could die tomorrow, Dracus, and she would never remember that you existed, let alone that you— Shut up! Dracus shouted, wheeling suddenly on the dwarf. In an instant he grasped the dwarf by his tunic with his left hand, slamming his right fist into Jugar's face. From behind a nose that was bleeding and most probably broken, Jugar smiled. Dracus looked up. The entire assembly was staring at him in shocked astonishment. Shah Timuron raised his head slightly and frowned. Dracus released his grip on the dwarf, his breathing coming heavily. He turned from his astonished comrades and stepped to his right toward the delicately arched opening leading back toward the Chakrilia and the warrior pens beyond. Even as he did, however, a tall elven guardian stepped in front of him. You are disturbing the devotions, the guardian said in a reedy voice. Calm yourself and return to your place. I... I'm not well, Dracus replied. It was true enough. He felt overwhelmingly nauseated. I just... I just need a few minutes. I just need to breathe. The guardian reached down, his hand fingering the grip on his sheathed sword. You will feel better after your devotions, slave. Just return to your place and everything will be better soon. Please, just give me a few minutes. Dracus hissed through clenched teeth. He could see the Chakrilia beyond the guardian its anonymous space and emptiness inviting to his eyes and beckoning him. I'll be right back. I, I can't. I just need to breathe. Do as you're told and everything will be all right again. The guardian said forcefully, gripping the human's arm. No! Dracus shouted. Training overcame thought as the impress warrior suddenly stepped into the guardian, forcing the elf to release his grip. He reached for the handle of the sword, but the elf was too quick clasping his own hand over the human's and keeping the blade firmly sheathed in the scabbard. A gasp rushed through the crowd of servants. Belog, Thuri, and Ethis all remained in their places, astonished at the sight of their centauri commander striking one of their elven masters and uncertain as to what to do. The elves, however, reacted quickly and surely. Guardians from around the room converged on the disturbance. One of them gripped Dracus from behind, pulling him away from the first guardian, while a third immediately reached to restrain his left arm. Dracus would not relent. He flailed with his free arm, kicking as they tried to drag him down the path toward the altar. He kept yelling throughout, Let me go! I just need a moment! I, I don't want to hurt anyone! Just let me go! Several more guardians were rushing in his direction. Out of the corner of his eye he caught sight of Shah Timuron striding up the path toward him, 
The grim smile fixed on his face as he drew the long, curving blade from its sheath. Unnoticed in the spectacle unfolding at the base of the Sabatria wall, Jugar the jester slipped between the bushes of the garden. No eyes witnessed him deftly remove the armored glove from the dwarven armor, or, having donned it, use it to remove the heart of air from where it was displayed. Only Sejenka, embroiled in subduing the berserk Dracus, saw the danger as the dwarf leaped up onto the altar. But he was too late. The dwarf swung the heart of air with all his strength. It struck against the crystalline structure of the house Aetherwell with the precision that only a dwarf, knowing minerals, could achieve. The interior lattice of the well fractured in an instant. The power of the aether contained by it released a moment later. The aether well exploded into a million shards. In that instant, every slave of House Timuron, from the lowest scullery maid to the most fearless gladiator, suddenly and horribly remembered. Chapter 14 the fall. Dracus could not stop screaming. The garden of Timuron spun uncontrollably down into madness as each slave reacted at once to the flood of suppressed memories surging raw and unbidden into their conscious minds. A sudden terrifying discord of anguished shrieks filled the air, an agonized chorus of despair and pain. In panic, most of the slaves bolted from their ordered ranks, running blindly about the garden, chased by the ghosts of their own remembrance. Dracus noticed none of this. He arched his back so hard that the guardian elves nearly dropped him from their iron grip. The sound continued from his gaping mouth, animalistic and unbidden. His eyes were wide, focused not on the elven guardians or their rising panic and uncertainty— but on visions from his own past suddenly confronting him like phantoms escaping from the prison of his thoughts. Mother, first mother, real mother, stories of father and the time before, running with mother and brother, brother, recaptured and enslaved. Outrage and fear surged through him, blasting strength again into his muscles. He snatched his right arm free and began flailing blindly about. Mother dead in the wars. Her body never returned. New mother and new father. False family remembered. Brother. Where is my brother? The guardians released him, their hands reaching at once for their weapons. Dracus fell heavily to the floor. Beaten. Sold. Beaten. Sold. No lesson taught in each beating, the point being not to teach him, but for the sheer joy of inflicting pain and humiliation on the human boy. Sold again to Shah Timuron, because the elf girl was spoiled by her father and thought the human boy was pretty, and Shah Timuron could use another warrior. He rolled over, kneeling on the ground, curling tighter into a ball. Tunisia, his first betrothal, his first wife... He had forgotten her. He had forgotten so many. The sound of blades crashing together cut through his avalanche of thoughts, replacing them with the single clear voice of the dead Chukang come back to him. To stand still on a field of battle is to invite death to find you. Dracus pushed himself up, leaping to his feet, and closing at once with the nearest of the elven guardians. Instinct and training took over, pushing the maddening thoughts to the side as he concentrated on the moment before him and the enemy that he barely recognized as one of his own household. He gave himself to his instincts, not wanting to think or consider the consequences of his attack. He blocked the elf's frantic blow, arrested his sword arm, and in a single fluid move wrested the blade from the horrified elf's grasp. Draca swung the blade, rotating the grip with his wrist. The elf backed up, "'baring his teeth beneath his blank, black eyes. "'Dracus did not hesitate. "'He feigned a blow to the right, "'and then with lightning skill curled the blade over his head "'and sliced it into his opponent on the left. "'He drew the blade back and then thrust it forward, "'burying it deep into the elf's gut, "'and then turning it with a violent rotation of both hands on the hilt. "'Blood gushed over his hands from the gaping wound, "'but Dracus maintained his grip on the hilt, "'jerking it free and reeling backward slightly from the effort.' It saved his life. A blade flashed downward in front of his face. 
He stepped back on his right foot, planting it for balance as he raised his own blade to deflect the downward cut away from him. He spun to confront his next attacker. Don't think. Just survive. He locked his eyes with those of a taller guardian for a moment, but it was enough. A massive fist, its fur already caked with blood, connected with the elf's head from the left, driving it with such force into the garden wall next to them that Dracus heard the skull crack over the screaming chorus around them. Help me! roared Belog. Help me! Dracus turned to look at Belog. His golden eyes were fixed open, darting suddenly here and there. The human saw something he had never seen in any manticore before. Fear filled the flat feline features of his countenance. He reached out with his bloodied huge hand, feeling toward Dracus as though he could not see him. A terrible sound, like a thunder that would never end, surged down around them. Dracus looked up. The Avatria was falling. Bereft of the power of the Aetherwell, the elegant floating home of the Timurons first leaned to one side and then dropped straight down, smashing down onto the tall garden wall of the Sabatria with crushing force. Hundreds of alabaster tiles crashed down into the garden from the hemispherical underside of the structure, knocking many of the terrified household members to the ground. Several of the braziers lighting the garden fell over, their coals igniting a fire. Dracus watched in amazement as several Sabatria slaves, cackling as they danced, began pouring oil from amphorae on the fire, causing it to erupt robustly, its smoke obscuring the scene. As Dracus watched, an enormous crack opened along the curved foundation that threatened to collapse the entire structure on them at any moment. Training an instinct. Training an instinct. The human grabbed Belog's forearm. Gather the warriors! Dracus heard himself say, although his own voice sounded detached from him, a thing apart. Tell those who can to meet outside at the totem hilltop southwest of the house. Outside? Panic rose in the manticore's voice. We've no permission to... Belag! I am master of the centauri now! Dracus shouted, his face pressed close, filling the vision of the manticore. In the back of his mind he knew how utterly ridiculous his words were. There were no masters any more. No centauri. Get any warriors you can, and meet me outside, west of the warrior gate at the hilltop totem. Overhead, an overwhelming cracking sound shook the hall. Dracus glanced up fearfully. The amount of debris from the collapsing of Vatria above them was increasing at an alarming rate. Belog! Dracus shouted. Obey! The manticore's eye slit suddenly narrowed into focus. I... Dracus glanced around as the huge lion man turned and bolted off to his right. The garden was barely recognizable. Flames shot up from several large fires, their flickering light illuminating the shattered base of the Avatria that threatened imminent collapse. Silhouetted or illuminated, everywhere there seemed to be figures moving through the haze of the smoke. A single name came to him. Mala, he murmured. He felt panic rise within him again. She had been on the other side of the garden watching him just moments ago. Dracus leaped over the body of an elf guardian, trying to circle the garden around to the right, but almost at once he ran into a group of slaves who blocked the way. Several of them lay still in a spreading pool of their own blood, but more than a dozen others, wild-eyed and screaming, were tearing at something they had dragged to the ground. Their hands and arms were covered in blood as they pulled away chunks of flesh, tossing it behind them. He turned at once down one of the garden paths. It took him farther under the ominous rain of wreckage from the shattered structure above, but he dared not stop as he ran past insane tableaus. An old servant he recognized from the house knelt on the ground, his eyes fixed as he gathered up shards of the shattered Aetherwell and tried to piece them back together in his badly lacerated hands. Jarok, his own Octian brother, standing in the midst of several elven overseers, his short sword in his hand as he screamed joyfully and gave chase to a fleeing overseer who had previously escaped his attentions. Several slaves pressing their hands against the broken altar, desperate in their own way to forget the nightmare around them. A tall Chimerian leaped into his path, its forearms brandishing a senseless assortment of weapons, a broken branch, a bent brazier stand, and a pair of cooking ladles. 
The fact that all four were bloodied made less of an impression on Dracus than the look on the creature's face. Thori, Dracus said. Come with us. Join us outside. The Chimerian charged at once, shouting as he did, Freedom! Vengeance and justice! Dracus parried the first two blows in quick succession. No! Thori, stop! But the Chimerian did not hear or see him. He seemed to be fighting a battle in some other place or time. I won't go back! he cried out. You can't make me go back! One of the ladles connected solidly with the side of Dracus's head, driving him to the ground. He rolled quickly, the brazier slamming into the dark ground where moments before his head had been. Then he struck out with the sword, slicing at the back of the Chimerian's foot. Three howled with pain and toppled backward to the ground as Dracus got to his feet. White slabs of polished ceramic tile fell around him, shattering into dust as they smashed against the stones of the garden. He turned again and saw the path clear before him to the far side of the garden. He lunged forward. You cannot kill us all! He heard Thuri's voice receding behind him. You cannot kill— Then the words were cut short by the sound of a massive foundation stone slamming into the ground. Dracus did not look back. Impress warriors were fighting everywhere, some with each other, some with a group of guardians who had somehow managed to form a circle near the Hall of the Past to defend themselves, while others methodically moved among the slaves and overseers, slaying both indiscriminately. Dracus felt as though his legs were pushing him through water, the time itself was flowing against him, and somehow he would not reach his beloved before his world fell completely down upon him. Then with a suddenness that shocked him, she was there— Mala knelt on the ground before him, her eyes fixed forward. Tears streamed down her cheeks, cutting long, dark furrows in the dust-caked skin. Dracus crouched down in front of her. A great groaning sound was coming from the stones above them. The foundation was giving way. He took her by both shoulders and stared into her eyes. Training and instinct. Mala, he said firmly. She did not move at all. Her eyes remained unfocused. A small trickle of blood stained her lips. Come with me, he said as kindly as he could. I'll take you somewhere safe. She shivered under his touch. She had shivered at his touch before. Or was that another woman? Stop. Was she dying? Don't think. Act. Please, he said, shaking her slightly. I'll take care of you. Her eyes suddenly focused on him and she blinked. She started to giggle. <laughs> Take me? Dracus drew back. Sanity had left the woman's eyes. Take me? <laughs> Mala began to laugh. She threw her head back and started howling with laughter, hysterical and uncontrolled. Don't think, just act. He drew her up with him to stand, but her legs were unsteady beneath her. He leaned over and picked her up, draping her over his shoulder as he considered the way back toward the Chakrilia portcullis and the warrior's gate beyond. He adjusted the grip on his sword one last time, and then charged forward, trying to concentrate on getting free, on getting out into the open air, and then, maybe then, he could try to make sense of the terrible nightmare his own memories had suddenly become. At his back... The hysterical laughter had changed to dreadful, soul-shattering sobs. Dracus now knew the truth, but he did not know how he could live with the knowledge. Chapter 15 Flight Dracus struggled to reach the crest of the hill, then stumbling fell to the ground. Mala tumbled from over his shoulder, falling heavily onto the grass of the knoll with a groan. The totem at the crest of the hill was dark. Its inner glow vanished, and its ever-watchful eyes now dark and useless. Don't stop. Don't look. But he did look. He dragged his feet back under him, and standing on quivering legs, turned to gaze on the house of Shah Timuran. It was twilight and the ruins stood out harshly against the dim glow of the horizon beyond. Flames had engulfed nearly all of the subatria, the brilliant tongues of orange and yellow boiling up around the fallen of Atria. The once floating structure had fallen, 
and was now leaning obscenely to one side, the pedals of its exterior curves now broken and crumbling under their own weight. A great crack split the structure from the flames about the Sabatria wall to the shattered lattice of its peak. The Avatria itself was burning, too, the ornate, polished woods of its interior quickly giving themselves over to the flames. Black, greasy smoke rolled upward, staining the deep blue of the evening sky and blotting out the stars as they tried to appear. Drigus's gaze was drawn across the horizon. Other columns of smoke drifted into the sky. The house of Timuron was not alone in its fall. Tajeran, too, was burning, and at least a half-dozen other houses beyond. Someone behind him spoke. They'll be coming soon. Draca started at the sound, wheeling around as he instinctively readied his blade. The shapeshifter held up two of his hands, their palms out in a sign of submission. Relax, Dracus. I'm Ethis. Dracus squinted. A tall Chimerian stood facing him, his blank features lit by the orange, shifting light of the burning mansion. Who? Dracus blurted. Ethis. The Chimerian continued, his voice sounding oddly calm against the chaos of the burning ruins beyond. We fought together. I was in your octon. Yes. Ethis. Drakus repeated the name as though trying to convince himself that he knew it. Part of him recalled the Chimerian as a trusted and valiant comrade in arms who had served with him for many years. But he also knew that was a lie. Drakus had no real memory of Ethis before three weeks ago. Yesterday he had trusted this creature with his life. Now he knew him as stranger he could barely trust at all. How did you know where? Belog. The Chimerian answered quickly. He told me where we were to meet. Ethis held a squat figure firmly by its collar with a third hand. I also found an old friend of ours that I thought you might want to talk to before he skulked off, but I would not recommend spending a lot of time in conversation. Ethis shoved the dwarf forward, his newly shaved skull glistening with sweat by the light of the conflagration. Zukar! Dracus spat the name as though it carried its own venom. This most noble Chimerian warrior is certainly correct, Dracus. Jugar began talking at once with an earnestness that left Dracus feeling both amazed and disgusted at the same time. Our lives depend upon staying ahead of the news of our escape. As soon as those most dreaded hunters of the Empire, the Iblisi, learn of what happened here, they will descend upon us like winged death. We must travel far and fast. Nine notes, seven notes... Children hear the calling song of dreams, return to past longings. Then, pushing through the song, other voices and visions, too, from inside his head rising suddenly into his conscious mind, drowning out the music in his mind. Sejinka's face snarled at him. You're barely worth the food to keep you alive. Sure, Dracus, your father came from the Northlands beyond the dwarves his mother said as they washed their master's clothes. His feet dangled from the edge of the stone shelf. Must I tell you again of how we were freeborn in the wilds? Run! screamed the voice behind him. Run! Or we're all dead! Hello, mother, he heard his younger self say, but now he could see it was a different place and a different mother. Forget it, Dre! the tall boy said, smiling down at him as they worked under the sunshine in the fields. It's too far to walk, no matter how long. Trachus let go of his sword, pressing his hands hard against his ears. The blade dug into the earth, then fell onto its side. Trachus growled at the ghost suddenly occupying his head. Go away! Stop it! He thought that he might be going mad. He was certain that others had. He had seen it in the hall. Slaves from all the races suddenly plunged into a living insanity in which they had experienced things, seen things, and said things that... Dracus, my lord. The human opened his eyes at the roaring of his name, uncertain he had heard the words properly. Elog, his slave's tunic shredded, and his fur matted in places with both his own blood and that of others, now lay prostrate on the ground before Dracus.
face against the ground with his massive hands laid out wide in front of him. Different races, Dracus had heard Sejenka say time and again, show their submission in different ways. Humans usually kneel face down and bow before their conqueror. Chimera show their open hands and sit back on their haunches. Manticores, however, were said to submit when they lay face down, exposing their back to attack. Dracus thought it only a lie, as no manticore he had ever known would allow himself to live long enough to submit to anyone. Yet now, tears streamed from Belog's eyes as he lay prone, gazing with a fixed, wondering stare at Dracus. It shocked the human to see his fellow warrior in such a state. Nor was he alone in his astonishment, as a human and another manticore were standing behind Belog, gaping at the humbled lion-man as well. Please, Belog, in the name of all the gods, get up, will you? The manticore quickly got to his feet, towering a full head above the human. Dracus remained stunned. Was Belog actually smiling? I have brought two more to join us, Belog said. His words rushed with excitement. I hope that I honor you by presenting them in your service. Dracus stared at the two newcomers. One was a small human female whom he recognized at once as the Lyric. She still wore the gold collar around her neck, although it was now stained with dried blood. Whether her own or someone else's, Dracus could not say. The manticore he knew, Ru'ukog, the former gardener of House Timuron, stood quivering in the evening air, his massive fingers clenching and unclenching at the air around them. Dracus shook his head. Belog, I told you to gather the warriors. The manticore turned his head, gazing at the burning household as he spoke. They were all that were left, Dracus, all that would come. We are the only warriors who have kept our minds. But now th that I see who you are, I knew we would need a lyric to chronicle your deeds and a second manticore to witness your coming to the manticorean elders in Chinandria. Kept our minds. Dracus thought, staring at the manticore. How does one cope with a manticore warrior who has so obviously lost his wits? Dracus took in a long breath, then spoke quietly. I... I don't understand, Belloc. We, my brother and I, we searched for you. Belog huffed through quick, excited breaths. We had learned the stories from the wise ones deep in the forgotten wilds of Chenandria. They spoke of you, of the day of your coming, and of the power you would bring to the justice of the world. Dracus stared back at him. I know it all by heart. The lion man spoke with pleading tones. He will come with power to throw down the pillars of the oppressor's might. And you did, Dracus. You released us from our bondage. Wait, Belog. Dracus said, shaking his head. That's not true. I didn't. The northern prophecies? Jugar interrupted, stepping in front of Dracus as he spoke. Those legends of the masters of the desolation who once commanded the monsters of the world and would return again? Aye, Belog replied quickly. In the final days of the world, when hope was lost and darkness held the plains of Tenandria in their grip, a warrior king, a Humani of the ancient days, would come again out of the north country, beyond the Straits of Erebus, a living man from the land of the dead. He would walk the face of the world for a time, hidden from the eyes of the sharpest watchers, and then... Then he would make his great journey of conquest in the name of light, bring down the darkness, and usher in ten thousand years of peace. Five notes. Five notes. Your fate will loom, the weave of your doom... I hate to disturb this reverent scene, Ethis said with both sets of hands folded across his chest. But unless we get far from here very quickly, we won't be enjoying anything like ten thousand years of peace. The dwarf is right about one thing. We have to stay a step ahead of what's happened here, or it's all over for us. Dracus pulled his gaze away from the wild-eyed manticore with difficulty. Yes, we have to get away from here. The quickest way would be to use the folds. 
With most of the Centauri not yet returned, we may be able to get through some of them. And then what? Ethis asked at once. Do you have a plan, or do we just wander about the countryside pillaging until the odds catch up with us? Trachus considered the Chimerian for a moment before he answered. He suddenly realized that while he was surrounded by those he knew, several of whom he had this morning counted as more dear to him than his own life, he really didn't know any of them at all. Sure, Dracus. Your father came from the Northlands beyond the dwarves, his mother said as they washed their master's clothes. His feet dangled from the edge of the stone shelf. Must I tell you again of how we were freeborn in the wilds? We go north, Dracus said, his words defying anyone to contradict him. We make our way as far as we can, passing through the fold. And then we set off on foot. Such a wise choice, Master Dracus, a wise choice indeed, chirped the dwarf. I know those lands well, and leaving all modesty aside, an easy task, Ethis sniffed. I can tell you that no creature who breathes today can help you pass through those wide, untamed lands safer than Jugar Dragas, king of jesters, and jester to kings. You won't regret it, not one bit. I'm already regretting it. Dracus replied, But as none of the rest of us have any idea about the world beyond the totems of Timuron, we'll just have to bring you with us. North, Ethis said, raising one hairless brow. Why north? Hear the call of the song whispering. Follow the northern wind's call. Training an instinct. Because it pleases me, Dracus replied. How far north? Ethis pressed. Forget it, Dre. The tall boy said, smiling down at him as they worked under the sunshine in the fields. It's too far to walk, no matter how long. As far north as we must. Draco snapped, then turned to Belog. So, this is all there is, then. I. Belog nodded his great head. Many are dead. Many more have lost their minds. Others deny their own thoughts and can imagine no other life. We are all who have come. Then it will have to be enough. Dracus turned, but the large hand of the manticore turned him back around. Please, Belog said, his huge yellow eyes peering into Dracus's face. Tell me, I have to know. Belog, we've got to move now while... Please, the manticore said gripping the human by both shoulders. I have to know. Are you the one? Dracus let out a quick, short breath. Jugar spoke from behind somewhere at his back. Yes, the dwarf said with words deliberate and carefully spoken. Tell us, are you the warrior king of the prophecy? The hall of the past soared above him, not yet fallen to flame and rubble, but as it stood just hours before. Are you a god? The dwarf smiled in return. Ah, you want to know if I am a god? Dracus glanced at the flaming ruin across the hilltop. Belog, he said, his mouth suddenly dry. That depends. The manticore gazed at him, his eyes puzzled for a time, and then he nodded slowly as he turned away. Belog gathered the still-shaken Ru'ukag and the lyric to him, and then moved with them down the hill following the line of darkened totems. Ethis considered for a moment, and then gathered the cloth at the back of the dwarf's neck into one of his strong hands. The two of them followed the manticore and his charges down the slope. Dracus watched them for a moment and then turned and bent down, offering his hand to the woman with whom he had hoped for so much earlier that same morning. Mala, it's time to go. The young human woman sat on the ground, her face turned toward the flames. She spoke, but it was not for anyone's ears. I liked it here. It was terrible and unspeakable. But at least I didn't have to know about it. Now I'll have to carry it with me. And I don't want the burden. 
Was it so bad, really? Just to love you and hope for something better? Even if it would never come? Rather than to know it could never be? It was a lie, Mala, he said softly. But it was a lovely lie, she sighed. He drew her up from the ground. The others had already started down the slope, following the now-dead totems, their lights extinguished, back toward the fold temple. He turned away from the ruin of his former life and led her by her hand down the slope. Mala followed, her eyes looking back all the way. Book Two The Prey Chapter 16 Heart of the Empire Soen Chin Rei, Inquisitor of the Elven Order of the Iblisi, stepped through the delicately inlaid twenty-foot-tall doors, grateful for the warmth of the radiant sun that thawed his chill bones. The grand reception hall had been unbelievably cold, undoubtedly someone's interpretation of the Emperor's will, which even his layers of ceremonial robes were of little help in keeping at bay. It might have felt warmer to him, he reflected, if he had had any real interest in the proceedings. Imperial audiences were, it was true, generally convoluted and complex as the centerpiece of the game of imperial politics should be. And yes, there was an occasional death and even moments of honest surprise to be had, but this was a game for the ministers and masters of the orders to play not an elf like him. He was an inquisitor of the Iblisi, and his province was the truth, something generally unknown and unwanted in the imperial audiences. He stood at the railed edge of the emperor's cloud palace and surveyed the enormous city arrayed below him. The palace was currently facing west toward the setting sun. Its rays reflected off the thousands of gleaming of atrium that hung over the city like glorious lilies floating on an invisible pond. Many of those closest to the Emperor's own floating palace were of extraordinary grace and size, an obvious display of power and wealth that required no further word to be spoke on the subject. That they grew smaller and, in his eye, more reasonable the farther they were situated toward the horizon— was yet another indication that he was standing at the very center around which the entire world revolved. At least for today, he thought with a frown. For today. Below him and between the forest of Avatrium, Soen caught sight of the Colosseum and the northern edge of the Great Circus. Several gladiators were practicing on the Colosseum floor, smaller than ants to his eye at this distance. Almost overshadowing them was the towering Evetri of Mir Dindai, the center of that order's mystical power and teachings. The Mir Dindai were currently basking in the glory of their contribution to the victory over the last of the dwarven kings. Their planning, execution, and management of the folds had been publicly recognized as a contributing factor in the conquest, and the grace of the imperial thanks rested with them. This praise went down very hard with the Okuran, the order that was in constant competition with the Mir Dindai for control of the Aether and the network of folds that it powered. The Mir Dindai's recent management of the fold system for the war seemed to be a shift in the imperial favor, and the Okuran were forced to offer their respects with as much dignity as society demanded. His own order, the Iblisi, was closely tied to the Okuran. Soen's presence at the audience today was intended to demonstrate to the Mir Dindai that the Iblisi would not be diminished in the eyes of the Emperor, despite their ties to the Okuran. He sighed and looked west down the curving length of the wide avenue known as the Vira Ronas, until his gaze drifted to the horizon and the setting sun. How did I come to this? he thought, as he shifted uncomfortably in the layered exquisite robes an inquisitor of the Iblisi whose very name has been whispered with dread and awe in the farthest outposts of the Empire. And now I stand here as an errand boy fawning to the Imperial will. He had seen more of the Empire than any other living elf, so far as he knew, and at that it was only a fraction of the glory that rested under the sure hand of the Emperor. 
He had stalked rebel manticores across their own rolling plains in the Chenandrian reaches. He had sailed in war galleys against the separatists of the Beni Siles and infiltrated the conspiracy of the Ergus coast barons. That was what had done him in. The fall of the barons had whispered his name in the imperial ear. He was no longer an inquisitor, but had somehow transcended that to become a symbol, the incarnation of Iblisi fealty to the emperor and his damnable will. That Soen's original mission had been merely to investigate whether the Iblisi should give covert aid to the barons was conveniently washed away in a sea of sophistry, and he emerged from the cleansing a pure hero and loyal servant of the empire. Such was his fate, a comedy for the enjoyment of the gods while he languished in the cold heart of imperial glory. Soen turned from the railing. Such melancholy did not become him, he decided, as he stepped across the polished granite, rounding the path that circumnavigated the base of the Cloud Palace's enormous avatria. Though the way was broad, it quickly became crowded with petitioners, guildmasters, clerks, magistrates, and ministers, not to mention the ubiquitous Cloud Guardians. Soen knew from the chevrons on their breastplates that the guardians were of the Order of the Vash, one of three separate military orders who vied for imperial favor in the empire. Each maintained their headquarters within the boundaries of Su Zhen's wall, the demarcation of the older part of the city, and romantically considered the most blessed by the gods. The Iblisi had a number of agreements in place with the Vash, and often supported them in their dealings with the Ministry of Conquest. Their being entrusted as the Cloud Guardians, replacing the Order of the Krish, should have worked to his advantage. But no advantage, it seemed, could get him off of the Cloud Palace any faster. There were seven towers rising from the perimeter of the garden far below and surrounding the great palace's hovering of Atria. Each tower represented one of the seven estates of elven society, and each provided ascending and descending shaft access to the palace, limited, of course, to those of a specified estate or higher. That he would mix at all with the sixth or fifth estate traffic was unthinkable, and though he could see the fourth tower entrance, the very thought of packing himself in with the rest of the lowing herd of guild traffic made his skin crawl. He could, he knew, turn and re-enter the palace itself, but that held the danger of encountering someone that he either knew or should know, and thereby being trapped in yet another round of favor-trading, positioning, and influence-bargaining all delivered in subtext, context, and always from behind a smile. Though he personally had an intense dislike of being touched by anyone, he would rather push his way through a mob than deal with another politician. He managed to cut his own path through the throng, and was relieved to see the wide walkway beyond leading to the Tower of the Third Estate free of all but a handful of masters and ministers. He quickly followed the gleaming path as it continued around the base of the Cloud Palace, until it came at last to a nearly deserted platform and its bridge to the third tower. Soen had long ago set aside the privileges associated with being a descendant of a noble house, but at times like this, he reflected, it had its convenient uses. He quickly crossed the bridge with its crystal lattice railings and ornate renderings of the crests of those houses that had donated to its construction. Then he passed through the archway into the tower itself, Soen stood on a wide platform opening onto one of two shafts that plunged down the full height of the towers. This one was the descending shaft and was filled with a blue swirling light. He stepped out over the precipice without hesitation and began his slow drift downward through the air. It was a fine defensive mechanism, he thought, as he drifted down past the occasional window cut into the curved wall. You had to have access to the aether to use the shaft, and the only ones who had access to the Aether were the elves. Soen frowned. The elves had not always been the only ones to command the power of Aether, he knew. But that fact was only one grain of sand in the mountain of secrets that he and all of the Iblisi kept. Keeping the truth safe was the essence of their work. The Iblisi's feet touched softly on the fitted stones at the base of the third tower, and he stepped quickly through the arch opening into the evening air. The garden of Kuchen spread before him, teeming with elves as was common at this time late in the day. 
The setting sun cast a warm glow across the wide garden. It was a beautiful place, carefully manicured and maintained in honor of the emperor's wife, for whom it was currently named, and shaded over all by the titanic bulk of the cloud palace directly overhead. It smelled green and alive, and called to the souls of the elves who came to it each day that they might forget the walls they had built to enclose themselves, and the desperation of their spirits that longed for open space, but had compromised themselves into servitude to the will of the emperor in all its incarnations. Soen hated it, for it reminded him of the true fields and green spaces that were far from this place. Having tasted of its truth, it was hard for him to endure the lie, so he walked around the edge of the garden as quickly as he could on the south side, following the fitted cobblestones of the Vera Ronas, past where they intersected with the Vera Condemnus to the south. He barely glanced in the direction of the forums of the estates, which stood behind rows of standing columns down the arcade to his left. Both the circus and the Colosseum could be found in that direction, but he had little use for the games and no time for them in any event. Beyond the forms, the Vera Ronas widened, cutting a broad, curving path through the heart of the imperial city that was nearly as old as the empire itself. The Vera was just beginning to come to life with the evening revels. Litters supported by teams of Manticorean slaves quickly jogged up and down the street, bearing their masters to and fro at their whim. A number of Fifth Estate hawkers served their guild orders by calling out their wares to the growing crowd. As he walked down the street, Soen saw a dwarf, a rare enough sight even in the Imperial City, dancing nervously before a group of jeering elven youth. They prodded the stumpy creature with their ornamental swords. Soen shook his head. Poor dwarf. The youth today had taken to wearing these next-to-useless engraved blades as a fashion. Now, with the news of the victory over the last kingdom, that dwarf was almost certain not to live through the night of celebrations. Next, his eye was caught by a string of Musarian slaves, orange-hued barbarian elves from the southern Ergus coast, being pulled wide-eyed behind a Manticorean overseer. He walked beside them, eyeing them with mild curiosity, before the overseer turned southward toward the Vera Colosseum. They were destined for one of the newer noble houses that had sprung up on the west side of the river Jolnar, against the Manarian hills, so one thought idly. Poor fools! But poor fools aren't we all, he reflected, as he continued between the buildings on either side of the paved stones. The structures on his right were known collectively as the ministries. There were no fewer than thirteen separate main ministries, and more than an equal number of sub-ministries making up each of those. The mandates of the various ministries overlapped each other in the most confusing of ways, and yet it was the Emperor's will not only that this mess not be straightened out, but that it reflected a wonderful redundancy in the government that should one ministry fail to work toward the imperial will, then another would surely do so. The jurisdictional battles among the separate ministries of health, nutrition, and, for reasons beyond Soen's understanding, caravans were perennial. The Ministry of War and the Ministry of Security, it was said, fought more battles between them as allies in the Emperor's will than in the field against any enemy. This was further complicated by the strict caste system of the estates, which dated back to the founding of the empire by Ronas, and which had since those ancient days been so carefully codified that progression between the estates was, by imperial decree, to rest only in the hands of the emperor personally. Then there were the orders of the empire, guilds, elite military orders, wizardry unions, and other specialized clans that vied to force their own agendas and ascendancy in power on the Emperor's will. Each had its own combination of gods they worshipped, and unique pacts with other orders, allegiances, and enmities. Membership in the orders transcended castes, at least in theory. Any caste could be a member of any order by application, but the vagaries and secrecy in the selection process were such that each order had effective control over the makeup of its membership. The orders were diverse, but only so far as their strength and power were supported. None of which accounted for the rather public and often bloody conflicts of the vaunted forums. 
one for the estate lords, and the other the voice of the common elf, whatever that was supposed to mean. Soen shook his head and smiled. By the Emperor's will it all works perfectly. The Inquisitor came to the end of the Vera Ronas and stepped onto the God's Bridge. It was one of the oldest bridges of the Nine crossing the Jolnar, and led to the oldest part of the city, the Isle of the Gods. It was not a terribly impressive island as such. It sat as a rocky spit of ground between two branches of the river Jolnar that obligingly flowed around it. Still, as legend would have it, it was the place where Ronas drove his spear into the ground and declared this spot to be where he would found his empire. The first temples were built here. There were newer and more spacious temples in the districts beyond Siujin's Wall, but the temples on this sliver of land were still the most revered by the Ronasians. Soen crossed the bridge and passed among the ancient buildings. The Okuran made their home here, a privilege granted them by the emperor just short of one hundred years ago, but now their favor was waning, and Soen wondered just how long it would be before the imperial will got around to evicting the Okuran as neighbors to the gods, and just what the Okuran would do about it. Soen crossed the small island and came to the north bridge. On the other side of the river rose the squat, angular walls of the old keep. They were designed in a time before the Aether, when war was waged as it should be, with hand on steel. It was the oldest structure in the city and the home of his own order. Soen took in a deep breath. Ministries, orders, estates. By the Emperor's will all worked perfectly because it was the Emperor's will that it be so. To say otherwise was treason. To think otherwise was disloyal. To be otherwise was unacceptable. So the perfection was maintained not in practice, but in perception. The knowledge that the current emperor ascended to the throne by murdering the previous emperor as he was distracted by his lust for the wife of a recently assassinated guildmaster was not working toward the imperial will. Indeed, that the entire history of the Ronas Empire was filled with such unpleasant, vicious, horrifying events was also seen as not working toward the imperial will. The concern for the solidarity, security, and loyalty of the greatest elven nation in all history extended itself down through every ministry, order, and estate as well. Anything unpleasant need not be true if it is not known. So their own histories were constantly rewritten for the sake of working toward the imperial will. Each part of the body politic played a vital role, but to Soen, none so important as the role his own order played, nor so dangerous. The Iblisi alone existed to know the truth, and it was their task to make sure that no one discovered it. Chapter 17 The Keeper The old keep was a misnomer. It was more of a fortress than a keep proper. The angular path of its massive outer walls combined with those of matching trenches designed to both stop the enemy and inflict as much damage on them as possible. It was the oldest remaining structure in the city, said by many to have been built by the hand of the first emperor, Rowan Sa Tzu himself. The keep's antiquity was apparent at a single glance, for it lacked the grace and fine curving lines of the more recent structures of the empire. To the critical elven eye it was vaguely offensive as a brutish, massive, and graceless pile of carefully fitted stones that was an unpleasant reminder of dark origins best forgotten. Soen never failed to smile at the irony of the thought each time he crossed the courtyard of the keep, for now the building itself fulfilled that same function which its visage inspired. Within its walls, so anew, were kept all the unpleasant reminders of their dark origins safely hidden from view. The Inquisitor stepped through the dark archway of an angular tower and with rapid steps made his way down a worn circular staircase. Under any other circumstances he would have already been removing the ceremonial trappings of his official robes, there were books, scrolls, maps, and tapestries in the forbidden grotto that were calling to him. He longed to lose the present and the writings of the past. 
but he had one final duty to perform before he could comfortably claim some time for himself. So he turned off the staircase. How marvelous to have to use stairs, he thought, and made his way down the long central corridor. Several of his fellow inquisitors passed him, though none acknowledged him in any way. It was just another sign in a long and seemingly endless series of signs that his presence here was considered unearned and unwelcome. It was of no real concern to him if they didn't want him here. He didn't want to be here either. The corridor opened into a large antechamber, but waiting was not Soen's intention. He turned at once to the black doors of oiled wood and pulled them open. Ah, Inquisitor Soen Chinrei. The raspy alto voice came from the far end of the chamber, dark as the polished slate of the floor over which it rolled. Keeper Shidray. So one replied, bowing deeply. I have come to report on the proceedings for today's audience between the Emperor and... No. Shidray held up her pale hand. Close the doors behind you. There are too many ears who prey on my word. Soen stopped speaking at once. He was a trained observer, and knew when it was time to talk, when it was time to listen. You learn more when you stop speaking, was a motto that had served him well. He quietly closed the heavy doors, then turned back to face into the hall again. The room did not have the vaulted ceilings so prized in later architecture. Like the fortress surrounding it, the keeper's hall was oppressive, its ceiling hanging low overhead and supported by thick, squat pillars. The walls of the room were dark, so that the glowing light from the globe sconces on each pillar was swallowed up in the blackness. At the end of the hall, opposite the entrance doors, sat the throne of the keeper atop three steps of a dais. Three steps were all it could afford without forcing the keeper to strike her head on the low ceiling whenever she stood. On that throne... Chidre pressed the long fingers of her hands together. The keeper was old, even among elves. The skin of her face and long forehead looked almost transparent. It sagged in places, and seemed to have been pulled too tightly in others. The mane of her hair seemed to float around her skull like a fine mist. Her lips were drawn back in her age, exposing her teeth in what might too easily have been mistaken for a grin. She stooped over as she sat on the throne of the oracle, her body curling forward around her arching spine. She looked frail, but Soen knew better. The keeper's featureless eyes were still shining and as black as a grave. Soen knew that there were those who had thought it was time for the keeper to, well, relinquish her position in favor of younger, more dynamic individuals, such as they themselves presented. Those who had sought the keeper's forced retirement were no longer available to testify regarding how they were stopped in their assassination plots. They had simply disappeared. Soen, my son, Chidre said with bored detachment, you are a most talented servant of the Iblisi mandate and demonstrably a loyal servant of the imperial will. She is not interested in my report on the court. Soen thought, something has changed. The keeper shifted slightly in her throne. The words needed to be said, and so she was saying them, although both Chidre and Soen were fully aware that they were only preliminary and without substance. Indeed, your abilities have brought your name to be whispered with both glory and honor in the ears of many of the orders, even here in the capital of the world. In change there is danger. Soen thought, and profit, which will it be this time? The keeper is most generous in her words, Soen replied evenly. A hint of a smile pulled at the corner of the old elf woman's lips. I can afford to be generous with words, my son, but the position of our order among the powers that rule requires more circumspect frugality. And may I dare presume that I might assist the order in some meaningful way? Can you leave within the hour? Soen's heart jumped, but he maintained his outward calm. I serve at the pleasure of the keeper. I can leave at your word. Chidre nodded, then straightened slightly. 
The Mead and I have asked for the assistance of the Iblisi, more particularly your assistance. They asked for me. By name, Chidre replied. Had you not been at court, they would have demanded that you go with them at once. The old woman reached out with her bent hand, gesturing him closer. Come, my boy, I'll bandy niceties with the primping fools of the other orders, but let's have some plain talk between us. Soen smiled, the points of his ears quivering as he shook his head. <laughs> Who among us ever has plain talk? Oh, nonsense! Chidre spat the words with disdain. If I were fifty years younger, I'd throw this at you, and you'd be dropping dead before you could utter another word. That, Soen said as he casually walked the length of the hall, is the baton seal of the Iblisi Keeper, and you shouldn't be throwing it at anyone. I'll throw it at whomever I please, Chidre said, her featureless eyes squinting at him. I'm especially fond of hitting insolent young boys with it. I have heard that the Keeper might have found better uses for insolent young boys, Soen said with a lightness in his words. <laughs> Perhaps, Chidre said through a dark chuckle. Then she paused. Soen, the Mead and I have a problem on the Ikaran frontier. They need it silenced and they want you to do it for them. The Ikaran frontier? The farthest western reaches of the Empire and about as far from the Imperial court as one might hope to be assigned, even if it were only briefly. What is the problem? Something happened in the folds. Chidre spoke softly. The Mead and I have been basking in the glory of their handling of the folds in this last war against the dwarves. They've even gone so far as to make something of a public spectacle of themselves, using this as an opportunity to rub the noses of the Okuran in their success. Now something has happened in the folds of the frontier that has them worried, worried enough that they insist that you, the favoured Iblisi of the Emperor himself, take care of it discreetly. They want it silenced as they want it done by someone close to the Emperor, and they're willing to promise anything and pay anything to make it happen quickly. You're to be given complete access to the folds controlled by the Mir Dendai throughout the Empire to serve this purpose. You'll be given a commission and seal specifically for this purpose. Generous of them to provide transport. Soen considered, especially since it will allow them to follow my movements. Who trusts anyone any more? And they would not tell you what actually happened in the folds. Soen asked. They didn't even try to lie to me. Chidre said with a shrug. That was the most insulting that he didn't even bother to make something up for me. I tell you, elves today have no respect for their elders. Soen drew in a deep breath and nodded, his own black eyes looking at the keeper from under his heavy brows. So it is in the service of the Emperor's will that the keeper of the Iblisi is commissioning me to travel the Myrdendai folds to the Ikaran frontier, to silence an unspecified matter that is currently distressing a companion order of the Empire? Oh, what nonsense! Both Chidre and Soen laughed heartily. Oh, I too soon forget why I like you, Soen, Chidre said through her grinning smile. You have such a charmingly dry sense of humor. No, of course that isn't why I'm sending you. I wouldn't mind currying a little favor with the mere Dindai right now, but no, that's not why you're going. Peril or profit, which will it be? The Mir Dindai were not my only urgent audience today. Their rivals, the Okuran, visited me this morning. Chidre said, her voice softening. Something has gone very wrong with the Aether Wells of the Ikaran frontier. Twin trouble in the western provinces. Yes. It has caused disturbance patterns resonating all through the Aether links throughout the empire. The Okuran tell me the Aetherwells have failed on the frontier. Soen raised his eyebrows. Failed? Yes, failed. Soen straightened to stand upright, considering the implications of what he had just heard. 
It's been a long time since a well failed. Some of these fourth estate lords go to the frontier without knowing what is required to survive. Still, I don't see why you need me to. It wasn't just one well that failed, Sowen, Chidre said. This wasn't just some mistake made by a careless house lord. The Aether in the entire region collapsed, and a number of houses in the province have fallen completely. Fallen? Sowen's left brow rose in surprise. One house falling is a potential catastrophe, but the fall of multiple houses at once is unimaginable. The warding glyphs that link the wells are meant to prevent such a cascading failure, severing the connection to the collapsed well before any damage is done. So amused. How could they fail in multiple wells at once? According to the Okuran, the wells all across the western provinces not only collapsed completely, but inverted for a time. But we do not know enough. The keeper continued. Communication from the frontier has failed both from the Okuran and the Myrdindai. But from the little we know, as many as a dozen houses could have fallen. And that could be an optimistic number. The glyphs must have worked eventually, or the entire empire would have gone dark. What about containment? Sowen asked, his mind still racing through the possibilities. Again, we don't know. And that is why you must depart at once. You have to discover the cause of this and secure its truth. If knowledge of any vulnerability to the system of aether wells were to become commonly known, I agree. So amused with a frown. But even if a dozen or so houses have fallen, the number of slaves released from their devotions alone. I'm only interested in the cause of this collapse, not a few bolters. If any slaves have something to do with this, then of course, hunt them down. And the problems of the Okuran and the Myrdindai are related? Chidre shrugged. Beyond doubt, but that is for you to discover. Sowen nodded. How do you want the rest of the slaves handled? If they can be usefully enthralled again, then ship them here for new devotions. Otherwise, kill the broken ones. Chidre said, though she was not really interested. I'll leave that to your discretion. It is good policy, makes us a profit on the resale of the slaves, and maintains our rather ruthless image. I need a quorum. You may take two codexia of your choice. Kinsei and Fong, then if the choice is mine. So one nodded as he thought. And the four Assessia. I should think that Yaru, Shonok, and Reth would be honored by the task— Perhaps you could also take young Jukong as your fault. Soen smiled once more. He knew Jukong was a spy for Chidre. This assignment was important enough that the keeper wanted a second set of eyes to report to her. Who trusts anyone anymore? So, the Mirin Dai provide the transport and means to allow us to solve a mystery for their rivals, the Okuran. Soen chuckled. We garner favor with both, and neither is the wiser. Everyone profits, Chidre smiled. Especially us. Thank you, Keeper. Soen bowed. I am honored to serve with such a quorum, and may I add my personal thanks, as it will be good to serve under an open sky again. Do not thank me so quickly. Chidre returned. You do not know what awaits you in the western provinces, and many a truth has left its inquisitor buried beneath that same open sky. Chapter 18 Tracks the evening had deepened into a purple twilight around the horizon by the time Assessia Jokung joined the rest of the quorum in the courtyard of the keep. The globe torches mounted on the inner walls of the keep had just flickered to life in the gathering night, illuminating the ancient flagstones beneath their feet. Above the walls to the east, the towering subatria of the imperial city shone in the night with a soft incandescence, the cloud palace itself shining above them all. Soen saw none of its beauty 
His eyes were focused on the quorum that had formed before him. Each of them was clothed in much the same manner as himself, in a dull reddish-brown hooded robe with a black sash closure at the waist. They also, he was pleased to note, appeared prepared for an extended absence, as all were shouldering backpacks bulging with their field goods. Each also held the unique staff of their order, the mate, which was simultaneously the tool of their protection, the symbol of their office, and the means by which they measured out the often final, deadly judgments regarding the lives of those whom fate caused to cross their path. Just over six feet in length, the smooth wood of the staff had a polished steel cap with a diamond-edged spike at one end. The upper third of the staff was carved with intricate patterns and ended with an ornate headpiece representing the Eye of Kin, symbol of the god worshipped by their order, fitted with a large crystal, so unnoted with satisfaction that within each one the power of the Aether shone. Their staffs were fully charged for the journey ahead. I am Soen Chen Rei, he said to the assembly without preamble. We serve the will of the Emperor tonight by journeying to the Ikaran frontier. It will be a long road, but one that you are well prepared to face. We travel the folds of the Myrdin Dai with their blessing and should, with the favor of the gods, arrive at our area of need quickly. Where we are needed we do not yet know, but when we arrive it will be with death staring into our faces. Be prepared to stare back and spit in its eye. Dark chuckles rolled among the members of the quorum. Can say you will be my first, Fong my second. So one nodded to each of them. It was necessary to make clear the order of command, in case Soen somehow got himself in over his head. His death was unimportant. Continuing the mission was. Kinsei was female, and Fong was male. It made some difference in terms of their abilities, but generally he liked the idea of the balance it represented. Watch each other. Trust in the order. Trust no one else. We are the Iblisi and we serve the imperial will. We serve the imperial will, they answered back in unison. We are one, Soen shouted. We are one, the quorum shouted in reply. Soen turned and pulled the deep hood over his head until its forward edge hung low over his sloping forehead. He shifted his own mate into his right hand and took his first step on a journey whose end he did not yet see. Where are we? Rath asked quietly. And the police always knows where he is. Fong replied in the same voice. Even when he's lost. Did they teach you nothing in the Lyceum? Soen allowed himself a rueful smile, then said in a voice that carried throughout the quorum, How many folds is that, Kinsei? Eleven, Master Inquisitor, she replied. Three more, then, and we should be within the borders of Ibania, Soen said. Soen stepped off the fold platform. The Myrdin Dai priest who was managing the portal was watching them closely, but always glanced away whenever Soen turned in his direction. It was the expected reaction. The Iblisi were, by imperial decree, their own justice. Soen gazed out over the assembly area. This one was in a hollow rimmed with tree-covered hills. It was the same sort of undulating geography that typified much of the lands northwest of Ronas proper. The last four folds had been into similar terrain, and each was similarly boring, so one thought. The weary slave armies of the Empire were being herded home once more. Most of these were from the army of the Emperor's Blade heading back in the direction from which Soen's quorum had just come. The impress warriors of the various legions, centauris, cohorts, and octia were emptying into the holding pen of the surrounding totems from the fold at the far side of the hollow. They wandered about listlessly until their group was sorted out by the Myrdin Dai and their various tribunes, and then meekly filed through their respective folds on their own journeys homeward. He had seen it all before. These weary slaves with different faces had been shuffling out of every fold portal he and his quorum had entered since the central junction in the subatria of the Myrdendai Temple in the Imperial City. If there were a problem here, Soen had not yet found its edges, 
and did not expect to do so for another six folds. It was a long way to the frontier, and even utilizing the folds it had taken them four hours to get this far. Fang, you know what to do, Soen said, tugging at his gloves. Find the field marshal, show him the baton, secure our passage and report. Fong's words reflected Soen's own boredom. I, Master Inquisitor. The Codexia turned to make his way around the hollow, but Kinsei, standing behind Soen, called out, One moment more, Fong. Soen turned a curious eye on his first. Yes, Codexia Kinsei. The road is long before us, Kinsei said her voice smooth and unusually deep. And it is late. Our problems lie ahead of us, and wisdom might be found in resting mind and body to prepare for them when they are discovered. Might the Inquisitor consider camping here for the night? Soen considered for a moment. You make an entire argument in a single breath, Codexia can say. The Codexia only smiled back and bowed slightly. Still, few words often carry the greatest merit. Soen continued. They had been traveling against the tide of warriors flowing through the gate since they left the capital. He was beginning to feel the weariness of the journey as well. The question in my mind is whether to camp here or continue a few folds farther on. Wait! A scream cut once more across the herd from the fold portal on the far side of the hollow. A Chimerian stood on the platform before the shimmering fold and howled such a terrible sound that the Myrdin Dai and others on the platform scattered at once, stumbling over each other as they tried to get as far away from the mad creature as possible. The Chimerian was a horrifying sight. His skin was streaked with blood, glistening in the light of the globe torches hung around the fold platform. He had extended his body to its full height, and all four arms stretched out from its sides, each holding a different type of sword. The chainmail vest he wore was ragged and broken, pierced in several places where the creature's own blood oozed out. But it was the eyes, fixed wide open and unblinking, that were windows into a torment without depth and a mind lost to its merciless ravages. Run! The Chimerian screamed. Run! From your lives! The mad creature lunged forward, leaping from the platform, its blades slicing with soft ringing sounds through the evening air. Heedless, the Chimerian dashed forward into the herd, sword blades churning. The surprised warriors leaped back, several of them reacting instinctively to face their opponent, but the Chimerian continued to dash across the base of the hollow, deftly slipping past one, slicing into the side of another, rolling around a third. The sound of the impress warriors rose to a thunderous roar, and still the Chimerian continued its pell-mell charge across the field, its eyes fixed on one thing, an exit portal, and Soen's quorum alone stood in its path. Soen stepped forward, spinning his mate staff deftly in front of him, then gripping it in both hands. The headpiece suddenly flared with brilliant light, an incandescent blade forming outward from the top of the staff, into the shape of a razor-edged scythe. At the bottom of the staff, a globe of crackling blue light was forming at the same time. Soen kept his eyes on the mad Chimerian, widened his stance, and waited. The Chimerian plunged directly toward the Inquisitor, its mind fixed on reaching the exit portal beyond, its blades whirling so as to obliterate anyone or anything that stood between it and its next passage. The young Assessia Reth took a step forward, brandishing his own mate, but Kinsei held up a cautioning hand to restrain him. Run from the dreams, it babbled as it charged. They're coming! They're right behind! Run! The Chimerian lunged at Soen. The Inquisitor rolled backward, his mate spinning in his hands. Soen planted the headpiece in the ground next to him, just as the glowing ball at the bottom of the staff discharged. The Chimerian soared straight up into the air, its body bent double by the force of the aether discharged into its abdomen. The mad creature screamed horribly, and its arms, still gripping the blades in its hands, twisted angrily in the air. 
Sowen held firm to the staff, his arms shaking with the effort. The glowing blade at the head of the staff was now against the ground. Sowen, using its force for leverage against the Chimerian as the creature continued to writhe, now suspended over the staff in the air. Sowen looked up, his black elven eyes fixed on the Chimerian. I am the Iblisi. I am the Emperor's will. You are commanded to obey. The Chimerian fixed his hateful gaze on the Inquisitor, and then, screaming, slashed at the air with all four of the blades in his hands. Death to the Emperor! Death to his dreams! Soen's eyes widened. The Chimerian's back arched impossibly backward, and then its entire body suddenly contracted and thickened. The tall, lithe form was replaced by a short, stocky one. I'm awake now, the creature said with a dangerous edge in its voice. I won't sleep ever again, not for you or any of your bastard brothers. Soen nodded, then yelled, Death to the Emperor! Assessia Reth gasped. A shocked silence filled the space around them. Chukung stepped forward, an angry frown on his face, but Fong placed a restraining hand against the young elf's chest. Death to his dreams! Soen shouted. His eyes were fixed on the Chimerian above him. The mad warrior suddenly relaxed. What is your name, friend? Soen asked quietly. My name? came the whimpering reply. I've come to end your dreams, friend, Soen said in even tones. But I must know your name. The Chimerian blinked at him, unsure. What was your name in the dream? The Chimerian curled his lips back in loathing. Chintas! That is what they called me! And your house, Chintas? Soen's voice was calm, his eyes fixed on the Chimerian. What was your house in the dream? Chintas began giggling, blood running down from the corner of his mouth. <laughs> uh, uh, I won't tell you. You're going to put me back to sleep. Send me back to those dreams. No, Chintas. I can't do that. Soen replied. I've come to end your dreams. The Inquisitor was beginning to sweat with the effort of keeping the Chimerian suspended above him in the air. I promise you, tell me your house in the dreams, and I will end them for you forever. Forever? Forever. Chintas shuddered. Tell me! Soen yelled at the Chimerian hovering ten feet above him in the air. I... Dreamed of a slave named Chintos of the house of the house of Acheron. The Chimerian sneered. No, keep your bargain, Iblisi. Soen frowned and then nodded. The magic holding the Chimerian collapsed at the Inquisitor's command. Chintos fell, but before he reached the ground, Soen whirled with the mate, the scythe blade flashing through the air. In a single deft stroke, the wheeling Soen drove the long, mystical blade across the neck of the Chimerian. Chentos's head rolled a few feet across the ground, coming to rest at the feet of Assessia Reth. Four swords rang against the ground, falling from the limp hands of Chentos's body, just as Soen finished his turn, planted his feet in a wide stance, and swung the blade down from above his head, driving it through the back of the Chimerian and out the front of its chest. Only then did Soen hear the thunderous shouts of the impress warriors around him. The tribunes were quickly sorting them back into their units and regaining order, as Soen knew they would. He whispered to his mate, and the glowing blade vanished, leaving only the blood to emerge from the wound. Master Inquisitor, Kinsei spoke as she approached him. What does it mean? Soen knelt next to the body, considering it for a time, and then stood up, shifting his gaze to the fold portal at the other end of the marshalling field. We have not even crossed the Ibanian borders, 
he thought. It's worse than the Keeper believes, worse than even I could imagine. Soen turned back to his first. It means that the trouble has found us. We will not be camping here, or I suspect anywhere else tonight. Fung, have Assessia Yaru make a sketch of the devotional tattoo on the Chimerian's head. He's got a talent for that sort of thing. Then prepare the quorum for battle. Battle, master? Fong asked in surprise. Yes, battle, Fong, Soen said, placing his long hands on his hips as he thought. We're going to follow the trail back to its source, and if this Chentos is an example of what we have ahead of us, our best course will be following a trail of murderous, insane slaves attacking everyone in sight to their source. Kinsei's eyes narrowed. Back to this, this house, Hakiron. Yes, if there is such a house. Soen said. Have you ever heard of it? No, master. Fong, no, master. Neither have I, Soen said, fingering his mate staff as he thought. It must be a minor house nearby, Fong said. Some fifth estate fool who lost control of a handful of slaves. No, Fong, Soen said, looking down at the body of the dead Chimerian. The keeper tells me this trouble started in Ikara, and that more than a dozen houses are involved. Ikara? Kinsei's voice rose in tone. That's at the edge of the western provinces. It would take us another day just to get there. Longer if we have to fight our way through some of the marshalling fields. Soen agreed, which we almost certainly will have to do. But it is the will of the Emperor, the will of the Keeper, and my will that we find this, this house, Acheron, or whatever house is responsible, and secure its truth for the good of the Empire and the glory of our order. Gather the quorum we leave at once. I, Master Inquisitor, Kinsei said as she straightened her back with pride. Soen watched his Codexia as they moved back to instruct the rest of the quorum. He reflected for a moment that Jukung would no doubt find some way to report back to Chidre, and he wondered what the old woman would think of all this. He turned and gazed once more toward the fold portal at the far end of the hollow. House Acheron, he thought, struggling to recall anything in his vast memory about the name. Who in all the gods of the void knows any House Acheron? Book One The Jester Chapter One The Song The song would not leave him. Nine notes, seven notes, nine notes, seven notes, five notes, five notes, circles in circles, endlessly spinning through his mind, filling its space with an endless melodic wheel. It pulls at him, calls to him, drawing him into a whirling vortex of music that engulfs his thoughts, his actions. Dracus, wake up! Dracus, impress warrior of the House of Timuron and leader of the First Octian, shook his head and tried frantically to focus his eyes in the stark light. The enormous, broad face of Chukang, captain of the Timuron warriors, swam in front of him. Chu Kong was a manticore, a lion man from the Chenandrian steppes, and was therefore forced to bend his towering eight foot tall form down to face the human. Chu Kong's lips curled back on his flat, fur covered face as he spoke, exposing his sharp fangs. Dracus, do you have the count or not? Nine notes, seven notes. Dracus found it hard to catch his breath in the stifling heat of the narrow corridor. The stone hall was barely twenty feet wide and packed shoulder to shoulder and wall to wall with his brother warriors as far as he could see in both directions. Their faces stared back at him, cast in the stark and unnaturally cold light of a number of globe torches distributed among them. They were mostly made up of towering manticores, mixed with nearly an equal number of four-armed chimera and the occasionally emerging face of an impatient Mustafian goblin. 
each of their heads, shaved from the top of their foreheads running back to the base of their necks, was marked with a sink tattoo, branding every one of them as the property of House Timuron. Each warrior slave knew his place, just as Dracus well knew his own. He was the third of eight warriors that made up the first Octian, first of the ten Octia that made up House Timuron's eighty warrior Centauri. Timuron Centauri had been attached to five more from neighboring houses on the Imperial frontier to form the second cohort of the western provinces, just short of five hundred warriors, which in turn was united with seven other Empress cohorts, an additional war mage cohort, plus a warlord cohort, creating the four thousand and eight hundred strong Legion of the West. Three such legions made up the army grandly named Blade of the West, which was then joined with two other such armies, Emperor's Blade and Blade of the Marches, to fill out the enormous Imperial Army of Conquest. Over forty-three thousand impress warriors bringing their bright-edged steel against the last bastion of Dwarven Mighty, and Dracus was but one among them. Nine notes spun through his mind, sounding hollow as they fell into a vast, surging sea of blood. Five notes singing of his insignificance, drowned out by the nine notes that dragged him downward into an abyss of sound. His dying breath made no impression on anyone else at all. Dracus! Chukong roared. Captain, I have the count. Dracus blurted out, his eyes focusing on the captain. First Octian through, fourth Octian are at full strength, with eight warriors each. Seventh Octian has combined with the sixth, and are now reporting seven warriors strong. Eighth and ninth Octia are also at full strength of eight warriors each. Archers of Octian Distar are answering with four. What about fifth Octian? Quichon growled. He was a fierce-looking manticore with a long scar running from just above his right eye across his face, and also second in command of the House Timuron Centauri, after Chukang. Fifth Octian does not report, Dracus answered. He was sweating profusely now. I think we lost them just before the last fold. Lord Timuron will not be pleased, Quichon said quietly. Committing the entire Centauri in this campaign was more of a gamble than an investment, and we've yet to garner a single prize. Chukong gave a warning glance at his second. Without a prize of honor, it might be better if we all came back on our shields. We need to get into the fight. Brawn, what's taking so long? They all turned to the only other human present, the sole proxy for the remaining warriors of House Timuron's Centauri. He was a short man with a stocky build, easily distinguishable by his large, hooked nose and piercing dark eyes. Like most of the Timuron warriors, he wore a hodgepodge of protective armor, but instead of a weapon, he carried the proxy staff of the Timuron Centauri. A tall wooden shaft with an onyx claw headpiece gripping an aether crystal at its top. As the proxy, he was the connection between the elven tribunes who ran the battle from the hilltop, thousands of feet above and many leagues distant from the combat underground. The tribunes experienced the war from a command tent filled with the breezes of an open sky, their bodies far removed from the blades of the enemy. Bound by the power of Aether magic, the proxy was the projected presence of the war mage tribunes at the battlefront. What Braun saw, his tribune saw. What Braun heard, his tribune heard as well. More important still, Braun and all other proxy were an extension of the tribune's magical powers wrought from the Aether, the conduit for the tribune's spells. Thus, their elven masters, leagues away, could experience and contribute to the battle through the proxy in nearly every aspect except one. In agony and death, a proxy was always alone. Braun cocked his head to one side, as though he were listening to the rocks overhead. He flashed a crooked smile, but his eyes were fixed on a scene far beyond the close walls around them. Ah, can't you hear it? Don't you see? The dancers and the puppets are all moving across the stage, each one playing his little part just as we are, our own little part, 
And now we're coming to the great finale, the headlong rush into death itself. Oh, it's all going exactly as the masters have promised it would be. Death, blood, and glory all threshed like fall wheat with our deaths, and our blood as dross, and the glory all neatly gleaned for House Timoron. Smell the applause. What in the name of all the gods? Quichon began. Five notes. Five notes. Krakus drew in a deep breath. Captain Chukang, Braun is not... Captain, it's been three days since his last field devotion. It's been three days since my own devotions, Drakus thought. Three days of this song rolling through my head. Three days for any of us, Chukong snapped. What of it? Is that a problem? Who money? Quichan's eyes narrowed as he stared first at Braun and then back at Dracus. He'll do fine, Captain, Dracus said, his own eyes focusing on the scowling face of Chukong. I'll see to him. You had better see that he doesn't break, Dracus. The Centauri commander grumbled while shooting a glance at Krichan. His foals got us into this, and by the gods his foals had better get us out. Proxy's minds always break first in battle. We're too deep under this mountain to have our proxy snap like some dry twig. Deep, Braun said, crouching on the fitted stones that formed the floor of the corridor. He reached down to the paving stones at his feet his fingers brushing against a pattern of interlocking rings etched into the stone. The symbol glowed faintly at his touch. Yes, we are deep and far from home. See the gate symbol here. They have been growing weaker with every fold farther from the aether well of House Timoron. What shall save us if the way is shut? The cords that bind us to the house of our master unravel, and does not our future unravel along with our past? Grichon opened his mouth to speak, anger flashing in his eyes. Yes, Captain, Dracus inserted quickly before the manticore could speak, or worse, act. I'll take care of him. Nine notes of the dwarven kings laughing in the darkness. Seven notes in his screaming as his world falls in glittering shards, five notes at a time to the ground. I'll take care of him, Dracus thought, if I don't unravel first. Dracus drew in a deep, shuddering breath and tried to breathe slower. The armor he wore was mismatched and pinched him. He fought the panicked urge to tear at the straps and cast off the torturous steel tomb. And to whom it was, his mind screamed at him, and run blindly away to anywhere but here in the darkest heart buried far beneath the area peaks. He considered praying to the gods of the house, but then stopped. There was nothing special in him that the gods might want to save, he thought. He was a human, a defeated and moderately rare race, talented with a sword, perhaps, but otherwise unremarkable. He was of only average height for his kind— broad shoulders and a strong body, perhaps, but the skin of his face was pocked, and a small scar at the corner of his lips gave him the affectation of a crooked frown, not handsome in the way of the gods, but of average looks for a warrior of his race. The campaign had done nothing to improve his appearance either, as the tattoo brands on his scalp, usually shaved cleanly bald before the daily devotions of House Timuron, were now slightly obscured by a fuzz of dark brown hair, that had pushed its way through his scalp over the last three days. No, he realized, there was nothing remarkable enough about him to command the attention of the gods. All he had was himself and his brother warriors from his Octian to keep him alive for one more day. Drakus squeezed his wide-bladed short sword tighter, desperately willing the strength of his hand to overcome the sweat and dark dwarven blood that coated the grip. He did not dare close his eyes, tempting as it was to banish the walls closing in around him. He had won victory in many battles, slain many enemies in the service of the Ronas Empire. May his allegiance and loyalty to his elven masters ever be on his lips. 
and the glorious house of which he longed to be a part. He was only a warrior slave of House Timuron, as he had always been, as the gods had made him. Nine notes rolled around Dracus on shattered shields, a chorus of screaming slaves all singing in madness. Seven notes drew him back, running from the flames burning down his life. It's here! The last judgment of the gods! Braun shouted. The proxy suddenly knelt down in the corridor, planting the steel-spiked base of his staff against the glowing symbols in the paving stones and leaning forward. A blue glow grew within the crystal fixed in the staff's headpiece. This is it! Shukong shouted. Thracus! First Octian, stand to the sides of the fold. Zharok, Murthos, second Octian leads those on the right. Third Octian leads the rest on the left. Dracus tried to ignore the notes turning through his mind in an unending cycle as he stepped back, pushing his back against the corridor wall. Nine notes, seven notes, five, five. It was his sanity that rotated on a melodic wheel careening across an endless plain toward a dark tower atop a pillar of stone. The proxy staff's crystal flared with brilliant light. The air in the corridor before the proxy twisted, flattening into a vertical disk that cut across the width of the corridor. Space itself contorted, collapsed, and compressed. Dark hallway, rock, stone, passages, walls, lit rooms, dark halls, all rushed forward inside the magical oval, whose edges writhed with arcing light. Just as quickly, the rushing motion stopped. The sounds of battle rang out through the magical fold, and Dracus could see clearly a huge underground plaza lit by hundreds of burning torches. An enormous statue filled a rotunda just beyond the plaza, around which a line of screaming, enraged dwarven warriors were charging toward them. For the glory of House Timuron! Chukong roared as he and the rest of the first Octians stood aside, pressing their backs against the walls. They would be the last to enter the battle. For the glory of the Emperor! Dracus shouted in chorus with the rest of the Centauri around him. Second and third Octia rushed forward as though charging to collide where the glowing oval from Braun's staff bisected the wall between them. Dracus felt the brush of armor and whiffed the stench of drying blood as the second Octian rushed past him, followed immediately by the fourth and sixth. Keep moving, you slave bastards! Chukong shouted. Win me enough room to kill some dwarves! Kuchan continued to roar. For the Emperor and his Imperial will! The ranks of warriors surged forward like a confluence of rivers, leaping into the vertical glowing disk on both sides as though in collision, but the folded space of the elven war mages and their proxy obeyed a reality that was uniquely dictated by the power of aether magic. Dracus watched as the converging warriors dashed headlong into the magically wrenched space, and from where he stood, he could see that those entering from his side were rushing into the distant, illuminated plaza and engaging the charging dwarves. He knew from experience that those warriors charging in the opposite direction were rushing from the opposite side of the fold into that same plaza. The screaming impress warriors of Timuron continued their charge through the blazing mystic portal until the four remaining members of the Octian Dista, all of them goblin archers, leaped through to the other side. All that remained were the warriors of the first Octian, Dracus's brothers in combat for as long as he could remember. Chukong, the captain of the entire Timuron Centauri, was at the heels of the goblin archers, roaring in battle rage, a massive sword in each hand as he turned and pushed through the portal. Ethis, a four-armed Chimerian with the wonderfully durable physical structure of his kind leaped through. He was followed by Tsurag and Grichog, both manticores from the southern steppes of Chinandria, as were Chukang and Krichan. Behind them came Megri, the goblin with quick eyes and quicker fingers. He flashed a bright, sharp-toothed smile at Dracus before hopping through the fold. Krichan hung back a moment, turning his narrowed eyes on Dracus. Is the proxy still good? Nine notes singing of the dwarven thrones, seven notes ringing of the Octia losing one. 
Dracus's head hurt, and he was not sure he heard the manticore correctly. Master? Krichan wrapped his massive paw around the back of Dracus's neck. The human could feel the sting of the great warrior's claws pushing against his skin, and Krichan drew him closer. I have no time or patience to waste on you, Dracus. You are humani. Brawn is humani. Tell me now, is the proxy broken? Brawn knelt next to them, watching them both with bemused interest, even as he still held the fold open with sweat pouring down his face from the effort. Tell him, Dracus. <laughs> Tell the big pet cat that he need not get his fur up. I've never felt better in my life, Dracus. I've never seen the world so clearly. Oh, layers of cloth have been unwinding from my eyes, and for the first time I'm beginning to see just what a lie we're all living. Krichan growled as he suddenly turned on the proxy, baring his teeth menacingly. Braun's blissful smile fell only slightly, his eyes suddenly focusing, and his words tinted with menace. Of course, if you kill your proxy, who will extract your hide from this farce of a battle then, eh? Krichan shook violently, but he knew better than to harm the proxy. He turned his wrath on Dracus instead. He is your proxy, Dracus. You will keep him doing right by his brothers, or I'll see that you pay for his insolence. The manticore leaped through the fold, his weapon raised to strike. The sounds of terrible battle flowed out of the fold, filling the now empty corridor. Devoid of the globe torches, pitch darkness had once again reclaimed the cold stone emptiness except for the bright light coming from the fold that illuminated the two humans that remained. I don't think he likes me, Braun said through a smile to Dracus. Dracus grabbed the proxy by the elbow and dragged Braun's shaking form to his feet. I'm beginning to wonder if I do either. Oh, I think you'll know soon enough, Braun said, giving Dracus a shove through the fold portal. Then Braun's smile took on a darker, more vicious aspect. I think we may all know soon enough. With that, the proxy stepped through the fold portal with his staff. The fold collapsed at once, choking off the light from the distant plaza and plunging the abandoned hall into utter darkness. Chapter 19 Loose ends. Is this all of them? Soen demanded of the Manticorean warrior standing next to him. The evening breeze was rising behind the elven inquisitor as he surveyed the scene. He would have enjoyed drinking in the freshness of the air as it flowed around him, still damp from the sea beyond his sight to the south. The sunset was deepening into a rich, vibrant salmon color, marred only by the black smoke still curling up from the ruin on the hilltop, its pall rising to join those of a number of surrounding houses. He would have preferred to turn his back on the carnage, bask in the rays of the setting sun, and breathe deeply of the fresh evening. Such luxuries, however, would have to wait. Yes, master, the manticore rumbled. Fifteen of the house servants survived— Two warriors of the House Centauri were alive, but they engaged us on our arrival and we were forced to kill them. And it appears impossible to account for the full Centauri. Soen turned his head slowly toward the manticore, his gaze itself a question. The manticore was an old one, golden streaks running through his shorn mane. He shifted uncomfortably. The... <laughs> Impress warriors were still returning from the war. The majority of the warriors of this house appear to still have been in transit through the folds. We will deal with one disaster at a time, Soen said in clipped tones. You were the first to arrive. Yes, master. And what is your name? Gradek, master. Centauri captain of House Magnara. Magnara, Soen said with studied casualness. 
The names of these petty frontier houses were only now, after four days into this investigation, starting to make sense to him. House Acheron was only one of the many houses that had fallen on the frontier, and that name had quickly led them to a host of others within what Soen had come to call the Dark Frontier. It was not until Codexia Kinsey brought him a report of a messenger from the House Magnaris Centuri that he had even heard of House Timuron. Oh, yes. House Magnara, that's about fifty leagues from here, isn't it? Yes, master. So how does a Centauri captain of a house many days' journey away end up at the door of this fallen house? The manticore's eyes narrowed, but he gave no other sign of his anger at his embarrassment. Ah, by accident, master. We were set upon by the mad warriors when they hit during our return from the war. We fed through whatever folds were convenient and available, trusting that the mere Dendai would sort out our transportation home after the mad warriors were killed. After several folds, we arrived here and sent a runner at once back through the fold to report to the mere Dendai what we had seen. Soen nodded. What of Lord Timoran and his family? The manticore gave a quick grunt to show his discomfort before he spoke. Uh, the uh, remains of Lord Timoran were found just inside the main doors. The fire had not reached the body, but there was little left nevertheless. He was only identified by the baton still in his grip, his signet rings, and what little remained of his clothing. We have not yet found his head. It was expected, so one thought. Anyone else? We actually found Lady Timoron first. Grodek continued, the bile in his stomach apparently settling as he spoke. We saw her above the subatria wall, impaled on one of the house standards. My Octian leader, Jacques Tou, believes she was dead before the fire reached her body. He is the one who brought her down. Go on, Soen urged. Beyond that, the overseers and the guardians were undoubtedly all slaughtered. All of them? You're sure? The moment we arrived, master, Grodak said, I specifically ordered each of my Octian commanders to secure the house and protect any elves they encountered. None were reported. Still, they will have to be accounted for in any event. Soen turned back to examine the huddled group sitting on the ground before him, the smoking ruins of their former life behind them. These slaves are all that's left, then. Any of them broken? I do not understand, the manticore replied, shaking his wide head. No, of course not. Soen muttered under his breath, then spoke more clearly to the monster beside him. A broken slave is one who has fallen outside the discipline of house devotion, Skratek. Their souls no longer yearn for the peace and glory of the imperial gods, and as such they are dangerous to both the body and the spirit of the state. I need to examine each of them. You will stay close to me throughout, and I will tell you which are broken and which are not. If I tell you that one of them is broken, you are to kill him or her at once. At once, you understand, without further question or thought. The manticore nodded and then looked up at the sky, searching for stars, perhaps, that could not yet be seen. <sighs> yes, master. I believe that four of them, perhaps five, are broken. Very well, Soen said drawing in one last deep breath of the sweet evening air before setting about the grim task before him. Your lord Magnara shall garner much favor this night because of your sure action in his name. Master, Grodek said, his wide, flat face gazing down at the elven inquisitor. We have not slept in nearly two days. It is nearly the hour of house devotions— Many of my warriors are anxious to return to our field altar, so that they might— No! Soen barked. 
Not a single Impress warrior is to leave until I have questioned them to my satisfaction. Especially for house devotions. Is that absolutely clear? Grodek drew himself up erect with great effort. Yes, Master Soen. The old human woman had stubbly gray hair, barely emerging from her head, but she was stroking it with her fingers like a brush. There were flowers in the fields then, such beautiful flowers. The smell of them was overwhelming in the bright sun. Patches of red and yellow and brown and blue. We ran and ran and ran through the field with the flowers rushing past us. Oh, how I laughed. What is your name? Soen asked in soft tones. The old human woman's eyes came into focus again on the Inquisitor's face, but she didn't seem to actually see him. She always called me Essie. I never much liked to see Nia, though Mama told me she named me after her grandmother. It's strange in a way, because I can remember Mama telling me I was named after her sister, too. She called to me, Run, Essie, run! And we ran through the flowers in the fields. Oh, what a game we played, with the elves chasing us. But we were so fast that they couldn't catch us. Not Mama and me. Essie? So and said, Do you know where you are? Yes, the woman said as her fingers caught on an imagined snag in her hair. Oh, are you looking for Mama too? She fell into the flowers of the field. I think she was playing a trick on us. She fell among the red flowers, st so bright and still wet. She said to keep running, but I can't remember to where. I've looked and looked for her, but she's hiding in the field. I know she is. There were flowers in the fields then, you know. Such beautiful flowers. Perhaps I can help you find your mother. Soen said, patting the woman on the hand. Thank you, sir. Asenia smiled childlike through her weathered, ancient face. Soen stood and spoke to Grodek. She is broken. Please, sir, I need help. I'm sick. Something is terribly wrong. Soen nodded as he gazed into what passed as the face of the Chimerian. It was difficult to look at because its shape kept shifting, the plates of its bones sliding beneath the skin as the creature struggled with his own inner monsters tearing at his memories. We can help you, Soen said with measured words, his black gaze trying to lock with the shifting, feverish eyes of the Chimerian. What is your name? My name... My name is... I don't know! The Chimerian's voice rose to a panicked pitch. I have too many names! It's all right. Soen reassured the quivering being, the tips of his own ears starting to twitch. Just tell me what happened here, and we can help you. What happened? What happened? The Chimerian worked his hands nervously, until the fingers on each hand had lengthened to nearly a foot in length. Didn't you see it? Yes, but tell me anyway. Soen said, licking his sharp teeth. What was happening right before, when everything was still right? The Chimerian blinked, calming as he concentrated on the single memory. We... Uh, were at house devotions. Lord Timuron was beside the altar with the lady and his daughter. Soen nodded. At last we're getting somewhere, he thought. Everything appeared fine up to the house devotions. And then... The Chimerian was blinking faster now, struggling to organize his memories into words. Then 
there was some trouble on the other side of the garden. One of the warriors just returned. I didn't recognize him, but he must have arrived earlier in the day. The day of the trouble, you mean? Yes, that was a shout. That's what got my attention. And when I looked up, the guardians were moving toward this warrior. He was fighting them, too. I remember thinking he was oh, frighteningly strong for a human. A human? Soen asked in mild surprise. That's right. I remember now. Somehow he had a blade. Lord Timaron drew his own sword and was charging toward him. This human saw him coming. I'm sure of it. Guardians were all around him, but I saw him turn and... And... What happened next? Soen urged, one thing after the other. What happened next? Uh, the, the well... The Aether Well. Yes, the Aether Well. It, I don't know, it shattered outward, away from the center. Soen leaned back. It exploded. I, I don't understand. Soen shook his head. You mean it cracked, it broke? No, sire. The Chimerian's large eyes filled with tears. It was... Suddenly no more at all. Not a piece of it larger than the smallest finger on your hand, sire. Soen shook his head in disbelief. I think it was that human who did it, the Chimerian moaned. I think he's the one that made me sick. Please, sire, my head is full of bad spirits. Ghosts of the dead. <laughs> Please, I want to be well again. Rest easy. I know how to get rid of such ghosts. So and said. Then he stood and turned again to Grodek. Check with your Octian commanders. Find out if any of them saw a human male slave any time since all this began. Master, Grodek protested. We were running through the folds for days. We've probably seen a number of Humani slaves. Just ask them! Soen snapped. Sire, by the will of the Emperor, I live to serve. Soen considered the young human warrior, perhaps seventeen years of age, if he was any judge of human growth. The ears seemed to push straight out of the sides of his bald head, but the youth had a strong jaw. The scar across his forehead told the Inquisitor that he had already seen battle, but he was still young. You are an Octian commander? Soen asked, his black eyes narrowed. The boy flushed. Uh, no, mm, sire, that honor is not yet within my grasp. Perhaps one day, sire. Why then am I speaking to you? Sire, my Octian commander ordered me to report to you on my observations during the time of our approach, as we ran through the folds before our approach to House Timuron. Soen smiled slightly as he folded his arms across his chest. They really take themselves seriously at House Magnara. This slave acts as though he were in the Imperial Legions. And your name is... Melis, sire! Then let us have your report, Warrior Melis, by all means. Sire, this was four folds before we arrived at House Timaron. We had exited from the previous fold from the riverbank marshalling field and had arrived at the canyon marshalling field with the objective of surviving the mad warrior onslaught and finding another fold by which we could return to our quarters in House Magnara. We had nearly completed our crossing toward that objective when I realized that I had neglected to secure an important item of my field gear. Soen glanced sideways toward Grodek. The manticore leaned over slightly as he explained. He dropped his sword. Melis flushed once again. Go on, Soen urged. I was rapidly approaching the fold from which we had just arrived when I saw several figures approaching outside the line of totems surrounding the marshalling field. Several figures, Melis. Soen leaned forward. How many are several? Three humans, a pair of manticores and a Chimerian sire, Melis said, straightening his back at once. 
Oh, on the dwarf? I remember wondering about the dwarf. They passed right between the totems as we were making our way to the fold, sire. Fold? Which fold? The fold we had just exited. You mean they were going toward the chaos? Solon asked. Yes? Melis replied at once. That's what caught my attention. Everyone was trying to get away from the mad warriors, and these were trying to go toward them. Bolters. Solon thought with a grimace. Seven of them. Dawn broke with agonizing slowness over the eastern horizon. Soen was impatient for its illumination, for he needed to examine the garden of the fallen house Timuron, and could not do so properly without the aid of its light. At last the sky brightened enough that he dared risk entering the shattered remains of the house itself. The main door stood slightly open, shadowed from the sun by the remaining bulk of the house. Soen stood there for a time, considering them. Master Soen. The words were soft, deferential. Yes, Sessia Jukung. Soen responded without looking at the assassin. The remaining slaves are ready for transport. The sound of flies filled the space of a breath. The centauri of House Magnara has been returned, and a special devotion has been arranged for each of their warriors. As you directed, none of them will remember this. Thank you, Assessia. Soen said, but did not move. <sighs> Have you considered these doors, Jukung? The delicate and intricate carvings crafted no doubt in the Imperial City itself by skilled artisans of the Fifth Estate. What must it have cost old Timuron to have them brought to this remote place? Now they look tired to me, as though they feel the weight of what is behind them. Master, Jukung urged, an impatient edge to his voice. Keeper Chatre is awaiting our report. Then we had best give her a complete one. Soen responded as he stepped quickly through the gap between the main doors. We do not yet know who this house Timuron is, or why its fall brought down nearly the entire frontier. But I know where to look for at least some of the answers. Coming. It was the smell that was worst, Soen decided. The sights of the blood and carnage, torn limbs and broken jutting bones one could analyze from a safer, more objective position of the mind— but the putrid, cloying smell of rotting flesh could never be put at a distance. He choked back his bile and took a single step into the garden. Or what little remained of the garden. The Avatria had crashed down into it before the structure folded sideways, collapsing into the northeast wall, slicing down through the Subatria curtain wall and buildings, burying them in a hopeless pile of unrecognizable rubble. It was there, so unnoted with detachment, that the fire had burned most fiercely, but the offshore winds of the evening must have kept the flames burning away from the southern and western sections of the Subatria. What happened here, Master? Jukung's words were heavy, as though he were having difficulty speaking. The house fell, quite literally, it seems. Here it is, Jukung. This is the center, the root. Everything that fell on the frontier, every well that failed, started with this event. Soen turned to face Jukung. The answer is here, Assessia. Have Kinsei and Fong discovered what I sent them to find? I am only an Assessia, Master. I am not privy to. Have they or not? There was no question in Soen's voice. <sighs> Fong reports that the Empress scrolls are lost, apparently burned and scattered beyond recovery. Chukung answered, though his eyes were fixed anywhere but on Soen. And can say, She has recovered most of the devotion ledger for the last eight months. Well, that's something that may prove useful. Soen began picking his way around the southern edge of the garden wall. Here the debris was minimal although it was also unfortunately easier to pick out individual bodies or their parts. 
So undutifully noted a large concentration of warrior and guardian bodies choking the hall that led back to the hall of the past, on the far side of the ruined garden. In his mind, so pictured the guardians gathering for their mutual defense against a suddenly insane and desperate enemy, trying to back into the corridor and find a more defensible position. Just before this pile of dead, a glint caught his eye near the base of the curving wall. Soen looked up again at the smoldering mass of the Avatria that loomed above him. He could make out only a handful of plates from the underside of the structure. It was unstable, to say the least. Soen hoped to the gods that it would hold long enough to satisfy his curiosity. Soen moved quickly around the remaining southern wall of the garden. There were more slave bodies here. Some had been crushed under the debris from the collapse, while others had died from sword and dagger wounds. Their blood had mixed with the dust in dark, solid stains. Still, he kept his eye on the prize, moving as quickly as he dared. At last he stopped. He stood under the archway that opened into the Hall of the Past, but that history did not interest him just yet. He reached down and plucked the shining object from the dust. It was a crystalline shard, barely more than a sliver, that fit neatly in the palm of his hand. What <clears throat> is it? Jukung asked in a hoarse voice. That, my young Assessia, Soen said through a rueful smile, is part of an aether well. You are mistaken, Jukung said. It cannot be. And yet it is. Soen replied, Aether wells might crack or they might split, but the power of the aether itself binds the crystals together. It is impossible for them to shatter once they are forged. And yet... He held the crystal within inches of the young elf's face. Here is it. In the face of the impossible, we find ourselves holding it in our hand. Soen turned and looked up. And there... It is. What, master? The story of the house. Soen said as he stepped carefully across the debris and strewn bodies into the hall of the past. Soen followed the broken wall, reading it for a few moments, until he summarized for the young Assessia. Shah Timuran was an elf of the Third Estate, Soen said, mulling his own words. His name apparently did rank among the noble houses of the Empire. Two generations before it had been ranked only in the fourth estate, but due to a series of favors looked kindly on by the imperial eye, House Timuron was allowed to prove itself in the third estate by taking up residence in the western provinces, and this, it seems, was the result of all his efforts. He had grand hopes of garnering honor through battle. His single little centauri had participated in nearly every battle against the Nine Dwarven, Soen suddenly stopped. A long stain ran down the length of the Hall of the Past. Soen moved quickly, running around the bend of the hall as he pursued the path of the blood on the floor. Within a few strides he could see its source. A single elven body slumped backward against the wall at the far end of the corridor. The face was bloated and discolored, but Soen recognized at once the uniform of the House Tribune, a patch remaining over his left eye. His blade was broken, but the grip was still in his hand. Soen straightened, considering the figure before him. I know this elf, he murmured in awe. Jukung slid to a stop next to the Inquisitor, eyeing the dead tribune. The smell of rotting flesh was overpowering. Master, we must be going. Pause for a moment, Jukung, and honor a fallen hero. The Inquisitor said, gesturing toward the dead elf sagging against the wall before him. This is Sachinka, hero of the Benis Isles campaigns, among a dozen others. He was a general back then, and I only personally saw him twice. He lost favor in the Imperial courts, however, and vanished from the official histories. Now we find him as a dead tribune in this obscure, ambitious house. This place is... Unsafe, master, Jukung urged, gagging even as he spoke. Oh, we must hurry. Don't you think this is odd? 
Jukung, I... What, master? That the guardians of the house had all formed together in the entrance to this hall. Soen said, speaking aloud his thoughts as he considered them, his eyes fixed on the corpse before them. It doesn't lead anywhere except to one of the access towers, but the Avatria had no doubt fallen by the time they made their defense. This hall would have been a dead end. Yet here we see their tribune. Why would a tribune, and especially a successful and brilliant tactician by all accounts, put himself and his force in such a precarious position, unless... Soen reached forward, gripping the tribune's armor behind his neck and pulling the body suddenly forward. It made a sticky, ripping sound as it separated from the wall and collapsed to the floor. Soen stepped over the body to the wall, gave it a cursory look, and then pressed against it. The flat stonework shifted inward slightly, and then swung back toward the elven inquisitor. At once Soen stepped back, pulling open the hidden door. Unless he was protecting something. Soen finished as he stepped into the doorway and then stopped. The room was uncomfortably small and completely devoid of decoration or furniture. It had never really been intended for use, but it had been part of the original plans, and no one had bothered to make the alterations necessary to delete it. Yet the Tribune knew it was there, and so, at last, it had served its purpose. A single figure stooped, shivering in the corner of the room. Soen reached his hand out with care. See, Shabin? he asked softly. The elven girl looked up, her black eyes wide, though whether with anger or fear Soen was not sure. She remained as she was, however, her arms locked around her knees. The room stank of her. Soen knelt down with agonizing slowness, then spoke. Shabin, my name is Soen. We are here to help you. We will take you away from here. You will be safe again. Do you hear me? The girl jerked her head in two short nods. Soen drew in a deep breath, watching her carefully. Who did this, Shabin? he asked. She blinked, and then her eyes narrowed. She opened her mouth, and when she spoke, her words came in croaking sounds so harsh that he was unsure he understood her. Did you say, a slave? Yes, she rasped. A slave, a humani slave. You have to catch him, bring him back to me. Let me kill him. I have to kill him. What slave? Soen asked. What is his name? Dracus! She screamed. Chapter 20 Bolters By all the gods, it's getting worse! Belog bellowed, raising his sword instinctively. Dracus grimaced, setting his teeth, and pressed forward, gripping his cutlass until the blood fled from his knuckles. The curved blade of the sword was thick and strong, but the edge was already starting to dull. He heard Mala moan behind him. She had long since grown weary of her own screaming and had subsided into a shocked daze. She now stayed behind Dracus, trying desperately to avoid any and all weapons with murderous intent that came anywhere near her. Her presence distracted Dracus, who found himself trying not only to maneuver against his attackers, but simultaneously to protect her as well. He realized that he had been foolish. Because he had been trained in the arts of combat, he had blithely believed that every other slave had been as well. Now, as they were once again pressed to defend themselves, he felt how ill-prepared they were as a group. Of the six he had brought with him, only two were warriors, not counting the god's cursed dwarf. It didn't help that they were often fighting warriors of their own former centauri. Every fold that they had passed through led to another marshalling field filled with unique forms of horror and chaos. The first had been bad enough. 
Two members of their own cohort had gone mad when Timuron's well was destroyed, and the devotion spell, or whatever it was called, collapsed. By the time Dracus and his companions passed through the fold, the Myrdin Dai had already abandoned their posts beside the portals and were fleeing the murderous warriors from a host of houses. The warriors of the houses who remained enthralled by their own devotions were slow to take up arms without the direction of their own tribunes, and were scattering as well, either to the limits of the totems that contained the herd, or through any convenient fold portal that offered escape. The guardians who remained engaged the newly murderous warriors in direct combat, and the phosphorescent blasts in the center of the carnage were accompanied by the screams of both the rebellious and the loyal caught in the blasts. Combat was not Dracus's objective. Flight was. He led his companions around the perimeter of the totems, and soon discovered that they were no longer bound by any of them. They quickly circumnavigated the marshalling field, ducked back inside the totem perimeter near the fold portal from which warriors were still passing, and slipped unnoticed through the portal to the next marshalling field. Each subsequent passage through the next fold portal brought them farther from their home and deeper into the breaking madness and death. By the sixth portal they passed through, the tribunes were reacting to the carnage, releasing their warriors against these suddenly dangerous and insane warriors from all across the western provinces. Now Dracus and his companions had stepped through the eleventh portal, only to find themselves at the rear of a defensive circle, raggedly set up just a dozen yards from the fold platform onto which they had just stepped. The tribunes, too few remaining for the number of warriors present, Dracus noted at once, were nearly hoarse with screaming at the impress warriors on the line. Beyond them in the darkness, Dracus could vaguely make out movement, but everyone present could hear all too clearly, and the sound sent a chill up his spine. His insane fallen brothers were wailing and banging their swords together in an increasing tempo. "'Where are we?' Belog bellowed. "'This is the third Ebonian marshalling field.' Ethis answered, perhaps a little too quickly for Dracus's liking. "'We are north of Lake Stellamere. It should look familiar. We were here only two days ago. Is that of any help?' "'None!' Dracus spat the word sharply. There was something about the Chimerian now that made the back of his neck itch. He was a stranger with far too great familiarity. "'It doesn't matter yet where we are. What matters is where we find the way out!' "'What?' Again! Ruuka groaned. You're supposed to be saving our lives, not leading us from one hopeless bloody battle to the next hopeless. Oh, please spare us yet another chorus of the same old song, Chugar said in a booming voice as he exaggerated the rolling of his eyes. Next, if you remain true to form, comes your plea for us to return to the embrace of the imperial will. May the gods put his imperial will where it should be the most discomforting. We haven't done anything, Ruuka growled. That's true, Mala agreed, her words fast on the heels of Ruukag's. Maybe we don't have to run. The master and his family are dead and their home burned to the ground. Ethis said with a sniff that sounded almost bored. I doubt that the Iblisi will care whether we were the ones who actually held the torch or not. Not if they have to hunt us down, Ruukag said. The longer we run, the worse it's going to get for us. Can't you see that this, this, oh, Marnie is taking all of us for fools? Shut up! Dracus shouted turning on the fat manticore, the tip of his sword causing a small indentation in the creature's abdomen. You want to stay and wait for the Iblisi's renowned mercy, then stay. Or come and have some hope of seeing another sunrise. But either way, shut up. Dracus! Jugar had been tugging at the hem of his tunic for some time. We've no time for this! Dracus glanced across the defensive line. The screams from the darkness had reached a fevered pitch. The human warrior shoved Ruukag back in exasperation, then turned to the other manticore. Pelag, I seem to remember a line of trees just outside the totems on the right side. The portal we want is closer on that side anyway. We've got to push through this defensive line from behind. 
They're not looking in this direction, and it should be easier to get out than in. Rush the line from behind, then down into the trees. Wasn't that Chukong's plan to get the dwarven crown? Ethis asked at once. What of it? Belog snarled. Ethis shrugged. It didn't work out very well as all. So you have a better idea? Dracus's head was beginning to pound again. So far the danger, constant activity, and adrenaline had kept the shadows of his mind at bay, but he could feel them lurking in the corners of his thoughts, ready to tear at his mind. Ethis considered for a moment, and then his blank face split into a wide grin. I believe I do. The Chimerian turned at once, jumping from the platform and striding toward the right side of the line. He raised one of his right arms, and then started calling with loud insistence. Tribune! Tribune! Belog's eyes went wild. What is he doing? You'll get us all caught. Dracus jumped down off the platform, clearing all of its steps at once, his legs churning as he tried desperately to catch the Chimerian and stop him. The human could hear the other members of their fugitive band scrambling after him as well. It was too late. A tribune had already heard his calls and turned her angry, grim countenance toward Ethis. Dracus, only steps away, raised his sword preparing to attack the tribune, part of his mind knowing it was an act of suicidal insanity. The Chimerian reached back with one hand and pushed the blow aside. With a free hand, Ethis formed a fist and slammed it into his chest in salute to the Tribune. Mistress Tribune, Ethis said as he stood tall, we are an Octian of House Tajaran. Our Lord commands us to answer the call of the Myrden Dai to add to the glory of your order by defending this fold portal against the enemy. Dracus's feet slid across the loose dirt beneath his feet as he came to a halt. The rest of the fugitives fell in behind in disarray. House Tajeran! The Tribune's black eyes narrowed. Whether in distrust or disdain, Dracus could not tell. I! yelled a squeaky voice from the back of the group. We are the most fearsome warriors in all the Empire! Ogres tremble at the sound of our name! and the heathen elves of Musaria dare but whisper it. The rest of the fugitives had turned to stare in wonder at the lyric. The lithe woman was standing tall in her tattered dress, a look of fierce determination in her eyes as she held a sword before her with conviction. Dracus could not imagine where she had gotten that blade. We are the Octian of Oblivion, the lyric said with conviction her short, wispy hair standing away from her head in odd angles. The what? the Tribune demanded. Aye, Ethis said, turning back to the Tribune as he responded with confidence. We are the, um, Octian of Oblivion, specialized warriors in the service of Lord Tajeran. He asks only that, if possible, we be held in reserve, behind the main line of defense, as he considers us valuable warriors of his cohort, and— You'll serve what I tell you! The Tribune snarled in grating, dangerous tones. You'll go to the front of the line at once! But my lord's instructions— I take no instructions from your lord! The Tribune bellowed. Marquin! I, Tribune— came the response from a squat manticore with a long scar running up from the corner of his mouth to his ear. He wore the chevrons of a cohort master. The Tribune smiled to herself as she spoke. Get this, this Octian, up through to the front of the defensive line. But Tribune, Ethis protested. Stick him if he gives you any trouble, Marquin. The Tribune continued. Let's let someone else spill their blood for a change. The short manticore only grunted, and then started shoving Ethis, Dracus, and the rest of their group forward. My master shall hear of this! Ethis shouted back angrily at the tribune as he walked toward the line, then turned and grinned smugly at Dracus walking next to him. Marquin's bellows were sufficient to get the troops arrayed in front of them to reluctantly part, and within a few minutes they were standing at the front of the defensive line. In the darkness before them, 
the rhythmic chanting of their own former brothers in arms, now insane, was rising in tempo and sound. It will be by your word, Dracus said to the warrior Manticore. Belog nodded, then spoke to their companions. When I shout, that's when we run. The Manticore warrior drew in a deep breath and then crouched down, preparing to spring. Dracus grabbed Mala's hand. Jugar, you have the lyric! I said the dwarf as he shot a worried glance at the woman next to him staring blissfully out over the field. Are you ready, lass? Dracus noticed only then that she had dropped her sword somewhere. The girl looked down at him and smiled sweetly beneath her unfocused eyes. Er, that will have to do. Jugar coughed as he spoke. The Manticorean warrior bellowed and then charged away from the line of warriors, angling directly toward the woods. Dracus ran after him with Mala behind him struggling to keep up. Jugar charged forward as well with the lyric as Ethis and Ru'ukag followed behind. Surprise won over discipline for only a few moments, but it was enough. By the time the astonished warriors realized what had happened, Dracus and his band were already crashing into the underbrush of the woods to the right of the line. The darkness of the woods panicked Dracus for a moment. His eyes had been used to the globe torches illuminating the fold platform and were not yet accustomed to the darkness. Mala fell behind him, and he stopped picking her up. Then the ground started to shake. The mad warriors were charging at last in the clearing next to them. Dracus stood, holding Mala in the darkness as the sounds of crushing pain and agonizing death permeated the air around them. He wanted to shield her from it, protect her from the horror that was taking place only yards from where they stood. His arms enfolded her head, pulling it to his chest. And he was again aware of the insistent tugging on his garments by the dwarf. Master Dracus, Jugar growled under his breath. Follow me. We must get through the portal at once. Why? Dracus said, his arms holding Mala tighter still. Because the battle here will soon be ending, Jugar said in the darkness, and those left will be looking for something else to kill. With each fold passage, the carnage increased. Thanks to the confused rush of the armies to return home, the warriors of the fallen houses had been spread unevenly throughout the complex system of fold portals, a cancer that erupted suddenly, seemingly everywhere at once. Where the greater concentrations of warriors were found, the destruction was even more savage. That the warrior madmen were no longer restricted by the totems became an even greater problem, as in some places they were able to overwhelm the forces of the other houses and spill into the countryside. In those places, death was the rule. It was the silence that shocked them. Not total silence. The lyric was humming a tune whose quiet notes drifted with the smoke that lay like a thin veil over the field. Mala whimpered as she shook behind Dracus. The others were grim and silent. Ru'u Kog broke the crystal stillness his voice dry and cracking, startling them despite his care. Which way do we go now? Now you're in a hurry, Ethis whispered. Anything to get out of this place, Ru'u Kog croaked. Dracus held the sleeve of his tunic across his nose and mouth, desperate to separate his senses from the stench that permeated the air around them. There were several portals that he could still see operating at the far perimeters of the marshalling field. He remembered this field as being one of the largest, the nexus of seven portals originally, although now only five of them were functioning. The bulk of Timuron's forces must have been bottled up here when everything changed. Now two of the portals were dark and useless. But the others... That one, Dracus said, pointing beyond a slight rise in the center of the field. That one leads farther on. How many more of these portals do we have to pass? Mala murmured, her voice shaking. She could not take her eyes away from the moldering death blanketing her view to the horizon. Can we... can't we just leave? We've got to keep going, Dracus insisted. The portals are the fastest path for us to get as far as possible. But for how long? 
Ru'ukar gasped through a sigh. The Emperor will not tolerate such rebellion. He will bring the weight of his imperial will down with a vengeance to regain control of the folds for the Myrdin die. It is in the question of if, but when. He's right, Jugar nodded. The armies of the Emperor will return order, and soon. Face it, lad, we have to get off this path at some point. Not yet. Dracus shook his head. He knew the dwarf was right, that they were all right, but he could not yet face leaving the confusion and horror of the portals. The thought of turning from the roads previously so familiar to him and striking out into lands unknown terrified him worse than the carnage and battle of the portal road. Dracus, warrior of House Timuron, was afraid of getting lost. More than that, he realized, he was afraid of being alone with his thoughts. Being driven from terror to terror had the advantage that there was no time to reflect on the raging animal of his own memories, still kept at bay in the back of his mind. But they were right. He could not run forever. Two, maybe three more portals, Dracus said. Then we'll abandon the portals and strike out on foot. Two, the dwarf said. Two, if we can make it. Why two? Ethis asked through the inscrutable mask of his face. I know that place well, Jugar said. There are friendly caverns not far from the gallant, if untimely, tragic marshalling fields through which we have been touring. It should provide us respite and, might I add, comparative safety for a time. I might even be persuaded to perform one of my more cheery and delightsome tales, if it would help. It might, Dracus said as he once again surveyed the gore-laden field of fallen warriors, searching for a path through the piles of dead. He reached back for Mala's hand. She clasped his quickly. Listen, there are field packs everywhere, and no one here is going to ever need them again. Everyone keep an eye out for a pack. The more provisions, the better. And follow my steps. Let's go. They alone moved. Globe torches lay scattered on the ground, illuminating ghastly tableaus of carnage, death, blood and gore. Dracus trod carefully among the dead, dreading what his tentative next footfall would find. He could see the fold portal on the far side of the field around the edge of a small knoll. If they could somehow manage to keep their sanity until then... Dracus! He froze. The sound had come from the top of the knoll. A single figure struggled to its feet at the crest of the small mound. A globe torch at its feet threw the ghastly, blood-coated figure into stark relief. As the hideous form stood shaking, it raised its hand above its head, clutching a circular band in its hand. It was human in form and size, but it was otherwise difficult to distinguish its features. The figure's face was swollen and its hair torn away from one side, but the voice could not be mistaken. Bashkar, Dracus murmured, barely believing the name that fell from his lips. He let go of Mala's hand, gesturing for her to stay at the base of the knoll, uncertain about his former comrade. The former cohort leader swayed slightly as he arched his back and howled at the stars overhead. We're free now, aren't we? Free! Yes, Dracus responded as he moved cautiously up the slope. His footing was slick and squishy. He dared not look down, keeping his eyes on his former brother-in-arms. We're free after all, Vashkar. Vashkar's eyes shone white all around the wide-open irises of his eyes. We've showed them, Dracus! They weren't expecting us to do it, but we did! That's right, Dracus said calmly as he took another step up the slope. Come with us and everything will be all right. I have it! Vashkar giggled through the foam at his mouth. <laughs> the dwarven crown! I took it! Now Master will be so pleased! We'll be able to buy anything, Dracus! Imagine it! Anything we want! Dracus took another step, but his mind was churning. The dwarven crown... He must have taken it while it was still in transit to House Tajaran. Maybe they could go back. 
barter the crown for their freedom. Maybe they could... Maybe he'll give me back my sons that he sold, eh, Dracus? Vashkar grinned. I didn't remember them, Dracus, but I do now. I can see them both screaming at the slaver as he dragged them away. Ah, oh, such fighters! The slaver nearly clubbed one of them senseless he put up such a fight, and him only eight or so years along. Oh, what good boys! Surely old Timuron will give me my sons back for a dwarven crown! Dracus stopped. He was finding it hard to breathe. He glanced down the slope and saw the others had stopped too, transfixed by the terrible image at the crest of the hill. No. No, I've got it! Vashkar nodded as his eyes darted from side to side. Maybe he can return my daughter. She had gone lame on the march to the provinces. Oh, you should have seen her before. But she was always such a delicate flower. Dracus took another step. Please, Vashkar. The blood-soaked warrior suddenly sat down, his weight pressing down on the chest of a fallen manticore forcing blood out of a gaping wound. Vashkar took no notice, holding the crown in front of him with both hands as he spoke. I tried to carry her, but Timuron caught on that she was lame. He had me butcher her right there by the side of the road. Is she worth a crown, Dracus? Could it buy back her breath? I felt it leave her body. I don't know, Dracus said softly. What do you think, Dracus? Vashkar said as he looked up with pleading eyes. Do you think he will give me back my soul? He held the broken, bloody metal ring above his head. Dracus took in a long, deep breath. It was not the crown at all, he realized. It was a jagged, edged metal hoop torn from a small cask. It was cut in places, slivers of metal sticking out from it. Worthless. Come with me, Vashka, Dracus said, extending his hand. We'll take care of you. Figure this out. Thief! Vashkar screamed, leaping to his feet with unholy speed, his hand reaching at once for the hilt of his blade. You can't have it! It's mine! My life! Mine! Dracus barely managed to avoid the blow, leaping to the side. He rolled, his body flopping over the dead, their filth covering him. Dracus tried to regain his footing, but Vashkar's blade flashed in the light of the globe torch, and Dracus could only scramble out of the way again. His hands reached down to stop his fall, sliding among the bodies, scraping against the broken armor, a small dagger handle suddenly pressing against his palm. Vashkar screamed above him, raising his sword as he ran wild-eyed across the slain. Dracus leaped toward the insane warrior, connecting so hard that it knocked the wind from his lungs, yet he held fast to the slick grip of the dagger, pressing it upward into Vashkar's ribs. Both warriors collapsed atop the knoll. Dracus rolled away, pulling the dagger free, but his hand was caught beneath the gasping human's head. He tried to pull away, but Vashkar reached across with his left hand, gripping Dracus at the back of the neck and pulling him toward himself. Please. Vashkar wheezed, his lungs filling quickly from the wound. Please, Dracus, don't take it from me. Please, my sons. Dracus grimaced, then held still. His face was inches away from the dying man. As you will, Dracus said. You may keep it. For your sons, and my daughter. Surely, Dracus looked away as he spoke. Surely, for your daughter. Vashkar grinned, his teeth filling with his own blood. Then his chest fell one last time, and he was still. Dracus pushed the body away from him and stood, alone at the crest of the knoll. The silence was complete and suddenly unbearable. What are you staring at? He yelled at his companions. Everyone, 
Pick up a field pack and let's get through that portal now. We've got a long way to go. It's quiet. And the dead will not trouble us, Ethis suggested. We could rest here a while. No. Dracus spoke, the words sticking in his dry throat. No one will ever rest here again. Chapter 21 The Hunt Two days! So unseethed. Two days we've been going in the opposite direction of these bolters. We finally are on their trail, and you want us to wait? The Master Iblisi stood to the side of the fold platform, his face inches from Jukong's long nose. His two Codexia stood to the side, their hands folded inside the sleeves of their robes, hoods drawn over their heads, leaving their faces in shadow from the late morning sun. Each watched the scene with detached amusement. Hazing the younger members of the Order was an old and established pastime, but it could be a dangerous game when played with one of the Keeper's favorites. Jukung blanched, but did not back down. You had to give the young Assessia credit, Soen thought through his rage. Jukung was a young green blade, but he stood his ground. Chidre would not have chosen the whelp to spy on the Iblisi if he could not stand up against Soen's occasional hot wind. It's her order that we remain here until she arrives, Jukung replied, his back stiffening. Here! Soen scoffed, his left hand darting out to point at the blood-soaked mounds of the field behind them. Impress warriors moved about the battlefield, dragging the dead toward the center of the clearing, where a great pit had been dug. Several tribunes and a handful of proxies maintained a raging fire in the pit into which the dead were being cast. The greasy black smoke curled upward, fanning over the surrounding trees in the still air. The stench of the bodies lying under the warm sun was overshadowed by that of burning flesh. I confess that I am at a loss to understand your disapproval, Master Iblisi. It is a great honor that the Keeper affords us as she rarely leaves the Keep of our Order for any purpose, let alone to travel as far as the Western Provinces. Then you wait around and receive her honors. Soen spat. No doubt you've honored her enough times in the past. Kinsei, standing next to the Inquisitor, covered her laugh with a cough. Jukung set his sharp jaw against the hot words that had come to his mind and spoke more delicately than he would have liked. It is nevertheless her will that we await her coming as she is most anxious for your report. Odd that her intention should be communicated so quickly over such a distance. Soen continued. I should have sent you back to the Imperial City, herding slaves with the rest of the Assessia. The instructions of the Keeper were clear, Jukung stated. Such an act would not have served the will of the Emperor. Don't talk to me about the will of the Emperor, boy. Soen spoke in a quiet, dangerous tone. I've stood in the presence of the Emperor and know his will far better than any of Chidre's pets. Master Soen, Fong said at once, injecting himself between the Iblisi and his Assessia, before either was tempted to take their argument further. I have spoken with the tribunes and left something worthwhile to report. Soen waited for a moment before responding. I will hear your report, Fong. Fong bowed slightly, and then spoke. Tribune Tsafe reports that just prior to the battle joining last night, an Octian from the house Tajaran reported to her. Let me guess, Soen said, looking down at the ground and nodding as he spoke. Three humans, two of them female, two manticores, one Chimerian, and... And a dwarf, yes, master, Fong said. Soen shook his head in wonder. Why take the dwarf? The creature was so obvious. It made no sense. If they were bolting, they would want to remain as inconspicuous as possible. But, he reminded himself, just how sane were they, after all? Did he say which way they went? Soen asked. Yes, master. Fong nodded. 
just after they were positioned at the front of the defending line they ran off into the trees. The elven Codexia raised his hand, pointing with a pair of long fingers. There, near where those two trees are grown together. Soen was striding across the field before Fong had finished his sentence. He took little notice of the putrefying bodies over which he stepped, beyond occasionally altering his course when their bulk was otherwise unavoidable. He assumed that the remaining members of his quorum were following behind him. Soen's eyes remained fixed on the twin trees at the edge of the field and the forest of which they were a part. Soen's pace quickened as he moved between the glowing crystal structures of the totems surrounding the field. Their magic had contained the slave herd of warriors as intended, so the bodies diminished at once as he passed them. Diminished, he noted grimly, but did not end entirely. There were other bodies beyond the totems, each of whose shaven heads bore the mark of one of the fallen houses. The explosive failure of the Timuron well had far-reaching effects indeed, he realized, for now they knew that the bolters that had caused all this, or any of the fallen warriors for that matter, were no longer constrained to the strictly controlled channels of the totems and fold platforms. He slowed as he approached the tree, his keen eyes searching the ground. He took it all in quickly. A broken twig here, a bent blade there, patterns in the grasses around the base of the trees and the patches of exposed dirt on the slope falling away from him down toward a ravine. For him, tracking was a gift from the gods for which he was grateful each day. It had saved his life many times down the long and difficult years of his service, and brought an end to many more lives who threatened all that he served. He drew in a deep breath, holding his hand up in warning as his quorum joined him from behind. He could see it all in his mind's eye, the squat dwarf cutting a wide path across the grass, the small, deep footfalls of the Chimerian, and a pair of manticores crashing through the lower branches of the overhanging trees— they moved down the slope, slightly to the left. Soen followed it all in his head, moving with light, quick steps down the slope. He had the track now and knew what to look for. He stepped through the trees, the dappled light falling on him as he passed, and then stopped, kneeling down and staring at the ground. What is it, master? Kinsei asked. Here, Soen pointed. Note this, human footprints. They stopped here facing each other, very close, too. One set is deeper and larger than the other, male, while the other is smaller and lighter, female, I believe. Mate it, then? Jukung offered. Soen stood up, placing his hands on his hips as he surveyed his surrounding once more. Perhaps. A good sign, for it will slow them up, make them easier to capture or kill. The dwarf joined them here, it seems, as well as the other human woman, then they all moved off along the ridge line. They were making for the fold portal again, Fong said with a sigh. Yes, again, Soen said. They followed along the path of their quarry, weaving among the trees and down into a shallow ravine. They turned with the tracks through the tall grass, traveling upward until they emerged from the tree line, as predicted, at the far end of the marshalling field near the base of the fold portal. Jukung trotted up the steps of the platform. The fold shimmered before him as he gazed into its rippling surface. Then the Assessia turned and sat down on the steps. He gestured back through the portal with his thumb. More carnage, more dead. I believe it's getting worse. The scale of this, it is almost too great to comprehend. Kinsei said as she gazed out over the slaughter still scattered before them. How is it possible that the fall of a single house well could cause this much damage? It's because the Mirdendai and the Okuran do not trust each other. Soen said as he too gazed over the gory field. They caused this! Jukung scoffed. Soen ignored the implied insult. In part... The Okuran have basked in the imperial mandate for over a hundred years, maintaining the network of aether wells in the provinces and the imperial trade folds that held the empire together. It has long been the center of their power. The force of aether is diminished exponentially by distance, requiring a network of wells and folds to maintain its strength across the empire. 
You speak the obvious, Zhu Kong said. Only because you seem to understand only the obvious, So Wen replied. All that was upset when the Mir Dentai got the imperial mandate to provide the folds for the dwarven campaigns. For the first time, the Alcuran were not to be trusted transporting the legions into war, and the insult was not lost on anyone in the first estate. The Mir Dentai could not trust the Alcuran to provide them with the required aether from the established system of wells, so they were required to build their own separate aether conduits linking through each of their own fold platforms. It meant having to build twice the number of fold platforms, because they could not rely on any aether being available at the other end. They had to push their own aether through as well. But when the Timuron well shattered and caused all those house wells across the frontier to fail... The Mir Dendai folds were powered separately and remained functioning, and that was what caused the biggest problem. Since the devotion spells and the field altars of all the houses were passing through the still active Mir Dendai open folds, the failure of their wells was carried too. The warriors of the fallen houses fell with them wherever they were among the folds on their return home. Kinsei drew in a deep breath. The Mir Dindai did their job too well. And that answers the question that the Mir Dindai sent us to answer for them, but we still don't know why the house Timuron well shattered and caused all this in the first place. Soen replied, walking around the base of the platform as he spoke, looking for more signs of his quarry's passing. That, my fellow quorum members, is precisely what we must find out. How is it possible that a handful of slaves could bring the fist of the imperial will to such complete destruction? Soen stopped, his eyes widening. It was too perfect, he thought. It was not possible that he should be so blessed by the gods, and yet there it lay next to the base of the fold. He reached down, allowing himself a slight smile as his fingers closed around the object tenderly as though he were afraid that it might vanish like an apparition at his touch. It was several long blades of grass. He recognized it as coming from the base of the ravine they had just passed through. The blades were woven together, folded and twisted around themselves until they formed an intricate knotted pattern. Master, Thong asked, what is it? Soen slipped the woven grass blades casually inside his belt. Nothing. Get moving, we've not a moment to lose. Master Iblisi, Jukung spoke with exaggerated patience. Mistress Chadre, will have to catch up to us. Soen finished angrily. Move! By the gods, Kinsei exclaimed, her hand pulling the sleeve of her robes up across her mouth and nose as though such a futile gesture would help, so in thought, fighting the rebellion of his own stomach at the sights and smells everywhere around them. The flies were thick over the sea of rotting flesh stretching across the gentle undulations of the wide field. One knoll, rising above the rest, was piled high in death, difficult to see through the swarming insects. The tracks lead directly into the dead, so in said, nearly gagging on his words. He had seen the carnage of battle many times before, and had both faced and dealt death in many forms, but nothing had prepared him for this. He glanced at Kinsei, who was trying to keep her eyes moving and focused on the distant, indistinct regions of the marshalling field. Fong was holding very still. Jukung had turned and was doubled over, contributing the contents of his stomach to the horrific aroma, though its effect was negligible. Soen slowly knelt down on the platform, his hands indolently picking at the debris marring its once polished surface. Fong spoke with care. How... Mm, how are we going to track them in that? Soen's eye caught something on the platform, and the shadow of a smile tugged at his lips. He picked up a trampled flower and examined it carefully before he stood. Soen thought for a moment longer, then spoke. We can't. Jukung managed to push himself upright again. 
Then, then that's it. We go back and report to Mistress Chidre. No, Soen said, shaking his head. We continue. Continue, Chukung repeated in disbelief. You just said we cannot track them through... through this. Look, Soen said, pointing with his first two fingers to the far limits of the enormous field. There are four other portals functional. One of them leads farther up toward Hyperia, the other three back toward Ebania. So far our prey is continued farther from the heart of the Empire. But which one do we take? Fong asked. Soen considered, then spoke. All of them. Kinsei, Fong, and Jukung all stared at the Iblisi. We can't be sure which one they took, but if we explore each of them separately, we might choose the wrong path and set ourselves back more than we already are. Soen said, But... If we each follow a separate path on our own, each of us looking for signs of our prey, then we'll cover them all much more quickly. We'll each take a different fold that return here before nightfall. If one of us does not return, then we'll all know which path to follow, and we'll take it and continue the hunt. It breaks the quorum, Kinsei said, obviously disapproving. If we don't recover these bolters while we can, Soen said, there may not be enough quorums in the Empire to stop them. Chapter 22 Togrun Fell Two days we've walked, and this is our price, Mala sputtered, unable to decide whether to laugh or weep. I, Jugar said with pride, his eyes flashing in the light of the setting sun. Partake of the sanctuary offered by the dwarven gods and glory in its honor. Few mortals have been privileged to enter the confines of the Togrun Fell. Dracus looked again and remained unimpressed. The hill was no taller than any of the others extending to the southeast. It did, he had to admit, have a rather precipitous exposed face on its southern side, but the carvings in its surface were altogether worn and crumbling, in such bad states of deterioration that it was difficult to get any idea of what they were meant to depict. Indeed, he had not even noticed the carvings until they were nearly at the base of the cliff itself. Mossy grass overhung the top edge of the rock face, the gods of nature trying to hide the scars that the dwarves had made. The tears of the dead are of dust now. The breath of their life now stopped. Their voices, though still, are calling your will. Drakus reached back and rubbed at the aching in his neck. The field pack he was carrying was heavier than he expected. It's a tomb. Aye. Jugar nodded, his widely spaced teeth grinning in appreciation. Ruukog let out a great chuff of disapproval. <laughs> He wants us to hide in a grave. Better to hide temporarily in a tomb than to take up permanent residence, Ethis said, folding his four arms in front of him as he inspected the entrance. Still, I would have expected better craftsmanship from the dwarves. Even the entrance looks more like an accident than an intention. Are you blind, sir? The dwarf huffed. But that is the craft. Togrun Fell is not a dwarven tomb, though it was constructed by them, and, might I humbly add, with the greatest of their arts in stone. It was wrought in honor of the friendship once joined between the fey queens of the Hyperion Woods and the nine dwarven kings, and the great sacrifice they and their dryads made near this very spot. This was back in the Age of Fire, when all the world was set ablaze by the elven conquests, and the humans stood shoulder to shoulder with the dwarves and the fairy against their onslaught. Drakus raised a questioning eyebrow at Jugar. Well, the dwarf sputtered. Perhaps not exactly shoulder to shoulder, as the dwarven shoulders were always considerably lower than those of the humans, but I speak metaphorically. Even so... This is a place of dreaded power for the elves. 
Were it not for the special keywords to which I alone am privy, this innocent-looking portal would blast us with the power of the gods themselves, were we but to dare pass its threshold unbidden. Fear not, my good companions, for though you would suffer the most painful of curses otherwise, I shall... I shall... Where are you going? Dracus turned to follow the dwarf's gaze. The lyric stepped quickly through the portal, her lithe figure swallowed almost at once by the darkness. Peals of her bubbling laughter echoed from within. Nasty dwarven curse, that, Ethis said in flat tones. The dwarf sputtered. B but I... I don't... Dracus reached down wearily behind him and pulled Mala up from where she had collapsed to the ground. The house tattoo on her beautiful, bald head was already being obscured by a fuzz of rust-colored hair emerging from her scalp. Her smudged face accentuated the exhaustion in her eyes. She looked hard, resentful, as she shrugged her own field pack higher on her shoulders, and he wondered for a moment what had happened to the bright face and the easy smile that he had seen so often in his dreams and his waking hours as well. She was so different now, so much less than he remembered, so much pain and loss, so common, so real. Nine notes, seven notes. The heart of the warrior is not his. It beats for another soul. They had awakened from both a dream and a nightmare all at once when the Aether Well fell with the House of Timuron. They had left their innocence behind, and now, eyes opened, found the reality of their lives to be a nightmare too. He no longer knew the woman whose hand he held with such unthinking devotion but he held it just the same, out of a hope for the shadows he had once believed were true. He was a creature of honor and of duty, though he no longer understood what honor he pursued, nor to whom his duty remained. All he knew with certainty was that he once loved Mala, if not the woman that he no longer knew, then the ideal of her, and that, for all he knew, was what his honor and duty were about. They stepped through the opening and nearly ran at once into a stone wall. His eyes were still adjusting from the light of the setting sun, and he could make out a glow to his left. He felt along the rock face, his right hand in front of him as he pulled Mala behind him with his left. The wall ended abruptly beneath his fingers, where the glow was, and Dracus turned the corner. The warrior's grim face relaxed into awestruck wonder. The entire stone hill was hollowed into an enormous dome surrounding a magnificent central fountain. Luminous waters cascaded from the top of the ornate spout, fashioned from the purest white marble to resemble the branches of a tree. The skill of its artisans ensured that the water splashed in its descent to appear as the foliage of the tree, ever living and moving as the water fell down to where its stone roots gripped the floor of a wide, shining pool. The shimmering light from the surface of the waters played across the detailed carvings of enormous trees, hewn in relief from the encircling stone with intricate detail, their own branches interlacing in the dome above them. The movement of the light occasionally revealed figures in the carvings, fairies and sprites that seemed to form just at the fringes of his vision, Nymphs that danced for a moment and then vanished. Dryads that smiled back at him and then could no longer be seen at all. There were the unmistakable marks of age in the cavern, for it had long been untended, yet its beauty remained. Chugar stepped up next to Dracus. His head hung in dejection. Oh, I wanted you to see it in all its glory. There were gems, lad, gems as big as your fist, and more gold and silver than a soul could see in a lifetime. But the tomb has been despoiled, and its riches taken by thieves. Oh, lad, I'm so sorry. You're wrong, dwarf, Dracus said in a whisper. How, then? The riches are still here he said with a gentle smile. Dracus stepped carefully into the enormous chamber, his eyes gazing in reverent joy at the wonders around him. Welcome, my brave friends. 
Strakus turned with some reluctance from the glorious magical carvings on the walls toward the deep, sultry voice now carrying through the hall. It came from the shining fountain tree, and for a moment he wondered if the tree itself had spoken to them. The soaked form of the lyric emerged from the nimbus of water. She had abandoned her field pack next to the pool. Now her wet dress clung to her body as she moved, revealing a strong and beautiful form that Dracus would not have supposed her to possess. She was transformed. Her narrow chin was raised in elegant poise, and she carried her chest high and shoulders back so that a regal curve formed down her spine. She held her arms away from her body and bowed gracefully until the tips of her fingers lingered near her strong thighs. Drops of the water sparkled and shone in the white bristles of her emerging hair. I thank you all, the lyric said in a deep, sleepy voice. Together we shall triumph. Together we shall be free. Mala stepped out from behind Dracus, her questioning eyes fixed on the majestic form standing in the water. Lyric? So you may have known me, the lyric replied, her head nodding slightly in acknowledgment. But you have awakened me from my long sleep and freed me. The grateful thanks of my kingdom shall be yours. Kingdom? Ru'ukag rumbled. What kingdom? I see you do not understand, the lyric said with slight condescension. It is to be forgiven. Uh, perhaps our good lady would humor us? Jugar said with a smile, although his eyes showed uncertainty. The lyric raised her face in statuesque magnificence. I am Muriallus, she said, her deep tones resonating in the hall. Fay, queen of the Hyperion woodland, lost these many years to my native lands, lying in forgetfulness until you, good friends, have freed me from my awful captivity. To you I offer the protection of my kingdom, sanctuary from your pursuers, and the grateful thanks of the woodland realm. Ru Ka gasped. You're, you're a queen? I am Ru'ukag of the Manticores, the lyric intoned solemnly. Fay queen of the Hyperion woodland. Belog nodded thoughtfully. It is another sign from the gods. It begins, Drakus. Do you not see it? It is spoken of old that he shall meet with commoners and kings, that the works of his justice shall be wrought. Dracus held up his hand before his Manticorean companion could get any further with his religious discourse. Jugar, we... I've never heard of such a queen. Do you know what she is talking about? Jugar kept his eyes fixed on the imperious form of the lyric in the water. Aye, there is a fairy queen that is said to rule in cold isolation in the great woods west of the Aryan Mountains... A realm is closed to outsiders, however, and there are no tales, at least none reliable, concerning the ruler of forest spirits and sprites. It is said that those who have ventured beyond her borders never return, having been ensnared by that mystical realm and brought into a sleep that lasts a thousand years. Who would have been awake then to tell the tale? Ethis asked dryly. Jugar rolled his eyes. Uh, these are indeed but tales, and I am, after all, a fool who is telling them. Entertainment is my business, not the chronicle of the ages. Five notes. Five notes. A queen of the north, in hope, drawing forth. But such a queen, Dracus persisted. Could it be possible that Timuron somehow captured her, enslaved her? Jugar screwed his left eye into a hard wink as he considered. Stranger things have happened, lad, although I can't recall any of them at the moment. Nine notes. Seven notes. 
But if she is who she says she is, Dracus persisted, then we have a chance at a life. If we can make it to this kingdom of hers. The Hyperion Woods! Jugar laughed. You are ambitious, lad. That's full well sixty, uh, maybe seventy leagues from here. Five notes. Five notes. But it is to the north, isn't it? Dracus pressed with urgency. Ah, uh, I well, more west than north it is. But, but that's more than two weeks on stout legs with nary a rest between, and it would be well to point out that most of that is open country, not settled land by any measure of the term. We're provisioned. Dracus countered as he unconsciously hooked his thumbs under the straps of his field pack, a plan forming quickly in his head. Aye, the partial field packs, but that's not for the length of two weeks. It will get us far enough. Dracus continued. We can take local game. We've done that before on the longer campaigns. And Ru'ukag, you weren't always a gardener. I remember you in the worksheds. Didn't you work for the butcher for a time? Ru'ukag's eyes closed painfully, his long fangs bared. <sighs> yes, I was a butcher once. There, then, Dracus answered enthusiastically. What about this water, Juga? Can we drink it? These are the sacred waters of the... Can we drink it? Well, yes, but... We'll take our fill, rest here tonight, and then set out at first light. Dracus continued. We'll ration what provisions we have and then forage for the rest. The Iblisi will come for us, the lyric intoned ominously. They will not give up a queen of the Fae. Then all the more reason for us to travel quickly and to travel light. Stop, Dracus, Mala interjected. Just think for a moment. The lyric hasn't said one believable sentence since we fled the master's house, and now you're willing to believe she's a queen of some place we've never heard of? Jugar has heard of it, Dracus replied, irritation creeping into his voice. Jugar said that anyone who went in never came back. Look, if we're going to survive and make any kind of life for ourselves, we've got to go somewhere. Dracus heard his own voice growing louder with his frustration. And if this fairy place offers us asylum from the Iblisi, then maybe I'd rather not come back from it. Mala wheeled to Ethis for support. And you? You haven't said anything for a while? What do you think of this insane plan? Ethis looked up, as though returning his thoughts from a distant place. What? Oh, I quite agree with Dracus. By all means, we should make for the Hyperion Woods. What? Mala squeaked. The Chimerian spread his four arms, then clasped them in two sets before himself. The Iblisi surely will come for us. We are now considered... What is their term? Ah, oh, yes, bolters. They will have enough problems for a few days sorting through many others like us that have escaped from the armies, at least those who remain alive after the slaughter we've witnessed so far. But ultimately they will search us out. They cannot let us go free, no matter whether we have a queen with us or not. Ethis turned and focused his eyes on the lyric standing with regal grandeur in the light of the pool. We have run, and must keep running, it seems that our hopes now rest with the Queen of the Fae. Chapter 23 Murialis Kinsey knelt with one knee on the steps leading up to the portal. Her mate staff held vertically at her side. The deepening sunset cast a deeply colored salmon pall over the dead carpeting the ground before her. Kinsey did not move, her eyes shifting from time to time to the other portals at the distant points around the field of death. The carrion birds had come, and were only mildly disturbed by her return. Indeed, the longer she knelt here watching the field, the more it appeared to move, undulating under the motion of the rats, carrion birds, and other vermin whose task in the world, ordained by the gods themselves, was to clean up after the violence of conflict, death and destruction. The pulsing blue-white glow emanating from the headpiece of her mate staff not only kept the elven Iblisi Codexia safe, 
but also served to isolate her from the scavenging going on all around her. It was quite beautiful, she thought, her dark reddish robes shifting in the wind. All the power of death brought down to its absolute and common simplicity. The dead flesh would be rendered, the bones would dry, the metal disintegrate into rust, and all the death and violence would fall back into rich earth in time, smoothed over until even this blood-soaked field would be leveled, not by the will of the emperor, but by the small things of creation. Elven children would one day walk this field, and never know that the horrifying visage and overwhelming stench of death had ever troubled the grass beneath their feet. Not that any elves would pass this way for a very long time. The Myrdin die would very quickly and quietly reroute their fold system, so that such embarrassing places would no longer be anywhere near where anyone might discover them. Fields of the dead like this would be abandoned and forgotten, along with their dead. Kinsey alone would remember. So she waited under the darkening skies as she had been told to do, as the Inquisitor expected her to do. A ripple rebounded across the surface of the portal to the far south. Kinsey slowly stood as a figure in a robe matching her own emerged from the shimmering vertical pool. Mate's staff held with both hands across his chest. Fong, Kinsey murmured. She could see her brother gazing at her and then stepping down from the platform. Kinsey understood. Fong had found no trace of their bolter prey, just as she too had failed. But then neither of them had expected to do otherwise. Wordlessly, Kinsey stood and lifted her mate from the ground. Both Iblisi moved quickly across the carrion field, their light footfalls scattering the rats wherever they trod. They were both Codexia, well-trained and experienced in performing their duties far from the eyes of the Emperor. They both approached the third portal, where the young Assessia, Jukung, had entered earlier in the day. They reached the portal at the same time, climbed the steps together, and stared through its rippled surface to the marshalling field beyond. Battle had been joined there, too, but at least they could see movement on the other side. Whose movement, and whether the survivors were still under control of the Imperial will, they could not see. Crows cawed angrily behind them, then subsided. The wind rose slightly, then fell. We should kill him, Fong observed. Kinsei glanced casually at her companion. He is young and foolish. Fong was unmoved. He is a spy. Yes, but whose? He may only be Keeper Chidre's spy, Kinsei noted with emphasis. Had Inquisitor Soen wanted him dead, he would have slipped him among the rest of these corpses earlier in the day. You do not believe he has a mandate, then? Fong asked. From the Emperor, or one of the other orders? I don't know. Kinsei spoke with a casual air, though both Codexia knew that each of their words was chosen with the utmost care. I believe that Soen does not know either. "'which is why both we and the Assessia have spent the day chasing shadows "'while our master Inquisitor proceeds ahead of us.' "'The vague, shifting form of a dark-robed figure "'was approaching the portal from the other side. <sighs> "'Then we'll not kill the Assessia. "'Fong agreed, folding his arms in front of him "'as he cradled his mate in the crook of his arm. "'With a full day's lead on us, "'will we be able to overtake the Inquisitor?' Fong was surprised by her response. It was a rare and noteworthy occasion when Kinsei smiled. Only if he wants us to. Togren fell, as Jugar explained, with the enormous surety that comes when no one else present can possibly challenge one's facts, stood at the northernmost end of the Sedra Hills, a range of round-topped mountains that formed the northwestern boundary of the Ibania region. Beyond it stretched the plains of western Hyperia. None of these names were of any use to Dracus. Standing with the sun rising at his back, all he saw was a grassy plain that stretched to a hazy, indistinct horizon, whose line was broken only by a single vertical finger of mountain, 
so indistinctly blending its purple form with the dark horizon that he could almost doubt its existence. Even the dark line of the Aryan mountains far to the north seemed more real than the single pillar to the west. What is that? Dracus asked Jugar. That? Oh! That! Well, uh... Jugar said, then spat on the ground suddenly. It's nothing! Really, just a big pillar of rock! We won't be going anywhere near it, I assure you! It's called the Hecariot, Ethis said, walking quietly up to join them. A place which the dwarves considered both cursed by their gods and haunted by the restless dead, if my memory serves me well. The Hecariot is not a place to be spoken of! Jugar said, and then spat quickly on the ground once more. That sad tale and its tragic end is best left within the blasted stones of its lost glory. It is an abomination towering over the Hyperion plains. And it is our only landmark by which we may guide our steps across those same plains. Ethis said to Dracus, We'll need it to get across. But the dwarf is right. We should endeavor to keep it on our left and pass as well to the north of it as we dare without running into the occupied lands to the north. The Emperor, I suspect, still has a large contingent looting the mountain halls of the Nine Kings, and they would make a quick end to us all if we ran into them. <sighs> I've got to stop. Mala dropped down among the tall blades of grass suddenly, her arms folded across her chest. The stretching plain had proved to be both difficult to navigate and, at the same time, filled with an incredible dull sameness. For the three days they had trekked across its expanse, the grim dark finger of stone on the horizon by which they fixed their path seemed to grow no closer. Everything now seemed to come with a mixture of both blessing and curse. Streams winding their way around the hills and ponds that accumulated in their hollows brought the welcome, life-giving water that they needed to sustain their march to the northwest. Yet their advent was unpredictable, always bringing into question whether this was the last river or lake. Moreover, each presented a diversion from their path as they searched for a crossing or a way around its shores. Copses and even forests of trees offered the promise of cool shade and rest during the day— but in so doing, also offered the threat of wild beasts that took such places for their lairs. The rations they had secured as they passed through the portal system had thus far sustained them and kept them largely clear of any dangers the woods presented, but most of Dracus's companions knew that they would not last them the full measure of their journey. Within the week, entering the cool shade of the woods and confronting the creatures there would become imperative— even the stretches of flat grasslands that made the going much faster and easier also gave in their ease time to think, question, and worst of all, remember. Now is not the time, Dracus responded with mounting frustration. There is a copse of trees just atop that far slope. It does not appear large enough to be threatening. We can all rest there in the shade. Mala looked up at him with such hatred in her eyes that it took Dracus aback. It was all so confusing. He was smart enough to realize that he had just said something that terribly angered the woman, but could not possibly know what it was he had said that should provoke her. Something in their past, some memory he had just tripped on by accident. It was a hazard whose avoidance he had not mastered, nor did he see, to his additional frustration, how he possibly could master it. A sound? A smell? or some otherwise meaningless simple thing passing before his eyes would trigger a cascade of thoughts, experiences, and impressions that threatened to overwhelm him, and he knew had completely overwhelmed others. In those moments he retreated to his training, occupying himself with repetitive tasks of his warrior calling until he beat back those unwelcome memories. Even then he could not avoid collapsing to the ground from time to time, fighting to control his thoughts and cope with the monstrous past that threatened to engulf him. Each night he awakened both screaming and weeping, his heart pounding at the nightmares that filled his sleep. And he was not alone, for Belog and Ru'u Kog both were doing the same. Each of them seemed to be clinging to something else that kept their individual monsters at bay. Then there was Mala. 
His perfect companion had become sullen, angry, moody, and argumentative, all while generally complaining to the point of distraction. She cried often, and the rest of the time eyed him with such contempt as to make him feel shame without telling him why she hated him. Part of his confusion was that he also knew why. There were memories of harsh words, snubs, slights, insults, fights, and far worse in his treatment of her that were roiling around in his memory. That he had been manipulated by Timuron and each of his masters. He realized now that there had been many different masters. It made little difference to him, since he had no connection between the memories to judge whether they were cruelties to Mala that had been manipulated by either Timuron or his daughter, or terrible acts of his own volition. He flushed as he remembered the many nights when Shaban had called him to her rooms, disgracing him before her lusts, only to discover that the elven whore had arranged for Mala to discover them. Shaban took particular sadistic delight in breaking Mala night after night until she tired of that monstrous game. Shaban was gone, dead more than likely at the hands of the very slave she despised, and yet... Dracus and Mala were left to deal with the horrors of the memories that now flooded into their minds. How were they to have a future after such a past? Dracus awoke with a start, a massive hand covering his mouth. His body tensed for a struggle, but a great weight pressed on his chest, pinning him to the ground and making it impossible for him to move. A huge silhouette crouched over him, its outline framed by the brilliant stars of the night sky. The pressure on his chest let up gently, and the hand came away from his mouth. You were crying out. Belog's deep voice whispered over him. I thought it best to quiet you. It is not good to attract the attention of the night. Dracus lay still for a moment then sat up in the darkness. The nightmare still hovered around his thoughts as he struggled to awaken fully. The manticore warrior moved silently away from him, and the others of their group lying close together at the top of a small hill. He stood apart, tall and proud, his eyes searching the horizon as he watched over them. Dracus stood up and moved to stand next to the Lion Man. The Manticorean clans hailed from Chenandria, a land far to the north and east of the Ronas Empire. Dracus wondered if Belog had ever walked its legendary plains, and then realized that Chenandrian lands might look remarkably like the land over which they traveled now. The human turned to gaze at the Hikariat. The strange obelisk of mountain stone lay to the southwest still. It seemed to be at a great distance, but Dracus could make out details of its cliffs during the day. In the dark of night, however. What do you suppose that strange light is at the summit? Dracus asked idly. Belog frowned. I do not know. It shifts about the peak. It is an ill omen. We pass well to its north. I shall see that you are kept safe from its curse. Thank you, <laughs> Dracus said his smile unseen in the darkness. It is my honor, Dracus, the manticore replied solemnly. You are the chosen one, the incarnation of our hope and the prophesied savior of us all. You shall unite the clans, bring to pass the restored empire of the north, and cast doom upon the elven oppressors. The great warrior turned toward him in the darkness, you are meaning to our existence. Dracus said nothing, but kept his eyes fixed on the strange lights dancing about the crest of the Hecariot. Belog, it seemed, was clinging to his faith in Dracus as some sort of hero of the gods. It was not true, or at least Dracus had to admit that he didn't remember it being true. But the one thing the human warrior was certain of was that an insane manticore would easily spell the death of them all. Better to let him believe whatever keeps him calm for the time being. 
by Thorgrin's beard and all the jewels of Bardak. Jugar muttered in a tone more nervous than angry. Where do you think you're leading us, lass? Murialis, queen of the Fae, looked down her nose at the fuming dwarf. Your impertinence shall be forgiven, Master Dwarf, but I must warn you against trying my patience. We are not amused by your antics, fool, and your disrespect in this hallowed place. We have come to pay homage to your betters, and I would thank you not to interfere in that which you do not fully comprehend. Dracus cleared his throat. They were much closer to the Hecariot than he had hoped, but the queen had insisted that they divert more southerly and could not be persuaded otherwise. The Tower of Rock itself was still perhaps three or four leagues to the south, but its brooding presence unnerved him. Worse, the plain surrounding the Hecariot was strewn with rock, blasted with great black stains. Most of the stones were nondescript pieces of shattered granite, but occasionally one side of the boulder showed carvings of strange winged animals or of figures in warrior pose. The Lyric, or Queen, or whoever she was, had not given them any trouble since they had left Togren Fell, but that in itself gave Dracus cause for worry. The woman had walked for over a week now westward across the plains with regal step and imperious demeanor. For someone, however, who claimed to have been a slave of the Empire for many years, she showed no signs whatsoever of the same memory trauma from which the rest of them were suffering. Perhaps it was an effect of her being of the fairy, if in fact she even was fairy, but her very lack of problems troubled him. The lyric turned from the dwarf and strode with casual step among the boulders. From time to time she would stop, stoop slightly, and examine the rock before straightening back up and moving on. What is she looking for? Ruukog snarled, his eyes darting about. I don't know, Dracus answered in exasperation. We've been wandering this stone field for most of the morning, and I still don't know. I cannot exhort you in stronger terms. The dwarf spoke with emphasis, but was careful to pitch his voice so that the queen would not hear him. The Hecariot, that very mountainous pillar to which we have unwisely turned our backs, never sleeps. The lights that play upon its summit herald the doom of any who awaken the spirits that still strive within its cursed halls. I am but a humble dwarven fool, but wise would be the soul who could convince this queen to move her royal court to a safer distance. Where is she? Dracus, distracted by the anxious Jugar, looked up. The lyric had vanished. The lyric lay asleep under a twilight sky. The stones of the Hecariot stood about her, the carved faces all turned toward her. The air lay gentle as a blanket about her. No blade of grass moved, no cloud shifted in the sky above. The world was silent and watchful. An enormous woman stepped from behind a broken stone, crossing the grass with silent steps as she approached the lithe form lying beneath the frozen sky. The hem of her turquoise robe brushed across the blades without disturbing them. Brown hair fell in waves around her cherubic face. She stopped and watched the sleeping human with deep sympathy in her eyes. A second figure stepped from behind a shattered pillar. This one was a broad-shouldered human woman with powerful arm muscles and a narrow, determined jaw. She wore armor of leather tooled with ancient symbols and carried a scimitar with practiced ease. Her dark eyes, too, were on the lyric. Murialis. The human warrior woman spoke in hushed tones as she nodded in acknowledgment to the large woman. It is good to see you as well, Felicia, said Murialis in a whisper. Does she sleep still? asked Felicia of the mists, leaning closer over the lyric. She does, Murialis nodded. And so she must remain. A new figure, a Chimerian in mismatched armor, stepped hesitantly from behind a jumble of rocks, its four hands shaking slightly as they gripped four blood-soaked swords. The Chimerian spoke warily as it approached. Who are you? I am Murialis, queen of the fairy, the enormous woman answered. 
This is Felicia of the Mists, raider of the Nordesian coast. And who are you? I am Dion, assassin warrior of the Shadow Clan. The Chimerian answered, slowly returning all four sword blades to their scabbards crossing its back. You are new here? Felicia asked. Yes, Diane answered, then nodded toward the lyric, still sleeping on the large flat slab before them. Is she the reason we are here? Yes, Murialis answered. We have come for her. A ghostly man, transparent down to his long flowing hair, drifted through a stone to meet with the three females in their observations. These were joined almost at once by four more figures stepping from behind even more stones. A towering female manticore in ancient battle armor, a sad elven woman in tattered robes, a pinched-faced human woman in an elaborate black-mantled robe, and a small female gnome carrying a sack over her shoulder. These joined with the others, forming a circle about the sleeping form of the lyric, all gazing down upon her. "'Who is she?' asked Diane, the Chimerian. She is all of us now, said the black-robed woman. Better to ask who she was, spoke the ghostly man. Who was she then? Diane said as she gazed down on the sleeping figure. She was loving, the gnome said sadly. She was an incomparable talent, said the black-robed woman. She was powerful, agreed Murialis. She was fragile, said the sad elf. She is fragile still, said Felicia. We are all she has to protect her. She has seen too much, heard too much. She cannot protect herself from the truth of her past. Without us to watch over her, her mind would be forever broken and she would cease to exist. And we would no longer exist, along with her, the ghostly man added. I have protected her, Murialis said, stretching out her hand and brushing it gently across the stubble of her growing hair. I shall live in her and for her. I shall continue to stand between her and the truth that would destroy her and all of us and each of us must be prepared to do the same. But we are only characters from the story she has told, Felicia said, frustration evident in her quiet voice. We are only dreams. Then we shall be made real through her, Murialis replied. We shall stand between her and the truth of the world, and within our circle she will be safe. Will she not feel our pains, too? The sad elven female asked with concern. Yes, Murialis responded. And we shall bear them, too. Lyric! Dracus called carefully. Ah, uh, Murialis! Mala nudged him, then whispered. Listen! weeping. They found her lying across a great stone half buried in the plain. A carving of a woman, her face broken and now missing, lay beneath the lyric's embrace. The lyric sobbed, tears running down her cheeks and washing streaks across the blasted stone. Tianya, she cried. My sister and darling, that your tragic love should have brought this doom upon all your people. Was it not enough to break your heart? Did you have to break the hearts of the mothers and daughters of your ruined kingdom too? May the woodland spirits curse a passion that should cause such pain. Dracus leaned toward the dwarf. What is she talking about? Jugar shook his head. Lad, I have no idea. The sky was dark. Rain clouds had gathered in the afternoon. Lightning flashed to the south, rolling thunder in their direction. Dracus, his beard thickening along with the ragged hair on his head, stepped wearily toward the Chimerian, 
who squatted on the ridge at the top of a narrow hill. They had left the Hikariot and its terrible pillar five days behind them, and yet still his gaze was drawn to it off to the southeast. He felt sometimes that it was calling him back to his death. How much further do you think we have to go? he asked. Ethis didn't look back, didn't turn. We can't stop and rest, Dracus. We have to continue the march tonight. Dracus blinked. What? Chimera were difficult for Dracus to read, even in the best of times. Their pliable faces and shape-altering bodies and limbs made it impossible to judge their moods. Still, there was something in the way Ethis spoke, those few times he did speak, that stood the hairs up on the back of Dracus's neck. Something was different about Ethis, and as every warrior knew, what you don't understand can kill you. We're within fifteen, perhaps twenty leagues southeast of the border, Ethis said casually. We can pick up the river Galarin to the north and follow it all the way up to the weeping pool. Wait, Dracus said, cocking his head to one side. How do you know about the banks of the river will be our guide in the darkness? Ethis continued. It's the surest way we have of getting there, and we haven't a moment to spare. That's not possible. Dracus felt his anger rising. Mala was a house slave. She's in no way prepared or trained for the rigors of a forced march. Besides, we all need rest. We're nearly there now. Why not just— Ethis turned his head toward the human. We are being followed, Dracus. We are followed? For a week now, perhaps longer, Ethis replied. And you didn't tell— there was only one of them then. I could keep track of him. But now there are four, and we are in real danger. Ethis continued. Our best hope now is to run, all night and tomorrow, as far and as fast as we can toward Murialis's realm. What do I tell them? Dracus asked. What can I say that will get them moving again? Tell them they are being hunted. Chapter 24 Hyperion Trap The grasslands rose steadily before them as they moved northward, making the going more difficult. A growing black belt of trees, the fringes of the Hyperion forest, split the horizon to the northwest, a dark line growing wider with each step. Yet it was not so much the hope beckoning before them as the fear at their backs that drove Dracus and his companions on. It was an hour past sunset when they reached the steep banks of the river Galeron that Ethis had promised would guide them. Belog bounded down the ten-foot embankment, reaching the riverbed first, his keen eyes reconnoitering both up and down the length of the dark, murmuring water before him. "'You call this a river?' Dracus said to Ethis, his voice hoarse with exertion as he hurriedly made his way down the precarious slope, struggling to steady both himself and Mala at the same time. He had seen many of the great rivers in his time, including, he suddenly recalled, the majestic Jolnar, which ran through the heart of the empire. But this shallow bed, only twenty to thirty feet in width, barely qualified as a stream by those standards. A child could cross it. What good is it for defense? It isn't a fortress, Master Dracus. It's our road, the lyric replied her nose lifted in haughty displeasure as she stepped quickly across the smooth rocks and knelt next to the stream, the long fingers of her left hand scooping up the water and letting it run through her fingers. This is the lifeblood of our nation that you so casually dismiss. You would be wise to remember that and be grateful for our largesse. How much farther? Ruuka groaned, rolling his wide head as he rubbed his neck. Not far, Ethis said. Seven, maybe eight leagues. Eight leagues! Ruukog bellowed. Belog hung his head, shaking his growing mane. Jugar coughed. <coughs> uh, may I suggest that we take a different course? Uh, we must head north at once. This western track will plunge us into dangerous lands that can only... We follow the river. Ethis asserted, as though to a child, 
that is the plan. You follow the river, Chimarion! Ru'ukog snarled, his large furry hand sweeping in a dismissive gesture before him. It's all well and good for you grand warriors. You're no doubt used to walking your feet off crossing the length and breadth of the Empire and all its conquests. But some of us are house slaves. By the gods, look around you. You're wearing campaign sandals of the legions, and we've been crossing open country in these household sandals. Have you even taken time to notice that Mala's feet are blistered? that she's had to repair her sandals every day for the last three days and wrap her feet in whatever cloth she can tear from the hem of a wrap. No, you've been too busy looking to the sunset to see what's at your own feet. Well, that may be your life, warrior, but it isn't mine, and I'm not taking another step until... Dracus turned from Mala, his short sword ringing slightly as he deftly pulled it from the scabbard at his side. In two quick steps, he closed the distance between himself and Ru'ukog. With his left hand, he reached up, and before Ru'ukog could react, closed his fingers in an iron grip on the manticore's right ear. Ru'ukog howled in pain, rearing back, but Dracus, jaw set, held fast and twisted the manticore's ear farther backward. Ru'ukog's head moved involuntarily back with it, trying desperately to relieve the pressure and the pain that so suddenly overwhelmed him. Dracus pressed forward, the sword pointing upward between the two of them, its tip centered on the exposed throat of the lion man still in his grip. Ru'ukog staggered backward, falling at last against the wall of the embankment. Ru'ukog clawed at Dracus, but the warrior responded at once by twisting the ear harder and sliding the tip of his sword up to rest against the manticore's throat. Ru'ukog suddenly held very still. That may have been your life, Ru'ukog, but not any more, Dracus said in as definite tones as his raw throat could muster. Yours was a proud race, who ran as such a tide across the Chandrian plains that their war cries and footfalls brought fear to the thunder itself. But you, you've become a pet of the elves, tamed and groomed, fed in obedience so that you might be patted on your shaved head by your masters. Well, not any more, Ru'ukog. That may have been your life before, but you're in my life now. No one is going to carry you, coax you, coddle you, or drag you, least of all me. So you've got just two choices. Die right here and now by my hand, or say, yes, sire, and move. I swear, Humani, one day I'll... Dracus tensed the sword tip cutting slightly into the soft throat before him. Ah, yes, sire, Ru'ukog said. Draka shot a steel-cold glance at the dwarf. And you? Jugar looked down intently at the ground. Drakus relaxed slightly, stepping back. He extended his hand to Mala. Tears were streaming down her cheeks, but she took his hand and stood painfully. Let's go, Dracus said. He kept his sword drawn. Three robed figures stood next to the river Galeron, looking on as a fourth knelt inspecting the riverbank. How long? Jukung asked. One hour, certainly no longer, Soen said as he stood. So they are following the river. They are impatient and prone to mistakes. We must trap our prey while we can. Surely they cannot escape us, Jukung boasted. The glory of their capture shall be ours. We are far indeed from the imperial majesty where such glory is tallied, Assessia. So an observed in dry tones. There is a border not far from here which few of our order have trod, and fewer still have returned to report. The fairies occupy that forest. Our prey has no doubt decided it is better to hope for a life in a place from which no soul has ever returned than to face our justice. We must take them before they can find such dubious sanctuary. Then we shall return to the keeper as agreed. Jukung said with an oily arrogance that he no longer bothered to disguise. You have much to answer for, Inquisitor. 
Fong cleared his throat. Indeed. So one replied with serenity. This boy was a fool after all, he thought. So one knew with calm surety that he could plant this boy's cold body just about anywhere in this wilderness and live the rest of his life in absolute confidence that Jukung would never be found. Still, there was something about the youth's overconfidence, coupled with so little prudence, that he found entertaining in a sad, tragic way. Perhaps that was why he let him live. It amused him to do so. Perhaps I could answer for it now and save you the trouble later. This is not the appropriate time or place to— Oh, but I think it is. So and said through a sharp-toothed smile. He started pacing in a circle around the Assessia as he spoke. Let me anticipate you, young Jukung. You would ask before the Council of the Iblisi Disciplines why I broke up the quorum. Answer, it was necessary. In order to secure the Timuron household, to assign most of the Assessia of the quorum to continue the work in the western provinces, while the remainder of the quorum pressed the pursuit of the bolters who caused the fall of the Aether Well. No, you assert. You meant, why did I break up the quorum at the Field of the Dead and send each of us through separate folds? Because, as I said at the time, we needed to pursue all four directions at once. But, you will counter, I did not return. Of course, I will reply, I found evidence that our bolters were fleeing our justice, could not risk losing their trail, and knew that the rest of my quorum would follow. And I will point out that I did leave a trail of fold glyphs that brought you all to my location when the prey were cornered at last, saving you, my little Assessia, the trouble of having to walk for weeks across the Hyperion wilderness. Soen stopped his circular stroll in front of Jukung, his face barely a hand-breath away from the Assessias. I can't wait for the tribunal. Let me know when it starts. Yes, Master Inquisitor, Jukung answered as he turned his head away. Kinsei and Fang, Soen said. You will take opposite sides of the river bank, stay on the high ground, and get ahead of our prey. When you find a suitable site for an ambush, mark it and position yourselves on the far side. Our young Assessia, now so eager to learn, will come with me up the riverbed. We'll drive the prey to you, and then you take them. There aren't enough of us to do this properly, so Jukung and I will have to kill the manticores and the Chimerian and dwarf outright. You capture the human male. Once he's secure, kill the females. Why keep the male alive? Fong asked. I have my reasons. So an answered. Do not disappoint me. When no further explanation was offered, Fong nodded, then set out. Kinsei and Fong, with quick and silent footfalls, outdistanced their squabbling quarry with little trouble. Kinsei followed the left bank, with Fong on the right. They had worked together often down the uncounted years, and this part of their job had become a matter of routine. Their target was in sight. All that remained was to answer the questions of where and when the trap would be sprung. Wordlessly, the two Codexia closed again on the river. Their prey was now behind them coming in their direction. They remained on the high ground of the steep sheer banks, following its curves and undulations farther, Kinsei thought, than she would have preferred. But it was Soen who was their inquisitor, and Kinsei wanted to find the perfect place for them to bring this sorry business to its inevitable close. Ah! <sighs> Kinsei sighed with satisfaction as she stopped at the crest of the bank where the river turned sharply. Soen will be pleased. It was a steep, banked bowl surrounding a pool at the base of a waterfall. The river had cut a narrow passage that was the only way in or out. It would be slow climbing out of such a bowl. Kinsei saw it all in her mind, their prey walking into the bowl, Soen and Jukung closing off their only escape out of it, while she and Fong stood atop the edge of the bowl, capturing them all before their prey was even aware they were caught. Kinsei reached over next to her. She grabbed a branch and deftly twisted it back, 
locking it among the other branches in an awkward bend. The sign set. She looked across the ravine to Fong and made hand signs to him as to her instructions. He responded silently with signs of his own that he would do as she suggested, circle the top of the bowl to the northern quarter, and prepare to spring the trap. Kinsey moved around the southern edge of the bowl. All that was left for them to do would be to wait until... Sobbing. Kinsey froze at once, her mate staff readied. She could hear quiet sobbing just through the trees to the south. Kinsey frowned. It would not do to have someone unknown at her back. She stepped cautiously through the trees, weaving a careful path to be as silent and unseen as possible. She halted at the tree line, her breath carefully slow and her black eyes dappled by the afternoon light through the shifting leaves of the trees. A long clearing ran up a slope between the trees on either side. The clearing itself remained in the shadow of the surrounding trees under a bright sky. Kinsey waited patiently for a moment, her eyes searching the trees and the tall grasses for a time, before her gaze fixed on the small head whose back was turned toward her just past the crest of the hillside meadow. A child, an elven child, sat at the crest of the hill, weeping in this lost and forsaken wilderness. Kinsey frowned. She was more puzzled than concerned. There were no Ronas settlements this far west, certainly none so near the Murialis woods. It might be rebel elves out of Musaria somehow come this far north. Whoever they were, her maternal instincts were not aroused. She meant to question this elf child and get answers quickly, regardless of the cost. Kinsey stepped into the tall grass and smiled. The ground was soft and sponge-like beneath her feet. Her footfalls would go unheard. She remained unaware of the long line of stones that she had stepped over as she crossed into the meadow. Fong's eyes searched quickly along the northern rim of the pool's box canyon for the best point where he might lay in wait until Soen came and sprang their trap. This was his favorite part of the hunt. The prey were coming toward him, their fate irrevocably fixed and held in his hands and those of his fellow Iblisi. There was something about watching their approach, seeing their faces completely unaware of the doom that he knew was about to descend upon them. He relished their lives in that moment, that they were still dreaming of another tomorrow and making plans that would never be. Such a moment deserved a well-chosen position from which to view the show. He soon saw the perfect spot from which to observe the last moments of his prey's freedom. It was a collection of large boulders at the top edge of the steep northern slope overlooking the waterfall and the pool. He could see and not be seen there. He smiled and was about to move up to the rim of the canyon. Then he heard the piercing scream. Kinsey, he thought at once. He raised his mate staff and, drawing from its aether, leaped twenty feet to the top of the river's steep southern bank. The scream had come from the south where his Codexia companion had just gone. He saw the careful, subtle marks of her passage, marks only another Codexia could follow, as he moved with swift, yet silent steps among the trees. The trees ended at the edge of a meadow running up the hillside between the trees. He could see Kinsey kneeling at the top of the ridge, her hooded head bent over as though she were examining something in the grass before her. Fong watched for a moment, but was satisfied. Whatever had happened to her, Kinsey had the problem well in hand. It would be best if he returned to the northern ridge and took up his position among the boulders, he thought and was turning to do so when some movement caught his eye. It was Kinsey. She was motioning for him to come and join her on the ridge. Fong grasped his mate staff in both hands and ran easily up the slope. The ground under his feet was soft and had a spring to it that he found pleasant. The grasses around him were nearly up to his knees. He would not mind staying here to rest a while once the butcher business of their calling was finished. Kinsey. Fong called as he approached. We must be in position soon. What is so urgent that— Fong stopped at the sight of Kinsey's face, raising his mate staff at once. 
Kinsei gazed up at him with the dull eyes that were shared by all elven dead. Thin green vines riddled her face, neck, and hands, shifting and writhing just beneath the surface of her skin. Fong commanded the Aether of the Staff to discharge at once into the hideous apparition that had been his companion, but the Mate Staff did not respond at all. Its powers vanished. Instead, the wood of the staff came alive, coiling like a snake around Fong's arm as it slithered toward his head. Tendrils running through the grass wound their way up Fong's legs, but it was Kinsei's dead face that fixed Fong's vision. The vines in her lifeless muscles contracted and forced the dead Codexia's features to smile. The winding course of the stream had cut down into the sloping plain, leaving banks on either side of its curves, sometimes as low as three feet, occasionally rising as high as twenty. So an envied Fong and Kinsei. They were making good time across the open ground, paralleling the river, while the Inquisitor was forced to make his way along the meandering stream bed with a sulking Jukung at his side. He could not afford the luxury of speed for he was closing on his prey, and dared not lose their track should they for any reason decide to defy his expectations and leave the watercourse. Still, he took satisfaction that with each twist of the river Galeron, his two Codexia were getting farther ahead, better positioning themselves to spring their trap on the bolters. Jukung had crossed the river at a shallow ford nearly half a league downstream, and remained on the opposite side. It was just as well, so amused, the young Assessia had been something of a concern early on, but Soen was convinced now that Jukung was only a pawn of the keeper, a much easier problem than Soen had thought he was facing. The Inquisitor had been concerned that Jukung was working for one of the myriad other orders, houses, or lords who were constantly scheming against the Iblisi, but the youth's actions had dispelled most of Soen's apprehensions. The youth was still dangerous, both to the Inquisitor and to himself, but apparently not with any darker purpose than his own aggrandizement. A power-hungry youth was something Soen could manage. They moved quickly, their mate staffs held either across their bodies or parallel to the ground in their hands. Their soft boots pushed them soundlessly up the crooked path of the riverbed. He knew their tracks by heart, having followed them across the Hyperion Plain when few others could have made out their mark. Now, fresh and deep, he had no trouble making them out, even in the pre-dawn light. Two sets heavy and wide of the manticores, one lighter and longer of the chimarian, the heavy footfalls of a dwarf, and the three humans, two females and the male. One of the female tracks wandered slightly along the river's edge. Soen smiled, baring his sharp teeth. The woman is tired. She slows them down. The banks of the river were steep now and tall, vertical precipices on either side. Just above their edge, Soen could see the tops of trees. The Inquisitor continued his silent run, but he was troubled. They should have caught up to the bolters by now, or at least the Codexia should have stopped them before they reached the sanctuary of the woods. There were foul things lurking in those trees, for it was the realm of Murialis, queen of the woodland nymphs and dryads. All elves hated the woods, but especially the forbidding trees of the Dryad realm. Solon was about to quicken his pace when he heard them, voices arguing around the turn of the gully. The elf slowed his pace and saw what he had been looking for high on the riverbank. The twisted branch pinned back against the trunk of the tree. Kinsei and Fong had marked the spot as just around the bend in the river. The prey were already in the trap. Soen signaled to Jukung with his mate staff to stop. The young Assessia obeyed at once from the opposite side of the river, his black eyes narrowing as he strained to look beyond the angled slope. Soen crept forward, his mate staff held firmly across him with both his long hands. He slid with gliding step behind a large boulder that had, in some age long past, tumbled down the slope just, he fancied, to provide him cover right now. Such was the way of the gods. Soen peered around the edge of the stone. The steep V of the gully opened just a few yards beyond onto the wide oval of a pool. 
the waters of the river cascaded down a rock face into the pool on the far side. So one could see the tree line of the woods running just atop the crest of the rise at the other side of the pool. So one frowned. Kinsey and Fong seemed to be cutting this a bit close. The location was ideal for their ambush, but there were several other locations farther downstream that would have served just as well. His concerns, however, were drowned out almost at once by the arguing voices on the left side of the pool. Just leave him here, one of the manticores was saying. If he's so upset by these woods that he doesn't have to enter them, we can't leave him here, the human male shouted. Dracus, so unrealized with a shiver. The Iblisi are on our heels. The gods alone can conceive of what they would do to him. All the more reason to leave him behind, the manticore roared back. If we toss them a morsel, then maybe the rest of us will have a chance. He's not coming unless we hit him over the head with a rock, and he's slowing us down more than that woman of yours. Five separate voices erupted at once, arguing among themselves by the side of the idyllic pool without a thought of the black eyes watching them from the shadows. All too easy, so one thought. He frowned again. It was too easy, he realized, and the hair at the back of his elongated skull stood on end. Something inside told him that there was something wrong with what he was seeing, that his eyes were being fooled in dangerous ways. It was a sense that he had, an unexplained inner knowledge that seldom failed him, and that had saved his life more times than he cared to remember. It was never the danger you anticipated that bit you, he remembered, but always something you didn't see coming and could not have anticipated. He glanced across the river. Jukung was moving forward, a vicious smile curling his lips back from his sharp teeth. His eyes were on the prey, the predator about to spring. His eyes were fixed on the prey. Soen's eyes shifted around him, the walls of the gully they were in, the waters rushing past him, the stones of the river bank. The Inquisitor's black eyes widened. The stones under the water formed a pattern. Nature had not placed them there, rather the hand of design, thought, and intention. It was subtle and would have escaped the most casual glance, but now his mind was fixed on it. His eyes followed it up the near side of the river where it wound purposefully into the placement of the stones and boulders just in front of him. It wove its pattern up the embankment, disappearing over its crest. It was formed of stones, pebbles, roots, and dirt, but it was unmistakable. He turned quickly, his eyes following its line beneath the waters of the river to where it emerged on the other side among the boulders where Jukung was carefully moving forward. No! Soen whispered as loudly as he dared. Jukung, stop! Whether the Assessia heard him or not, Jukung continued forward, intent on garnering his prize and honor to his name. The mate staff shifted in his hands. Jukung stopped just short of the line and pointed toward the crest of the ridge on the other side of the pool. Soen turned and gaped. Two robed figures, Kin and Fong, rose up along the crest on the far side of the pool and began moving toward the rock face, their own mate staff swinging unnaturally before them, as though they were marionettes whose strings were being badly pulled. No! Soen shouted, springing out from behind the boulder, running toward Jukung. The bolters at the edge of the pool leaped back in alarm. The human woman screamed, her shrill voice echoing off the rocks of the cascade. Jukung leaped toward his prey, his mate staff thrust in front of him, its crystal flaring with power. By the will of the emperor, I command you to— Jukung stepped across the line before Soen could reach him. The waters of the river exploded upward with a crashing like ocean waves, but the water did not fall back into the riverbed. Instead, it shifted and broke into hands, arms, fingers, and bodies. Hair of froth cascaded off the heads of incredible beauty, whose transparency gelled more solidly by the moment. Jukung stepped back, turning toward the monstrous multitude rising from the water at his side. The mate stick flared, pulsing in waves at the onrushing tide of horror. The figures were battered by its force, twisted, wrenched, and shattered, only to reform. 
Soen stopped at the edge of the patterned line, his own mate staff held uselessly in front of him. The bolters backed away into the pool. They too could see the robes of the Codexia on either side of the waterfall's crest. The human male held his sword at the ready, but even from here, Soen could sense the panic of the surrounded and cornered prey. Soen opened his mouth and raged in anger, his howl tearing through the air around the pool. There was nothing he could do. Too late had he seen the fairy line, the pattern in the ground demarking the unquestioned realm of the fey and their power. Murialis had been busy on the frontier, and had claimed more land than the emperor had taken notice of. Jukung screamed. The water nymphs had reached him at last, tearing the mate staff from his hands. They pulled him over the pool, clawing at his robes, his hair, his flesh. They twisted him back and forth, as though he were being tossed upon the waves of some unseen storm at sea. The Assessia tumbled through the air. Tossed by the water nymphs, he slammed back first against the ragged stones that formed the wall of the ravine. His body fell heavily to the ground. Jukung lay screaming incoherently just at the edge of the fairy line. For a moment, Soen moved to stretch his own mate staff in to where Jukung lay, but cursing stopped himself. The fairy line would almost certainly discharge his staff the moment he pushed it across the line, just as it had rendered Jukung's staff useless. Soen gazed down at the screaming Assessia. He could see terrible welts ballooning on Jukung's tortured face. Acid burns from the touch of the angered nymphs. Unchecked, it would literally melt the face from the Iblisi. Soen frantically looked about him, and then saw it, a thick branch jutting out from the tree growing at the upper edge of the ravine. At once he pointed his mate staff upward and uttered the words. A column of brilliant light flared upward, severing the branch. It crashed downward, nearly knocking the Inquisitor off his feet. The nymphs had regrouped in the water and were surging again toward where Jukung lay. Soen wrapped his arms around the thick branch, thrusting it past the fairy line as he yelled, Jukung! Take it! Hold on! The Assessia felt the hands of the nymphs wrap around his feet and ankles. His hands flailed in panic, falling on the branch and gripping it fiercely. Soen braced his feet where he squatted, and then in a single motion used his legs to push away from the fairy line, applying all the strength he had to pull Jukung free. The nymphs were not prepared. Their prey slipped from their grasp in a single lurch, tumbling back over the fairy line and falling atop the now prone Inquisitor. Soen rolled the elf off of him, the cloying smell of sizzling flesh filling his nostrils. He quickly picked up his staff and pointed it at the Assessia. The agonized Iblisi fell with sudden silence into a deep and gratefully dreamless sleep. Soen lowered his staff and stood upright just short of the fairy line, turning to stare at the man he knew was called Dracus. The human stared back at the elven inquisitor as he crouched uncertainly with his sword in hand and a human woman behind him. He protects her, Soen observed. He has something to fight for. At the top of the falls, the bodies of Kinsei and Fong tumbled forward, rebounding off the stone face of the falls before falling among the wet rocks. Neither moved. Soen had no doubt that they had been dead since before he arrived at the pool. The manticore and the chimerian fled first up the far slope. The two women followed them, urged on at last by the dwarf, as all disappeared among the dark trees of the Murialis woods. Only the tall manticore remained, pulling at the human to follow. Dracus! Soen called as cold and still as death. Wait! The human stopped in shock and turned. Soen spoke in a calm voice that carried across the waters. Do you still hear the song? The song in your mind? The elf asked casually. Dracus blinked. Ha! Huh. How did you know? But then the tall manticore pulled forcefully at the human, and they both fled into the woods. Soen, standing at the edge of the fairy realm, 
took in a deep breath under his dark glare, turned and picked up the tortured form of the Assessia called Jukung, and made his way back down the stream. Chapter 25 The Glade Ru'u Kog slid to a stop, his wide feet skidding across the rotting leaves that blanketed the forest floor. He fell at once into a crouch, his head swiveling quickly around as his wide eyes tried desperately to pierce the mist-laden spaces between the vertical tree trunks surrounding him like bars. The manticore could not take in enough air, could not rein in his fear. Panic circled around him like a predator that he could not see or smell, but knew was waiting to pounce upon him if given the slightest opportunity. Ru'ukog bared his fangs, growling at his own panic, even as he shivered. He wanted to go back, was desperate to go back to the blissfully forgetful life that had been his comfort and his redemption. Now he was alone, and he hated that more than anything. He had fled into the woods along with the others, but somehow they had all gotten separated in the mists. He knew that he should call out to them, find the reassuring sound of their voices regardless of who it was, and find some comfort in numbers but he feared that the circling panic would hear his call and take him down under its terrible darkness. A bush shook behind him. Ru'ukog spun about. Another manticore stood before him, his wide paws open and extended out to the side. Ru'ukog relaxed slightly. I couldn't find you, Belog said, his voice a low rumble among the trees. Are you injured? No, <sighs> no thanks to that who, Marnie. Ru'ukog shuddered and then stood upright. Where has he led us now? Belog raised his furry chin, his feline face looking slowly about. The Murialis Woods, a magical forest and a dangerous one by all accounts. It is not wise for us to be alone. Follow me and I'll take you to the others. We should leave them, Ru'ukog sneered. They are unworthy of us. You do not believe in the Dracus prophecies, Belog asked in a steady voice. Stories told to cubs so that they might sleep at night, Ru'ukog replied at once. Lies perpetrated by the elders to keep themselves in power. Belog accepted the remark casually, then turned making his way between the mist-shrouded trees. Ru'ukog followed a moment later, his own steps close on the heels of his brother Manticore. I was of the Kadush clan, Belog said as he pushed aside a thick fern in his path. They were descending a gentle slope. Ru'ukog could hear the murmur of a brook somewhere nearby. Kadush, Ru'ukog said. I'm of Shakash clan. Then we both are brothers in a greater cause, Belog said in conversation, though he never turned his head from the path before them. The mists seemed to be thickening, making it difficult for Ru'ukog to see his companion. He quickened his steps to close the distance between them. What greater cause? Belog stepped around a moss-covered tree whose trunk stretched above them to vanish in the gloom. We are both from clans in rebellion against the Manticos Assembly. We have broken with the Chenandrian lords to continue the war against the traitorous Ron ourselves. Ru'uka gave a single, derisive guffaw. Ha! <laughs> they called it a rebellion. Our elders fled the just decrees of the Assembly and dragged their women and children out onto the northern steppes. They filled our heads with songs and stories of the old days, and promised us glorious futures of honor and strength. But we were nothing more than raiders and thieves. So how is it you know of the old days? Belog asked, still walking ahead and not turning his head as he spoke. They were climbing again now, the obscuring mists growing thicker with each step up the densely wooded hillside. No of them. I was there. Ru'ukog spat the vile words with distaste. 
I stood at the front in the battle of the Red Fields with the rest of the fools. You must have been young then. Belog spoke in quiet, even tones. Too young, Ru'ukog said. He was finding it difficult to breathe again. His arms felt heavy, and his feet felt as though they were lifting stone weights. He followed Belog between a pair of trees and stopped. With breathtaking suddenness, they had come upon a forest glade of magnificent beauty. Light filtered down through an opening in the forest canopy, its dappled rays illuminating the clearing with soft light. Gentle grasses carpeted the soft soil on either side of a clear brook that cut through its center as it danced across the rounded stones of its bed. It was a place of peace and warmth in the midst of the gloom, and Ru'ukog longed to lay down on its verdant expanse. Too young indeed, Belog said as he stepped to the center of the glade and turned to face Ru'ukog. I know the Battle of the Red Fields, Ru'ukog. The story has been carried far of the young Manticore warriors, untrained children, who were shamed into joining the desperate battle. Even I have heard of the charge that day, and the— Stop! Ru'ukog said, stepping into the glade. The warm soil beneath his feet felt more luxurious than anything he had known before. Belog stooped down, scooping up some of the clear, cold water from the brook and tasting it. It's all right, Rukog. I understand. It was a foolish, prideful order that called for the charge that day. Every manticore that heeded that command died that day, cut down by the Ronos legions and the terrible power of their aether weapons. Thousands of them— Tens of thousands charging across the northern steppes, and none of them, not one survived to claim their honor or victory. No, some lived, Ru'ukog said, though his voice sounded hollow. Yes, some lived, Belog agreed, reaching down again with his cupped paw and feeling the water fall between his fingers. But the story is that only those who fled the battle, who did not charge when the order was given, but turned and ran. No, that's not true, Ru'ukog said too loudly. You can't know. You weren't there. Belog stood up and faced Ru'ukog. It's all right, Ru'ukog. We've all remembered things we want to forget. Come, you're tired. Lie down here in this clearing. The others have gone upstream in search of food, but they'll be back shortly. I'll watch over you. Ru'ukog stepped farther into the glade. They had run through the night, and he was so tired. He could barely lift his legs now. He gratefully lowered himself to the ground, pressed his body against the warm, soft grass, and sighed. You won't leave me, Ru'ukog asked. No, I won't leave you, Belog replied. Ru'ukog closed his eyes and slept. Dracus! Belog called out between his cupped paws. His voice was nearly hoarse from shouting the past hour. He stopped and tried to be as still as possible for the expected reply. Here, Belog! came the distant reply. We're over here! Where are you? The manticore drove both fists upward and roared in frustration. Then he turned in the direction he believed he had heard the voice and charged again through the mist-obscured tree trunks. Ever since he had pushed Dracus ahead of him into the trees— the gods had seemingly deserted him. He had stepped around a tree expecting to find Dracus on the other side, but he had vanished, swallowed, it would seem, by the strange morning fog that permeated these woods. He had called out to him, tentatively at first, and then with increasing fervor as the voice in reply seemed to his ears to get farther away each time he called out. 
He was tired. The forced march the night before had taken much out of him, and he knew it. He had somehow believed that all they had to do was cross the border into the fairylands, and they could rest, recover, and prepare for whatever else lay ahead of them. But now he had lost everyone. Even Dracus, who had been barely an arm's length away from him when they entered these cursed woods. Belog bent over, placing his paws on his wide knees and closing his eyes. He had failed again, as he had so often failed before. Belog. The manticore looked up, a wide smile splitting his feline face. Dracus, at last. Are you all right? Dracus stepped up to Belog and lay a hand on his shoulder. I am now. Belog replied, straightening up. Where are the others? Not far from here. Dracus answered. Come, I'll show you. The human turned and started walking back among the trunks and undergrowth. Belog quickly followed, determined not to lose Dracus for a second time. Belog, we've got to talk, while it's just the two of us. Dracus said as he walked, though he spoke without turning his head. We've been through a great deal together, old friend. I've fought by your side through many campaigns, many of which I am only now starting to remember and appreciate. It is the same with me. Belog agreed as he followed behind. The human seemed unusually spry for having traveled such a great distance the night before. I, too, am having to deal with the thoughts and remembrances that are both new and old to me at once. Much is still confusion in my mind. To all of us, Dracus agreed, as he continued to walk ahead, apparently intent on the trail before them. They were following the bottom of a gully now, with a clear stream running beneath their feet. But there's been something I've wanted to ask you, Belog, if you don't mind. I serve you, Dracus. Belog intoned, though he was beginning to wonder why it was so hard to breathe in this small canyon. Dracus did not look back, but spoke clearly. Belog, how do you know that I'm the one who was prophesied to return? Belog replied at once, Because I know it. My heart speaks the truth of it to me. I know it because I believe. Quite suddenly they stepped out of the mists. Belog caught his breath. Before them was the most beautiful glade the manticore had ever seen. Sunlight shone across the surface of a small pool situated at the edge of the clearing. The pool was fed by the gentle cascade of water down a small rock face, and its water was so clear that Belog could make out the shapes of the smooth rocks that lined the bottom of the pond. At the edge of the pond... Soft sand rose in a bank up to the grasses of the glade, warmed by a shaft of sunlight shining down through an opening in the forest canopy overhead. Belog longed to warm himself on the sands next to the pool, to close his eyes under the sun and find a moment's peace. Dracus stepped into the glade and sat down in the grass, crossing his legs under him. It's all right, Belog. We're safe here. Belog took a hesitant step into the glade. What is it? Dracus asked, concerned. I... Where are the others? Others? The Lyric! Mala! Rukog! Dracus laughed. <laughs> are you sure you really want to know where Rukog is? I won't be heart-sick if he gets himself lost. Or that dwarf. Or the Chimerian, for that matter. But where are— You needn't worry, Dracus said, leaning back on his elbows in the sunlight. They've gone upstream to forage for our lunch. They wanted me to stay behind to make sure you got here. Belog smiled and stepped across the soft grasses of the glade to the pool. He stretched out on the sands, feeling their warmth soak into his muscles and bones. So tell me, Dracus continued, what led you to me? Belog's eyes closed, and he frowned slightly as he spoke. I was raised Kadush clan. Both me and my... 
The manticore paused. What is it, Belloc? Dracus asked. My brother. He sighed the last word, as though with a final breath. We both believed strongly in your legend. The prophesied return of the Northern Lords. Our clan holds that all manticores are cursed for their betrayal of the Dracosian kings of the Humani, and that only by offering our lives to the rightful heir of the human empire will we absolve ourselves of our complicity in their downfall. We were so sure, both of us, in our faith that we vowed to find you. We became pilgrims, Karag and I, devoted to finding you and freeing our race from its shame and curse. We set out west across the northern slopes of the Aryan Mountains, hoping to make our way into Vestasia to the northwest. We heard there were humans in that region, and thought that they might be able to direct us to you. Belog rolled over in the warm sand and thought for a moment before continuing. We were taken before we reached the border by an elven slaver party, though we put up quite a fight and cost them the lives of three of their group before we were taken. Everything after that, well, you know too well. We were forced to forget it all. Everything that made us who we truly were. We even forgot why we had come in the first place as we were passed from Ronas House to Ronas House as Empress Warriors. I have thought much on this since, Dracus, and I know that it was the wisdom of the gods, because by enslaving us, even in our forgetfulness, we were brought to you. And even when my brother... Belog turned his face away, lying back on the sand once more. Go on, friend, Dracus encouraged. Belog closed his eyes again, basking in the warmth of the sun shining down on him from above. When he spoke, his voice was unusually heavy. Even when my brother died that day on the ninth dwarven throne defending you, even though he did not know who you were because of the terrible veil of forgetfulness cast by the evil of the elves, even then the gods smiled down on my brother and showed him how his death would have meaning. I understand, Dracus said in words barely heard above the splashing water nearby. It's my turn to watch over you now. Rest for a while, and I'll watch out for both of us. With a great sigh, Belog relaxed into the warm sands, and drifted into a deep and contented sleep. Dracus, sword drawn, walked with cautious step between the towering trunks of trees stretching above him into the mists. He had thought Belog was right behind him, but impossibly, the huge manticore had vanished into the dim, fog-blurred shadows of the forest, and he found himself quite alone. A sobbing sound caught his ear off to his left. Dracus adjusted the grip on his sword and followed the weeping as it grew louder with each step. He rounded a tree and stopped, letting his sword arm swing down to his side. Mala? The human woman turned toward him, tears still cutting marks down the smudges on her face. She ran to him, her arms quickly wrapping around him as she buried her face in his chest. A smile flashed across Dracus's face. He felt suddenly awkward. With a sword in his right hand and the scabbard on his left side, he was left to comfort Mala by putting his left arm around her and trying not to nick her with the blade he still held in his right. Mola, I'm here now. It will be all right. I didn't think I'd find you, she said, looking up into his face, her eyes large and still watery. I was so worried. I'm fine, Dracus said, pulling away from her. Have you seen anyone else? Oh, yes. She smiled. They're not far from here. They're waiting for us. They're all out looking for you now. But I found you, and we'll be together again soon. Dracus smiled again. That's excellent, Mala. If we are going to have any hope of getting through the madness of this wood, we'll have to stay together. Where are we meeting? 
It's not far from here, just down a nearby stream a bit, she said, taking his hand. I can show you. Belog says we can rest, replenish and get our bearings, whatever that means, and... and... And what, Mala? Oh, Drake, I'm so frightened and tired, Mala said. Will you please just tell me where we're going, and why we're going there? (sighs) I'm not sure it will make much sense, Mala, Dracus replied. It's got something to do with a song. Really? Mala said, puzzled, and then started pulling at his hand. Then promise you'll tell me all about it when we get there. Get where? It's not far, she said without turning her head. And it's the most peaceful glade you've ever seen. Chapter 2 The Folds Draco stepped into a killing field. The fold behind him collapsed into a thunderclap, the sound joining the rolling chorus of other booms that shook the enormous subterranean plaza as four more folds delivered their own warriors into the battle. More than three hundred impress warriors erupted into the square, pouring from their own folds at the base of an enormous bas-relief-covered wall and onto the plaza floor. The enraged dwarves were already upon them. The warriors of the Ninth Throne ran with incredible speed from the towering rotunda at the far end of the plaza, their bright-edged axes and swords swinging in their hands as they rushed headlong toward the impress warriors. "'They're engaging us before we formed up!' Krichan shouted. Timuron Centauri! shouted Chu Kong above the battle cries of the charging dwarves. Battle line, now! The manticores and chimera scrambled to find their places as they had practiced so often in the sunlit fields south of the shining towers of their home. But the dwarves broke upon them in a mad fury, shattering the lines of the four Centauri in the hall before any of them were prepared. Mad dwarven warriors bowled heedlessly past enemies at hand, their eyes fixed on the first octian of the Centauri. Dracus glanced at Jukong. They're after the captains, he thought. Jukong's face broke into a vicious grin. A hand fell on Dracus's shoulder. Dracus spun about, his sword swinging up instinctively. Dracus. It was Brawn. I don't feel. well. Braun's eyes were blinking furiously. I'm seeing too much, hearing too much. No, not the captains, Dracus realized. It's the proxies the dwarves want. No proxy, no fold, no fold, no escape. Dracus gripped Braun's shoulder too hard, shouting words into his face in the hope that they might somehow be heard. Braun, stay near me, understand. Braun grinned back in reply, his eyes unfocused. Dracus turned back to face the onslaught, his voice breaking as he screamed the command. Octian! Octian! Time slowed in his mind. The formation of the Centauri had dissolved completely into a sea of vicious, desperate combats. He saw the face of Grichog glance in his direction, then turned to face a dwarf whose axe was trying to find the manticore's knees. Ethis took several steps backward, trying to join Dracus, but a berserk dwarf launched himself against the Chimerian, dagger in hand. The song overwhelmed the sound of death and steel. Mountains of stone and of dead fell dreams, seeds that are planted in dark. Long for the sunlight. Wait for the sunlight. Dracus, wake up or die! Dracus heard the warning from the Chimerian barely in time. He flattened his back against the cold stone of the plaza wall, thrashing about with his sword as he desperately tried to parry the dervish flailing of the enraged dwarf pressing his attack. The ornate granite wall immediately chilled the backplate of his armor, pulling the heat out of his body with painful swiftness. He was grateful for the pain. The shock of it focused his mind. Dracus thrust fiercely, kicking hard away from the stone behind him with his right leg, rolling into his opponent before the dwarf could counter the blow. Dracus trapped the creature's weapon arm in his own and forcefully bent it outward. He felt the thick bones crack as the dwarf howled, 
but he kept on, pulling the dwarf forward by his broken arm and throwing him to the ground. Desperate, Dracus reversed his grip on his sword, plunging it downward toward the dwarf's chest. But another dwarf suddenly sprang onto his back, his thick arms wrapped around Dracus's throat. Dracus panicked, trying to strike at the beast now throttling him, but his sword only flailed ineffectively at his back. What little vision remained to him was rapidly going blurry. He's an insect, idiot! Ethis yelled at him. The Chimerian reached back with his fourth arm and shoved Dracus toward the cold wall behind him. Dracus lurched back, smashing the dwarf between himself and the stones of the plaza wall. The impact rattled the dwarf enough to loosen his grip, but not enough to make him let go. Dracus staggered forward, hoping to smash his unwanted rider once more, when he saw, incredibly, the dwarf with a broken arm running toward him. Blood streamed down his face as he screamed, his axe in his good hand. Flashes of light danced around the edges of Dracus's vision as he watched the berserk dwarf charge at him. At the last moment, Dracus spun away from the horrible specter, just as the gleaming edge of the axe blade swung toward him. He felt the impact of the blow behind him. Hot air suddenly rushed into his lungs as the second dwarf, still clinging to his back, took the thrust and released his grip. Dracus swung around again, drawing his blade up swiftly behind his head. Too late. The berserk dwarf had already shoved his dead confederate aside and leaped toward the human, his axe blade descending toward Dracus's face. The flight of the dwarf was suddenly arrested in midair by the blur of a massive club swinging out of the darkness and connecting with the body. Dracus heard the dwarf's armor crumple under the blow and the collapse of its rib cage just before the dwarf flew backward, vanishing under the feet of the raging combatants. Nice hit, Grichag, Ethis commented, slightly out of breath himself. Dracus could barely make out three still shapes lying at the Chimerian's feet. That one was worthy of the Imperial Games. Not good, Grichag replied with disappointment, his deep voice rumbling. The manticore's massive dark head shook with disapproval a full two feet above Dracus. I was aiming for his head. Dracus, still choking, stepped quickly back to the relative safety of the plaza wall and tried frantically to catch his breath. His octian was forming a defensive circle around him, pulling Chukang and Krichan both within their perimeter. When all else fails, depend on your octian, eh, Dracus? Chukong yelled over his shoulder as he drew his twin swords across the throat of a dwarf before him. That is what you taught us, Dracus shouted hoarsely as he rubbed his throat. Panic suddenly gripped him, and he turned quickly. Bron? I'm here, old friend, Bron replied. The proxy stood next to Dracus, his sandals and feet covered in blood from the bodies about them, but he took little notice of either. Instead... He gazed at the bas-relief covering the wall towering behind them. There are cracks in the wall, you know. I've been looking at them for some time now, and I think I can see light coming through them. They're getting wider all the time. Trachus squinted at the proxy. What are you talking about? We're leagues underground. Before Braun could answer, Chukong and Krichan stepped back, standing on either side of the proxy. Braun! This is a disaster. What does the Tribune want us to do? Well, he hasn't. Suddenly, Braun's demeanor changed. Anger and disdain showed on his face, and his voice was suddenly nasal and condescending in tone. They were used to it, for they had seen it every day of their lives. The Tribune was once again pulling the strings of his puppet proxy. Gather the individual Octia cells together and reform the Centauri. Flank the dwarves in the plaza on the left and make for the rotunda. The dwarves are fanatical, but they have gambled on this charge and lost. They have extended themselves too far, and their reserves will not arrive in time. Flank them and get to the rotunda. Master, should we plant a gate symbol there? Krichan asked. Braun turned to the second manticore, his features contemptuous. 
No. There are grand halls leading away from the rotunda. Take the centauri to the end of the right-hand hall, then have the proxy plant the gate symbol there, and propagate it as many times as possible along the promenade you find there before the dwarven reserves arrive. Chukong asked, But how long before the dwarven reserves? Ron turned back toward the captain, his face nearly purple with rage. Just do it! We need as many gate symbols as possible established on the promenade at the end of that hall! Do that, and you may yet salvage some honor from this debacle, Captain Chukong! In an instant, Braun's face changed again to a gently smiling countenance. <sighs> Did I miss something? Captain! It was Jarak, the Manticorean warrior in charge of the second Octian. Second, fourth, and what's left of the eighth and ninth Octia have formed with you here. Third and sixth are fighting off to the right. I haven't seen the Octian Dista. Let's move! Chukong shouted. Let's push to join with the third and sixth, then swing the formation to the left. We're to make for that rotunda. But our casualties... We'll count the dead later, Jarok, Chukong said. Dracus, you have the proxy! Let's go bleed some dwarf! The battle was still raging in the plaza when the centauri from House Timuron broke around the left flank, trampling underfoot the dwarves who had not yet already succumbed to the Empress warrior's weapons. The broken dwarven line contracted, and with shocking suddenness, Dracus found himself running at full gait through the rotunda, with bronze shoulder armor gripped firmly in his left hand. What remained of the Timuron Suntari ran with them as well, their ordered battle lines once again dissolved by the necessity of the moment. Everyone was having trouble keeping up with Captain Chukong, who dashed headlong from the rotunda and bolted down the grand hallway to the right. Nine notes of stones polished, statuesque dwarf glowers, seven notes of watchful guarding doom and loss, five notes. Halls of gleaming onyx, five note halls of black entombing. The stones were polished under their feet, and they passed the thirty foot tall statue of a dwarven hero. The hall they entered to their right was filled with warm light from lit torches set in iron wall sconces. Ornate carved pillars of polished stone rose nearly fifty feet overhead to support the intricately carved arched ceiling. Dracus barely noticed it. His eyes were fixed on Chukong as he ran down the hall toward blackness darker than any night, beyond the arch at the end of the five-hundred-foot-long hall. Keep running, warriors! Krechan shouted. Don't stop! The end is in sight! Come, answer the call of lamenting. Dracus gritted his teeth as he ran. Come, answer the sky that fell... His feet fell into the cadence of the song. Forgive the lament. Forgive, promise torn. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Dracus muttered under his breath, but the song kept revolving in his mind with every measured footfall on the stones passing beneath his feet. The great black void filling the open end of the colossal hall slid toward him, and still he ran following Chukong and holding fast to Braun because that was what he was told to do, and the music in his mind overwhelmed all other thought. Chukong passed the arch at the end of the long hallway and abruptly stopped. The rest of the centauri followed his lead, raising their weapons in caution as they approached the darkness. By the gods! Chukong said in awe as he stood looking out into the void. He called over his shoulder. Timuron Centauri, set up a defense. Octia two, three, and four, protect the hall. Octian eight to my right, and Octian nine to my left. Octian one to me. Dracus, bring me that proxy. Dracus glanced over at Braun. It's going to be all right now, Braun said to him quietly. Sometimes it has to be truly dark before we can make out the stars in the sky. Dracus took in a breath to speak, but then let it out again as a sigh. He stepped between the Empress warriors even as their masters were organizing them into defensive lines. He was blind as he stepped quickly toward their Manticorean captain, 
the darkness seeming a complete void beyond. Captain? Draco spoke as he came near. Chu Kong turned to the proxy, pointing to the stones beneath his feet. Gate symbols! The first one right here, and then start propagating them along both sides of this landing as long as possible. Do it now! We may not have much time! Braun bowed slightly, and then shrugged his shoulder out of Dracus's grasp. Dracus looked at him with slight embarrassment. He had simply forgotten to let go. As the Emperor wills, Braun said with a crooked smile. The proxy immediately swung the standard around smartly, its steel point jabbing into the stone as Braun knelt next to it. The stones beneath it were cut by the strange purple glow at the staff's tip, an unnatural color that Dracus found difficult to look at. Meticulously, Braun moved the tip across the stones, inscribing their surface with the familiar interlocking ovals of the gate symbol. Once completed, any tribune could use them to transport their own centauri to this same spot, the last location of their most forward progress. Many a valiant warrior had died for the honor of moving these symbols a few yards forward on the battlefield. Krichan, Chu Kong said quietly to his lieutenant at his side. Have you ever seen the like? Dracus watched the two manticores stare into the darkness together. Then Dracus realized that the darkness was not entirely dark, as his eyes slowly adjusted from the brilliance of the halls they had just left. He could make out fires burning in the distance, their vague reflection on still waters, and in the distance... The young scort, Dracus breathed. Chukong turned at the sound. Yes, Dracus. The Youngscourt, the last cavern of the dwarves. It's said to be over a third of a league long. Dracus stepped up next to where Chukong stood. He could see now that they were standing on a wide stone landing that ran across the face of the dwarven city from which they had just emerged. Below the landing, the natural cavern sloped downward to the edge of the fabled underground Lake Kiga. The fires appeared to dot a rugged island in the center of the lake that rose upward toward an impossibly regular and enormous oval of stone. Dracus pointed toward it. Is that the stone heart? Krichan said through his fanged grin. The last throne of the dwarves. Yes, Dracus, I believe we have found it. The stone heart... Dracus thought. Every impress warrior had been thoroughly instructed in it from before the battle began. It was a single massive granite disc, polished by the dwarves to a glassy smoothness, though Dracus had wondered why dwarves would want to go to so much trouble to put a brilliant finish on something that would never be touched by light. It was nearly a hundred yards in diameter, and perhaps twenty yards thick in the center. Most remarkable of all, the entire stone sat atop an enormous geyser, whose channeled energies pushed upward with such force that the stone seemed to float atop it. It was the flow from this geyser that fed the torrents raging across the floor of the cavern. We may have found it, but how do we get to it? Chukong mused. These gate symbols we are laying down will make this the entry point for the entire army once they are engraved. But charging that island with an army isn't going to get them any closer to the throne. Look to the left, that small dwarven city on that side of the cavern. There's a causeway that runs up from those buildings to the gate. The Thorgreld, Dracus said aloud. The stone heart was accessible only via a single bridge, carved from the stone that extended from the doors to the heart, outward toward the last gate of Thorgreld. It was the final defense of the last dwarven throne, for on the order of their king the entire stone heart could be rotated atop the geyser by the dwarves within, moving both bridge and entrance door away from the last gate and making it unreachable. The tribune had told them a great deal about it as they prepared, for battle within the stone heart was the prize coveted by all the houses of the Ronus Imperium but hearing it described did not convey to Dracus the enormity of the experience of seeing it himself. We've got to get to that causeway, Chukong said, 
his voice rumbling as he considered the problem. Were any of our warriors over there before? Dracus asked. Both Chu Kong and Kri Chan turned toward him. The Tribune would know. But if they were that close to the causeway, wouldn't they have pressed the attack? Maybe they didn't know it was over there, Dracus replied. They might have been fighting in the corridors as we have. Perhaps they didn't know how close they were to the prize. We can only see it now because we're over here. If that's true, then they might have abandoned some gate symbols there, Quichon said quickly. We could fold there and make for the throne ourselves. Captain! Chu Kong turned abruptly toward the sound. Here! They're coming, Jerox said. We can see them moving toward the rotunda. How long? Not long! Run! Chu Kong called. The proxy was still kneeling next to the gate symbol glowing faintly from the stone next to him. Braun moved his standard over the symbol, and a spark arced upward and over the heads of the arrayed warriors until it landed nearly five hundred feet farther down the landing. There it burned briefly into the stones, carving out a duplicate of the gate symbol. That's ten, Captain. Chu Kong reached down and picked up the proxy with his massive hand, lifting him bodily from the ground and pulling him to stand next to him. Do you see that city to the left? Ron squinted slightly. Yes, the one built into the face of the cavern. They're coming, Captain! Jerok called. The sound of the slow march of dwarven boots became a growing thunder in their direction. That's the way to the throne! Chu Kong said. There's a causeway next to it, a road that leads straight to the gate. Do you see it? Braun smiled. Yes, and so does the Tribune. Braun turned at once and knelt again next to the gate symbol in the floor. He planted the standard, and its great crystal flared into brilliant light at once. The fold opened. Dracus shuddered. He could see nothing at all through the ink-black fold. Timuron Centauri! Chu Kong called out. Fall back! Into the fold by the numbers! Octia Nine! The group leaped from their positions on the landing, dashing at once through the crackling oval into the darkness on the other side. Octia Eight! Warriors from the other side of the landing jumped up, scrambling toward the fold and vanishing into the blackness. Ethis! Megri! Dracus called out. The Chimerian and the Goblin both called out in ragged response. Yes, Oxus. Each of you stand guard on opposite sides of the fold. Tsurag! Grichag! Yes, Oxus. Keep your eyes on the dwarves coming up the hall. We're leaving! Chukong continued to call out the Octia. In quick succession, each pulled back, running quickly through the black opening of the fold. Dracus stared down the hall. The dwarves were running now, seeing that their enemy was trying to elude them. Their battle cries filled the hall, their blades flashing in the torchlight. Auction two! Chukong shouted. Jarak and his warriors leaped up, dashed between the members of Dracus's Octian, and without hesitation jumped through the fold. The dwarves shouted their rage in terrible chorus. That's it! Chukong roared. Fold out! Dracus turned toward the fold. Ethis and Megri had already jumped through. Zurag and Grichag were following the captain, and Grichan as he watched. That only left... Braun! Dracus shouted. The proxy stood up. The standard still emitted the magical aether, holding the fold open, but Braun now held it casually in his hand. Let's go! Dracus barked. Braun's form was silhouetted against the bright hall. Beyond him, Dracus could clearly see the dwarven warriors less than a hundred feet away and getting closer with every thundering step. Braun made no move. Braun! Dracus shouted. It's all right. Braun replied, standing perfectly still. Huh. You don't see it, do you? The walls have all crumbled in here. Here in the darkness, the light comes at last. The dwarves cheered. Fifty more feet and their enemy's blood would flow. Bron smiled but made no move. Do you see the picture? Do you hear the music? Nine notes. Seven notes. 
What did you say? Dracus asked, his eyes going wide. Twenty feet. Eight more steps. Dracus lunged forward, pushing his shoulder into Braun's stomach. The proxy doubled over the warrior's shoulder in surprise. Axes and sword blades alike were raised. Two steps more to strike. Dracus wheeled with the proxy over his shoulder and leaped headlong into the fold. Chapter 3 Empty Rooms Dracus fell shoulder first against the stone floor. The impact shook the proxy from his grip. Dracus felt Braun tumble away from him just as the thunderclap of the closing fold shook the air next to him and plunged him into absolute darkness. Something fell with a dull thud and a resounding clang next to him. Dracus started, rolling quickly away from the sound. Instinctively he reached to his side, drawing his sword from its leather scabbard. But though his eyes shifted back and forth in anxious anticipation, sight was useless in the total absence of light. Black is the sightless light smothering, dead to the waking world's sighs. Dead is the hero, dead to all lament, buried past memory here below. He was alone with the song. Dracus's hand began to shake uncontrollably in the darkness. Octian! Dracus called out. His words swallowed into the black void around him, echoing small and hollow. His fellow warriors had passed through this same fold just a few moments before him. They should have been arrayed all about him with their globe torches shining. Yet he crouched in the darkness, and there was no reply to his call. The wheeling melody surged forward in his mind once more. Dracus quickly muttered a prayer to Rhone, god of war, and drew enough courage to shout again. Octian! The gentle answering voice coming from so near in the darkness unnerved him with its quiet calm. I am here, Dracus. The warrior spun around in the dark. Braun, is that you? Dim blue light grew stronger as he watched, pushing back the smothering black as it brightened. Dracus fixed his eyes and his sanity on the glowing, expanding circle. Dracus's world settled with each revelation of the brightening sphere. The headpiece, then the shaft of the Timuron proxy staff that he had followed to victory in every battle of his life, emerged from the darkness. Then the bald head now obscured with three days' growth of grey-flecked hair, the hooked nose, and the piercing eyes, the figures of Impress Warrior dead. The bodies of an Imperial Octian lay about their feet. Dracus frantically started examining the mutilated corpses, but then stopped. These aren't ours, Dracus said. No, they've been waiting for us here for a day or so now, as you might have guessed by the stench. Braun nodded. He pointed over to the decapitated body of a human nearby with a broken standard staff still gripped in his cold, discolored hand. He's how we got here. That fool managed to do his duty to the last and carve the gate symbol before they got him. Uh, I guess we arrived a bit late to be of much use to him. Dracus looked down at his feet. The freshly severed arm of a dwarf with an axe in its hand lay bleeding onto the ground. And if we had been a little later, we wouldn't have arrived at all, Braun. Dracus struggled to make his voice calm as he spoke. Where is the rest of our Oxian? Braun looked up, considering the question, then smiled knowingly. Hmm, not far, I should think. No doubt they have been called away by some glorious and pressing cause on behalf of our masters. Still, I should think that they will need us more than we will need them in the end, wherever they have gone. Are you hurt? Hurt? The proxy asked in amused surprise. No, Octus Dracus. I am remarkably at peace. Dracus stared at his companion for a moment. Braun, stop that talk. You're pushing Krechan's fur the wrong way. I think he's about ready to tear your limbs off as it is. And how would the big cat get home then? Braun answered simply. How would he be able to lie on his master's feet and be petted? Who would feed him his table scraps then? And who would remember him buried here under the mountain? 
Not a one, Dracus, not a one. Braun peered into the darkness. His memory would be buried with him here, and with it he would have ceased to exist at all. Dracus shook with a sudden chill. Now those are exactly the kind of words that get you into such trouble with— Look, Braun said, pointing with his free right hand. The glow from the top of the staff was now shining with a brilliant white, revealing a great underground avenue running between facing sets of narrow structures. All featured an arched opening next to large, ornately framed windows fitted with thin plates of polished crystal, through which Dracus could see with almost perfect clarity. Yet in spite of their common features, each was uniquely appointed with different carvings and strange dwarven symbols. What are they? Dracus asked. Shops, I should think, Braun replied. Shops, Dracus asked. What are shops? You don't know what a shop is. Braun gave a sad little laugh. I am a warrior of House Timuron, Dracus said, setting his jaw. I have had no need to know of such things before, nor do I see any point in it now. Let's find out anyway. Braun replied, stepping toward the open archway of one of the buildings. The light from his staff shifted the shadows across the buildings as he moved. Dracus realized he was being left to the darkness. He quickly sheathed his sword and fell into step behind the proxy. Braun, we've got to find the Arctian! But the proxy was already inside the archway of the structure, his light shining out through the gentle ripples in the polished crystal window. Dracus ducked quickly through the low arch. He was stopped almost at once by a vertical wall beautifully carved with dwarf figures, some carrying baskets over their shoulders filled with vegetables and grains, while others were enjoying eating loaves of bread and drinking from tall mugs. He easily stepped around the wall and into a large room. The fitted stones of the floor shone like a white marble mirror under the light from the proxy staff. Dracus shook his head. He knew they had to move— to rejoin the Octian and press the battle forward. Chu Kong had told them time and again that to stand still on a field of battle was to invite death to find you. Dracus had to join the battle, had to find some honor in this debacle. More importantly to him, he secretly dreaded the silence and the stillness around him. It gave the music in his mind space to grow. What do you think, Dracus? Braun said as he stood in the center of the room. I think we need to find our Octian and— No! Braun snapped, an angry edge to his voice. Do you see the picture? There's a large, flat platform inside the window. There, back there, is a carved stone counter, and behind it— Can you see it? There are three ovens. Awaken the ghosts long forgotten. Recall the loved dead. Dracus began to sweat in the chill room. It's a... a kitchen, a kind of dwarf mess hall, a place to eat. You look, but you don't see, Braun urged, stepping closer to Dracus. The spirits still breathe whispers of their passing in this place. Their voices shout to us from the silence, and you... you hear nothing! They eat here. They love here. They laugh here. Better if left and forgotten. Nine notes. Seven notes. I hear enough. Dracus swallowed hard. Leave me alone, Braun. It isn't what is here, Dracus. It's what isn't here that you need to see. Braun swept past Dracus to the window. Here, on this shelf, were the wares of this shop. Baked goods, breads, meats. <sighs> Can you smell them still in the air? There, there in the archway that we came through, there is no door. There have been no doors in any of the openings or halls through which we have come in the three days we have been wandering down here in our graves. By all accounts, the dwarves love their gems and their precious metals and their stonework. 
We are told they are all even more covetous of such things than our righteous elven masters. Why, then, are there no doors between the dwarves? We kill without cause. We kill without thought. Five notes. Five notes. What difference does it? And this room? The proxy continued. The floor is cleaner than any plate I've ever eaten from in the Centauri barracks of our great Lord Timoron. No dust, no dirt. But where are the chairs? Where are the tables? There are images of them carved into the wall facing the archway, but there's not a stick of either to be found inside. Look, Dracus, see! There are hooks in the ceiling above the counter, but where are the pots, the pans, the kettles, or the spoons? Where are the tools? Where are the kegs and the stores of grain, or tubers, or roots, or whatever the dwarves fed upon? Stop it, Braun, I don't care! The proxy turned again to face Dracus. Where are the children who squeal through the streets with joy, Dracus? Where are the women who breathed life into this place? Where are the grey-bearded elder dwarves with their frail bodies and their wisdom aged like fine wine? I don't... I don't know, Dracus answered. No, you don't, Braun said, stepping toward him with a strange twisted smile on his face. You don't know. I don't know. But at least I'm beginning to understand just how much I don't know. Dracus reached behind him, feeling for the archway as he carefully backed away from the wild-eyed proxy. It's all unraveling, Dracus, Braun said softly. His tongue flicked to the corner of his mouth, drawing in the spittle that had formed there. Here, in the darkness, I can see. Here in these rooms that are so like you and me. Perhaps it is the distance from the aether well of House Timoron. Perhaps it is the three days we have gone without renewing our devotions. Maybe it has something to do with being so deep beneath the mountain of the dwarves. I don't know. But whatever it is, the cords, soft and silken as they have been, are unraveling from my mind, and I am beginning to see the picture of truth at last. Dracus felt the edge of the archway with his left hand, and carefully stepped back into it. His right hand slowly reached across his body, almost without conscious thought, his palm resting on the hilt of his sword. Braun, we're warriors. Impress warriors of House Timoron. No, Dracus, you were wrong. Braun breathed through clenched teeth. He would not stop advancing. Who are you, Dracus? Why do you fight so well? What makes you so determined to live? I fight. Dracus swallowed, taking another step back through the archway. I fight for the glory of Ronus, for her emperor, and for the glory of House Timoron. Pretty speech. Hollow words. Braun spoke, his words dripping disdain. You dance like a marionette and vomit out the words spoken by others behind the curtain. I've seen what's back there. You take a peek at the truth and tell me. It's just us here. You and me buried in our crypt, and there should be no lies between the dead. You know the answer. Tell me! Dracus's breath was coming hard. Five notes. For the love of her. For the loss of her. Tell me! He suddenly thought of Mala. His beautiful Mala, working in the foundations of the magnificent palace of Shah Timuran. Her image floated before him in his mind. She reached up with her hand to wipe the sweat from her clean-shaven head before she returned to scrubbing the path stones beneath the graceful towers of their master citadel that floated above the garden. He could almost catch the glint of her emerald eyes, feel the curve of her cheek in his hand. He had to return to her, for her, and with the honor that they both so desperately needed. 
She was unaware of the danger he was in, that his life could end at any moment, and the thought of her not knowing comforted him. He could almost hear her humming to herself as she worked in the garden. Nine notes. Seven notes. The dwarves have no doors. The dwarves are no more. Braun was smiling at him. So, you do know something honest after all. Tell me. Dracus gripped his sword, pulling it from the scabbard. Braun anticipated the move. The proxy staff lashed out suddenly, gripped with both his hands. The shaft caught Dracus just behind the knees, cleanly sweeping both his feet out from under him. The warrior landed heavily on his back, the breath knocked from his chest. As he sucked in a painful gasp, the light from the headpiece carved a brilliant blurred arc over him, and he felt the cold steel point of the staff against his throat. He fought for air, trying to speak, but the sound would not come. Braun leaned down, his head and shoulders silhouetted against the light from the aether crystal on his staff. We're empty rooms, Dracus, all of us, Braun said in short breaths. Nothing but the form of what our masters have molded us to be. But I've seen the reality of who and what we are. The walls have cracks and the light shines through. The cords that bind us unravel, and we see at last that our rooms are not empty, but filled with ghosts, Dracus. Ghosts and demons more terrible and wonderful than we know. Dracus reached up with both hands, gripping the staff at his throat. Braun, stop! I can't stop now! Braun answered, shaking his head with an unnatural smile. You've got to see the ghosts! They're waiting for us both, calling to us, longing to take us to a better destiny! Braun looked up. The roof of the avenue was a great arched ceiling barely visible beyond the light from the staff. The ghosts come in the darkness, Braun giggled. Some things are seen better in the dark. <laughs> Some things are easier in the dark. The glow from the staff began to fade. The impenetrable darkness slowly closed in on them again as the light shrank. Soon your soul will be open at last, Braun nodded the features of his face vanishing into a vague shape as the light receded. The ghosts will spill from you, and you will see the vision. Darkness enveloped them. You will hear the song. Stars appeared. Impossibly above him in the pitch blackness two-thirds of a league below the mountain, the night sky filled his vision. Nine notes. Come to us and bring our redemption. The star shifted as he watched in slack-jawed wonder. Seven notes. Weep for the pain and the loss. He felt as though he were falling up toward them. Five notes. The past is our sorrow. The past is our shame. Faces started forming among the stars. Faces he had forgotten. Faces he once knew. Ghosts. Dracus screamed. Dracus! Are you injured? Dracus opened his eyes to see the faces of his octian, lit by a single globe torch, staring down at him. The human warrior sat up on the stones of the avenue and drew in a painful breath. <sighs> No, Captain Chukang, I can fight. The manticore stood up, pulling Dracus to his feet as he did. We thought we had lost you, Humani. There was a reserve of dwarven warriors waiting here when we came through the fold. I think they were more surprised to see us than we were to see them. Krichan chuckled darkly. Ha, 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 They ran, but not fast enough. It was a blessing from the gods, Chukong continued. Chasing them down showed us the way to the causeway. At least we thought it was a blessing, 
Megri chimed in. The goblin was grinning as he picked at his fingernails with the point of his dagger. Until we realized that the proxy had gone missing. Dracus turned. Braun stood nearby, still smiling at him with the same strange grin. The Centauri is assembled up ahead, Krichan said. Are you ready to go? Dracus shuddered. <sighs> More than ready. Chapter 4 Firefall The Timuron Centauri had lost nearly a third of their number by the time they emerged from the Dwarven Avenue. Regrouped and organized, their well-ordered phalanx emerged shoulder to shoulder onto a courtyard that was completely engulfed in hot, steaming mists. Their carefully ordered and classic formation suited the plans of the Ninth Throne Death Dealer Dwarves as well, who waited for the Centauri to emerge from the avenue and then set upon them from both sides simultaneously. Hot, wet mists swirled in utter blackness around them, illuminated by the frequent diffused flashes of blue and red in the distance, each flash painting silhouettes of slaughter in the mists. In the confusion of the vapor, the carefully ordered Centauri collapsed again into frantic and desperate fights with an enemy who kept appearing out of nowhere and vanishing just as quickly as they came. Dracus adjusted his grip and pushed his way into the battle once again. He needed to bring order to his Octian. If he could rally them, then he might use them to bring order to other Octia in the Centauri. But that couldn't happen until he could find his own brother warriors. He was blind in the thick vapors around him. He waded into the milky conflict, killing before being killed and struggling to keep his footing on the blood-slick stones. There is a place that calls my soul home. Unbidden, Dracus's lips began to move with each blow of his sword, and through his chattering teeth he began hesitantly to sing. North! Far beyond horizons! He cut his sword deep across the gut of the dwarf before him. To my place of resting, of testing. He drew the blade out just in time to parry an axe blade from his right. Centauri! Centauri Timuron! The call to rally was shouted unmistakably by Chukong, yet his words sounded strangely muffled, their direction and distance diffused through the steaming fog. One after another, the leaders of each Octian were being summoned to rally to their leader. Centauri! Dracus thrust his sword into an axe-wielding dwarf, then looking up, caught a glimpse of several large figures running past him, their dark outlines illuminated by flashing pulses of light against the steaming mists. The first two were manticores, judging by their size and the enormously broad shoulders, followed closely by a lithe shadow with four arms. Hey! Grichog! Zurag! Ethis! Dracus called out as he dragged his blade quickly from the quivering body of his last opponent. His own Octian at last. So long as he had his Octian brothers with him, he was invincible. His eyes remained locked on the shadows as they quickly stopped and turned in the sticky fog. Yes, warlord, Ethos said flatly as he came closer. Warlord was the title reserved for the master of the combined legions, and ludicrously beyond what any human could dream to attain. Dracus frowned. Knock it off, Ethis. Grichog was Megri. With Chukong and Grichon, the manticore said quickly. And Braun? Dracus urged. Yes, he's with them too. Grichog turned his massive head away in disgust. Dracus gave a sudden, violent shake. The steaming fog was unnerving him. Then let's form the Octian on Chukong. You show us the way, Grichog. The manticore curled his lip, baring his fangs, but he turned and obeyed, followed by Tsurag and Ethis. Dracus's own feet stumbled on the uneven ground, but he knew that both the manticores and the Chimerian could see far better than he could in these conditions. Better to keep his gaze fixed on them and risk a few missteps than to risk falling down some bottomless shaft. With a startling abruptness, the mists twisted, writhing in the cavern wind, shredding apart. He could see the young scored again, but this time 
Dracus was looking back to the distant promenade that the Timuron Centauri had folded away from not that long before. He had stood there and seen this place in the distance. Now, thanks to the folds, he was standing here and looking back on where they had so recently been, and where Brawn had propagated so many copies of the gate symbol along that wide promenade. The young warrior took in a breath, for the sudden vista filled him with awe and pride. Those quickly set gate symbols had borne fruit. Dracus stood atop a cliff face, looking down onto a battle the likes of which he had never before witnessed. It raged all across the floor of the enormous young scored cavern. A tide of imperial warriors, three full impress legions, he was sure over sixteen thousand strong, charged from a line of folds all around the promenade and down toward the carefully prepared positions. Imperial catapults, hastily arrayed on the promenade, launched supporting balls of flame over their heads. The dwarves waited for them, dug into a series of trenches crossing the craggy ground between the raging cascades of water that was still flooding into the enormous grotto. Long torrents of magma streamed down from the ceiling of the cavern. Their brilliant yellow-orange ribbons fell crashing into the flooded cavern floor and flashing into scalding steam, boiling both the water and the impress warriors around it. Still, the slave army of the elves pressed their attack, led by ranks of enraged manticores, their fangs bared in their feral faces, their roars sounding before them as they charged across the field of battle. Following on their heels were chimeras and an entire cohort of proxy, nearly five hundred strong, in support. They were casting sheets of electrical fire over the heads of the charging manticores and into the trenches of the dwarves. Their effectiveness was lessened, however, as the proxy, too, had to run forward or risk death literally pouring down on them from above. Their flashes of lightning and the magma cascades illuminated ghastly scene as the manticores were suffering under the withering assault of catapult fire raining death across their ranks. The great lion men never took their eyes off their prey, however, and in a wave leaped over the battlements and into the first line of dwarven trench works. Dracus! Chukong snarled through the flat muzzle of his face. Dracus turned at once, unquestioningly obeying his leader's command. Captain, I do not yet have the count. Forget that, there's no time, Chukong said, pointing up along the cliff face. Get this auction organized and moving, now! It was the causeway, the same causeway he had seen from the far end of the Young's Court, but now it lay open before them, rising along the side of the cavern, winding between the spires of impossibly large stalagmites straight to the gates of the Thorgreld and Stoneheart just beyond. You heard the voice! Surag and Grichag, you're the leads with swords bright! Megri, you followed Chukang and Krichan! Braun, you with me! Ethis, you watch our backs! Stay tight, let's go! Chukang was already charging up the inclined ledge, and Dracus was finding it hard to catch up. Now in the clear, Dracus could see what remained of their centauri emerging from the steam. They were far fewer than he had hoped, perhaps not quite forty, less than half their original strength. With the song still sounding in the back of his head, Dracus yelled, and his entire Octian yelled with him as they led in the charge. They ran up the fitted cobblestones of the causeway as it wound its way upward following the sidewall of the cavern. Their path was illuminated by their globe torches and the increasingly frequent brilliant flashes from the battle on the cavern floor behind them. Every step up the inclined road brought them closer to the last gate of Thorgreld, a bastion carved into an enormous stalactite hanging from the cavern ceiling nearly a thousand feet above the cavern floor. Beyond that, in the dim light of the battle raging below them, Dracus could see the stone heart, last stronghold of the dwarven kings. The blessings of the emperor may yet be with us today, Dracus thought. He could see the last gate ahead of them as they charged up the causeway, and the way still looked open. There were no dwarven warriors on the road between them and the gatehouse. Out of over forty thousand warriors, the fates had conspired to place what remained of Centauri Timuron within reach of the greatest prize of the war. Hey, Humani, huffed the goblin as he sprinted alongside Dracus. What is this treasure we've come to liberate? It's the most important treasure of this entire war, Megri, but you're going to have a hard time finding it if you don't know what it is. Dracus grinned. 
Weren't you paying attention? Yeah. Dwarf Barter, I forgot. Can someone please tell Megri why we're here? Dracus called back, not slackening his pace. Ethis spoke up at once. Destroy the last of the Dwarven Thrones, capture the crown of the Ninth Throne, and return with it and any other bounty we liberate in triumph to Lord Timuron. That's right! Dracus called back, his voice starting to get hoarse from long use during the day. We get to return with great honor and glory added to the house of Lord Timuron. Maybe even a reward, eh? Ethis chuckled. Dracus had long ago learned to listen carefully to Chimera. Looking at them was useless in trying to gauge their intentions, since Chimera barely had a face, let alone facial expressions. Sure, Ethis. Krichan, the captain's Mentacorian second, responded. Seche Timoran himself will give you a big kiss, pat you on the head, and elevate you to sixth estate, just so you can join him for breakfast. Ha <laughs> ha More likely eat him for breakfast? Braun laughed. Oh, but you shouldn't worry, friends, because we'll never have to worry about another breakfast ever again. Dracus eyed Braun as they ran side by side. He had known Braun all his life, but he had never acted so strangely before. Hmm. Thick bones, thick head. Ethis snorted as he laughed. Ha! Huh. You know the saying, Umani, a poor at everything, great at nothing. Both the Chimerian and the Goblin laughed heartily. Quiet, both of you! Chu Kong growled. Dracus grimaced. Chimera approached battle with a lot more finesse than the Manticores. They weren't particularly strong, but they were fast and difficult to damage. Their skeletons were telescoping plates and cartilage instead of the more rigid and brittle bones of the Manticores or humans. They could change their skin color to blend into the surroundings and alter their skeletal frame at will so that they might be nearly as compact as a dwarf to nearly twice as tall as Dracus. Chimera made fine warriors, but tended to be clannish and exclude others. He didn't have anything against the Chimera and always remembered them as maybe a little playful, but never cruel to him. But now Ethis was making racial jokes. We're coming to the end and the beginning all at once. Braun huffed next to Dracus. The whole pointless bloodletting and death dealing, all for the amusement of the elven children. We should stop. Savor the moment. We're almost there, Dracus snapped. We can't stop now. You cannot run from yourself, Dracus. Braun shook while he ran. His craggy face was sweating profusely. <laughs> the ghosts are lurking, waiting to pounce on you given any opportunity. They'll leap from their little box and bite old Timuron right in his skinny ass. Shut up, Braun. The Tribune will get the wrong idea. Do you think so? I thought I was speaking very clearly. Just keep your mouth shut and we may salvage a way out of this yet. If we get hold of that last dwarven crown, the glory to House Timuron will be... I don't give a damn about the House Glory! Braun spat back. It's not my glory. It's not your glory, so why should we care, let alone die? You know why as well as anyone? Draco shook his head. They had fought their way so far, lost more than forty brothers from their own Centauri in the last hour, and now their proxy wanted to just walk away from the reward? What in the name of the gods was wrong with everyone today? Nine notes. Seven notes. The last dwarven king, my death knell did bring. Five notes, five notes. Well, it looks like none of us are going to have to worry about the spoils today, Ethis grumbled. Look up ahead. They were rounding a towering stalagmite when they saw it. More than a hundred yards beyond Tsurag and Grichag, three full cohorts had erupted from folds appearing on the causeway in front of them. More than a thousand impress warriors were now dashing madly toward the last gate ahead of them. Where do they come from? Dracus asked sourly. What difference does it make? Braun sighed. So long as they're the ones doing the bleeding. Term you Braun! Krichon's golden eyes flashed in the darkness. 
If you weren't our proxy, I'd tear out your heart right here and now. Dracus turned toward Jukong. Come on! We've come this far! We can still beat them to the throne! Wait! Something's not right! Jukong snarled. The human stepped in front of their Manticorean captain and angrily turned. Jukong! The lead cohorts will break against the gate tower! Let them do the dying, and then we... Jukong was not looking at Dracus. The manticore's gold-hued eyes were fixed on something at the top of the causeway. Dracus could feel the heat growing on his neck. He turned and drew in a sharp breath. The front cohorts had engaged the Thorgreld gate, an upside-down tower suspended from the cavern ceiling down to meet the rising causeway, but the dwarves once more were anticipating them. A cascade of molten lava, held in check for uncounted centuries against this day, was loosed by the dwarven defenders from above the gate. Its brilliant, blinding stream arced out from the inverted tower's spouts and poured down on the ledge below. Flashes of blue could be seen near its base, evidence of desperate attempts of the tribunes to hold back the incinerating river of liquid rock through their proxies while keeping the lead Centauri still battling for the gate and the throne beyond. The lava, however, continued to pour from above, rolling in a devastating torrent over the remaining warriors and into the entire cohort behind it. The warriors of the second cohort broke ranks, running back down the causeway directly toward Dracus and his comrades, but the river of lava was rapidly overtaking them. Dracus glanced at his feet. The fitted cobblestones of the causeway had been formed with a slight trough in the middle, the perfect channel for a river of molten rock. Back! Chukong shouted. Back down! Now! His commands were pointless as those behind him were already trying to move, but the causeway was packed now with other centauri from the Imperial Army who had appeared behind them. Those closest to the front started shouting and pushing at those behind. Panic rose like a tide among the warriors. Dracus plunged into the fray, trying desperately to get away from the onrushing death. He heard the screams of several warriors as they were pushed over the edge by their terrified companions. The deadly tide hissed menacingly behind him as the mass of warriors compressed around him. The air was being pressed out of his lungs. A massive hand grabbed the back of his breastplate and pulled him back. He felt himself swinging wildly, his head banging against his own shoulder plate, and then suddenly he was spinning through the air. His scream was cut short as his back slammed against stone and he tumbled down a rock face. His fall was only a few feet down from where he impacted, but it felt as though he had fallen much farther. Still panicked, he scrambled backward, clawing at the ground until he reached the wall. Only then did he take in his surroundings. He was sitting on a rock outcropping above the causeway. The other members of his octian were there as well, a few of them, a little bruised but otherwise intact. Chukong was pulling himself up the cavern wall to join them. Hmm. <laughs> you toss well for a humani. Ethis chuckled. Braun was shivering, curled up in a stone niche at the back of the outcropping. Ethis was looking intently over the edge. Krichan was helping pull Chukong up to the ledge. There were two younger manticores on the ledge who were almost identical, as well as another Chimarian. Balog! Karag, what are you doing here? Dracus asked. I thought you were in the sixth Octian with Sakar. We were, Dracus. Belag answered at once. But we're both just as glad to be with you, considering the alternative. And you, warrior? Dracus tried to stop his hands from shaking as he turned toward the Chimarian. There was something familiar about him, but the memory would not push past the music. What's your name? Thore, the Chimerian said evenly. Fourth Octian under Ophos. Well, you're all first Octian now, Dracus said and turned toward the captain. Should have foreseen this, Chukong said with a rumble in his voice as he gazed toward the gate. A waste of warrior flesh. The ledge shook. A great slab of stone sheared away from the rock face under the ledge, crashing down into the magma with a shower of molten rock. The heat rolling up the face toward them was blistering. We can't stay here! Krichan roared. Captain! 
Dracus turned toward the sound, faint over the roaring of the magma flowing below their ledge. Look! Karag shouted as he pointed across the glowing flow below. On that rock, Pillar! Dracus saw them. It was Jarak, the Manticorean leader of Tumoran's second Octian. Half a dozen other warriors from their Centauri had joined Jarak in climbing to their own cramped haven, atop a broken stalactite on the far side of the causeway. They're trapped like we are, Ethis yelled over the din. If the molten river on the causeway does not kill them, then it must be at least three hundred feet to the floor of the cavern. Dracus was finding it hard to breathe. Well, (laughs) Dracus, dropped at last, Braun said with a sick smile. I guess no one is going to know why you fought after all. Five notes. Five notes. Mala will forgive. Mala will forget. We're not trapped! Draca shouted as he picked up Braun with both hands, dragging the proxy to his feet. Can you propagate a symbol far enough to reach that pillar? Braun shook violently in his hands, his eyes refusing to focus. Can you? Of course. Braun drooled slightly, his words slurred. I'll have to draw a gate symbol here first. Do it! Draca spat, releasing the proxy with a slight but emphatic shove. The ledge shook again. Kuchan leaped back just as a section of ledge gave way under his foot. Chu Kong grabbed the human warrior's shoulder. What are you doing, Dracus? Dracus turned. Those warriors don't have a proxy. They cannot fold off that stone pillar without one. Then they're lost. No! Dracus shouted, perhaps too emphatically. We have our proxy make a gate symbol here, on our ledge, and then propagate it across to that ledge where Jerok is sheltered. We get the Tribune to fold us all over to that other rock, and then all of us fold out from there. There isn't much room over there, Krichon added, his heavy brow furrowed. They'll make room, or cook. Chu Kong nodded and turned to the proxy. Make it happen, Braun. But the proxy was already finishing the inscription of three interlinking rings in the stone of the ledge. Sweat was pouring from his brow, and he looked up with unfocused eyes but the arc of bright light flew from his staff and fell with precision exactly in the center of the stone pillar on the far side of the molten causeway. Now, Braun, call on the Tribune! Draca shouted in his face. Braun's eyes suddenly focused. He shoved Dracus away, knelt down and jammed the end of his staff into the stone of the ledge, sweat pouring down his face. The terrible cries of the dying on the ledge below him receded farther from his mind as he connected with other thoughts. Other powers. So we rescue our brother warriors. Then where do we go? Thury gripped his four blades in his hands once more. Does it matter? Draca shouted, drawing his own short sword. We've come this far. How can the day get any worse? The air twisted in on itself, then suddenly tore apart. Chu Kong did not wait to see what was on the other side. He shouted and everyone jumped through the opening just as the outcropping crumbled beneath their feet, eaten from under them by the continuing stream of lava. Chapter 5 The Last Throne They emerged in chaos. The fold collapsed behind them, but the sound was swallowed in the cacophony of battle that raged before them. By the gods! Chu Kong roared. Where are we now? Krichan turned on Braun, grabbing the edges of his breastplate with both fists. Where have you taken us? Where are Jerok and the rest of the Centauri? I... I don't... Why did you bring us here? Krichan shouted in the proxy's face. Not me! Braun yelled back at the manticore. I didn't bring us anywhere. It's the Tribune. He's the one who determines where the folds connect, not me. He sent us here. Krichan shoved Braun to the ground, his lips curling up around his fangs in disgust. Wait! Dracus shouted above the noise. I know where we are! This is it! The Ninth Throne of the Dwarves! Every available cohort from almost two full legions, perhaps six thousand warriors in all, had folded into the room just ahead of them, 
a charging army of warriors who could smell impending victory in the air and taste the final fall of the dwarven kingdoms. Their influx gushed into the vast space as though they were a torrent from a swollen river, flooding into the rotunda and the last stand of dwarven might. The elite warriors of the Ninth Throne were there to meet them, their axes already wet with the blood of their enemies. This was the last throne, where all of the dwarven kings came to counsel with one another. It was the most honored place in all the nine kingdoms under the mountain, and home of the greatest of the dwarven kings, whose name was not known. "'What about Jarak and the rest of us in Tarai? Krichan swore. "'Damn the Tribune!' Or oh, may the gods bless him, Jukong replied. Ron! Yes, Captain. You say the Tribune knew about Jarok and the rest of our warriors? Yes, Captain. Then he'll bargain for another proxy to get them and bring them here, Jukong said. The Tribune wants us in on the end, wants a prize that will bring honor to our house. That's why we came. Five notes. Five notes. I fight for a life. I fight for my wife. The throne room was enormous, the hollowed-out core of the stone heart nearly a hundred yards in diameter. The domed roof was supported by nine enormous statues of dwarven kings, each carved out of the native stone as though they supported the weight of the mountain on their shoulders. In the center of the room was the elevated platform at the top of a truncated cone of stairs, where the dwarven kings once met in council. Now all the impress warriors could see the last dwarven king sitting on his throne, his crown shining in the explosive light of the invading army. Scattered about the room was the last of the wealth gathered from all of the nine kingdoms, but it was the crown that riveted the eyes of every impress warrior smashing against the dwarven circle of defense. Drakus realized that they had arrived too late. By moments only, but that was enough. The converging impress warriors of the Ronos Empire had already swarmed down on the dwarven defenders, shattering their forward lines in what must have been a horrific collision. Now all lines between the defending dwarves and the Ronos warriors were blurred into a confused, seething mass of blood and blind rage. "'Is that it?' Krichan shouted, pointing toward the throne even as he began charging toward the writhing slaughter around the base of the steps. Yes! Chu Kong snarled through his clenched, bared teeth, running alongside him. We take it, and we go home! Home? How? Krichan exclaimed. All the other Centauri are trying to hold their formations together! Chu Kong smiled with relish as he spoke. There's no one left to hold us back! Just don't stop! The crown was the prize above all others coveted by the elven houses that had engaged in this war. Any house that returned with the crown would be lifted beyond its previous status, possibly even elevated in its caste among the estates. Every tribune directing the battle from the distant command tent on the plain knew it, and made doubly sure that every impress warrior knew it, too. Dracus was running as fast as he could just to keep up with the manticores. We'll never make it. Someone else is going to fall right to the top and it will all be over. No, we have a chance. Look. Ethis ran next to him, pointing with his third arm. Look. All around the throne, folds erupted, but even as each sprang into existence, another fold would appear too close by. The tearing of space collapsed, and the folds shredded each other. Greedy bastards, our tribunes. Thury shouted through a wide grin, splitting his otherwise featureless face. Pushing each other out of the way now that the end is in sight. All we need is to get our proxy up there to etch a gate symbol. That will anchor our fold and it's all over! Krichan shouted from behind them. Drake us! Take Braun and follow Chukong! Don't stop! This is it, Braun! Drake shouted. Let's go! Follow me! Of course, Drake Braun answered cheerfully as he picked up the standard staff in his hand. As far as the ghosts will allow. Chukong charged into the battle with a wide-bladed sword in each of his massive hands, but he did not stop to engage any of the enemy.
He continued his run, weaving between the warriors engaged in battle, his great blades occasionally striking out at any dwarf that moved to engage him, then dashing past. Dracus followed, keeping his eyes fixed on the sink, the devotion tattoo on the broad back of his Manticorean commander's shaved head. He was only dimly aware of the other warriors of his Octian weaving their desperate way near him in pursuit of their leader. Flashes of battle caught his eye as he ran, a Manticorean warrior from another Centauri being dragged to the ground, screaming under a rush of dwarven axemen. A human, his face covered in blood, plunging his sword downward into a dwarf prone at his feet. A Tumerian, shifting in size to nearly nine feet, swinging a pair of curved bladed swords against three dwarven dartmen while trying to staunch the bloody stump of a severed arm with his remaining free hand. Their cries receded in his ears, echoing in his mind as from a distance, replaced by the torturous melody that ran through his mind to the rhythm of every running step that he took. Keep going! Krichan's shout sounded far away, behind the wall of music in his head. Up! Go up! Dracus tripped over the body of a fallen dwarf, breaking his stride and threatening to bring him crashing down to the bloody floor beneath him. He lurched forward, desperate to get his feet back under him. Chukong's blades flashed again through the thicket of combat as Dracus lunged after him. They were through. The curving stairs rose before them to the dwarven thrones above. Chukong roared, rushing up the stairs with Krichan and Belog already behind him. Dracus followed without hesitation, his own battle cry in his throat. He glimpsed Thuri to one side as he rushed up the stairs, ducking past the still erupting and collapsing folds. The dwarven defenders, distracted by a threat on the far side of the throne, were too late to regroup for Chukong's sudden assault. They tried to release the cauldron vents beneath the topmost step so they could pour a molten cascade down on their enemies, but they were too late. Chukong's blades cut into them as the remaining dwarves of the king's guard, all in ancient dwarven armor, tried desperately to push the manticore off the platform of the Nine Thrones. Krichan entered the battle next to Chukong, as did Belog, and in moments they had engaged the last stand of dwarves in mortal combat. Dracus then saw the dwarven king, the crown fixed to his battle helmet. Dracus, sword drawn, rushed forward. The dwarven king's long beard hung down over a shining breastplate of ancient design. He held a shield on his right arm fixed to his bracer, and his left hand gripped a sword. The jewels on the crown flashed in the light of the magical bolt still being cast through the hall. The helmet itself was fabulously ornate, sharp dragon-like wings extending backward on both sides, and a faceplate molded into a fearsome countenance. Dracus grinned. He always preferred it when the faceplate was down. Somehow it made the killing easier. Dracus made a few probing thrusts, studying the Dwarven King's reactions. Time seemed to be slowing around him, and the world contracted until all that existed for him was the armor-encased dwarf in front of him. Parry! Parry! Thrust! Slash! And parry! Dracus bared his teeth in a savage smile. The King was skilled, but not skilled enough. Dracus lunged forward, his blade flashing in a series of blows. The dwarf quickly parried, backing from the onslaught. Their swords locked, Dracus pressing downward until both their blades smashed against the dwarf's shield. Dracus reached down, pulling his dagger from his belt. The human pushed away from the dwarf, but not quite far enough. The king lashed out quickly, cutting just under Dracus's breastplate, his blood welling into his tunic beneath. Dracus cursed, but knew it was a risk he had to take. He needed to remain close. Dracus parried the next blow and then again pressed a savage set of blows against the dwarf, pressing him against one of the thrones. He was tiring quickly, and the pain shooting across his chest was distracting, but the thought flashed through his mind that at least the song was leaving him to his work. He swung high and downward, again crashing both their swords down on the shield arm, then suddenly spun, the dagger in his free hand cutting through the air. It found its mark between the helmet and the breastplate, Dracus turned the blade and felt the warm, sticky wetness gush over his hand. The ninth and last of the dwarven kings released his grip on his sword. Dracus let go of his dagger. The dwarf slumped back onto the throne. Dracus reached over and pulled the crown of the ninth throne from the helmet of the dwarven king.
his voice shouting with unparalleled joy. We've done it! We've won! Chu Kong straightened to stand with his stained blades in both his hands. The last of the king's guards had fallen before them. Well done, Dracus! A triumph! Lord Timuran will honor us all! Thuri nodded. Perhaps even a sixth the state? Belog purred. Surely, Chu Kong, you are due to be so honored. We'll brag ourselves in the glory later, Chu Kong said, shaking his head with pride. Let's get out of here before anyone realizes. Where's Braun? He was behind me, Dracus said as he turned. He should be. Dracus's eyes fixed on the standard of the Timuron Centauri. The staff lay abandoned on the ground at the foot of the dwarven throne. He's gone! Thuri yelled as he picked up the staff. Gone! Chu Kong shouted. Where could he go? Dracus frantically scanned the battle around the foot of the stairs, but could not see the proxy anywhere among them. Here! Yeah. Thuri shouted, thrusting the standard into Dracus's free hand. You do it! You get us out of here! I can't! You're human just like brawn. It doesn't work that way. Dracus spat his words in anger and frustration. You have to be trained for it. Linked to the Tribune through the house altar. How long before the Tribune can get another proxy to us? Chukong asked quickly. He'll know the link was broken, Dracus answered. He'd have to negotiate use from another Tribune. Chukong turned to look down from the platform. We don't have that long. The battle was quickly winding down. The centauri of other houses were breaking free of the failing dwarves, moving up the stairs toward them, toward the crown. The imperial army of conquest was made up of units donated to the campaign by various houses of the empire. Some of the larger houses had been known in the past to donate an entire legion, an extravagance of maintaining over four thousand slave warriors. That was not true of the current campaign. The largest single house commitment from House Plincian of the Pactan Guild Order was five cohorts of 2,800 warriors. Several other houses contributed full cohorts of their own, but the majority of the Imperial Army of Conquest was made up of legions and cohorts that were cobbled together from donations of between one and three centauri from many individual houses. Cohorts from the larger houses were regrouping, struggling to re-establish order in their commands for their own organized assault on the crown. But the centauri from the smaller houses knew that their only chance at the prize was to seize it now. For the majority of the warriors in the vast throne room, the military order of legions and cohorts evaporated at the sight of the prized crown. The warriors from the different smaller houses, battle fever still raging in their blood, started up the stairs toward Chukang and the remnants of his Octian. As one Octian pushed forward, the others grabbed at them, dragging them backward. A blade strike. A scream. Then suddenly all of the impress warriors of the Ronas Empire, each vying for the glory and recognition of their own house, turned on each other. Combat erupted among the warriors of the competing houses, each of them desperate to reach the top of the steps and claim the crown for their own. What do we do? Thuri said, his large blank eyes blinking furiously. How do we get out of here? Without the proxy? Krichan barked. We have no way out! But what about Jerak, Tribune Sejinka? Look around us! The Tribune can't open a fold here any better than the rest of the Tribunes. Ethis snapped. We were supposed to rescue Jarok, remember? If he gets here, it would only be through a fold opening on the outside of this mob. Then there'll be our own army between us and him. What good would that do? Karag drew in a sharp breath. <sighs> we're on our own. Unfortunately... Ethis replied, raising his four swords once more as he gazed down the stairs. Not for long. We are about to have far too much company. The scrambling warriors from the other houses were coming closer. As the cone of stairs got narrower in circumference with each step, the fighting among the manticores, chimera, gnomes, and a few humans became more constricted. They stepped over the bodies of their former comrades, slew anyone who got in their way 
only to be felled by those behind them intent on one thing. They each wanted the crown for the glory of their own house. They had killed the dwarves for this prize. All that was left for them was to kill each other. An ancient manticore, scarred and missing one eye, was the first to reach them. Chukong met him with both blades, but the seasoned warrior traded him blow for blow. Two more manticores swiftly moved to join the combat. Krichan and Karag rushed forward to help. Ethis stepped backward toward Dracus, his narrow head swiveling about, looking for approaching enemies on all sides. Belog rose up against a Chimerian from House Sutharan, cutting him down just as a human lunged toward him. Dracus held the crown in his hand. The dwarves have no doors. The dwarves are no more. A goblin lunged at Chukong from behind. The Centauri commander howled in pain, falling forward into the blades of the Tajaran manticores. Krichan sliced downward, nearly cutting the goblin in two, just as one of the Tajaran manticores thrust from the side, running his blade upward. Krichan took a single gasp before collapsing. Karag stepped forward, impaling the Tajaran manticore on his own blade, but the blow left him open to the third manticore on his right. Belog roared at his brother, rushing toward him. Karag did not see the danger. The blade cut into his leg behind the knee. The manticore howled, turning just as the blade swung again, this time downward into his chest. What do we do? Thuri yelled at Dracus. For the love of her, for the loss of her. The song was raging once more in his head, the melody sounding over and over. Dracus! By the house gods! Thuri yelled again. What do we do? For the love of her, for the loss of her. Dracus's eyes suddenly focused. He looked at the crown. He could have bought a life of his own with it, but if he kept it, he would never live to claim it. None of them would. Dracus leaped up to stand on the arms of the throne, holding the crown high over his head. He felt more than saw more than a thousand pairs of eyes fixed on him. He searched at the far edge of the army. He could see the larger cohorts, now organized, making a determined run toward the thrones. He caught a glimpse of the glowing headpiece of a proxy staff beyond the edge of the pressing mob. There was the face of a manticore next to it. Was it Jerok? Had Tribune Sajenka sent them help at last? For the love of her! For the loss of her! With all his remaining strength, he hurled the crown toward the distant manticore next to the familiar-looking staff at the far edge of the mob. It sailed out high over the heads of the impress warriors, tumbling in the air above hundreds of greedy, outstretched hands. The warriors who were on the stairs groaned, but turned almost as one, charging back toward where the crown was falling. Madness, Ethis said shaking his head as he watched Ronas' warriors converge on where the crown had landed in its flight, killing their brothers in arms to claim it for their own. Dracus just looked down into his empty hands. Chapter 6 Spoils Four figures wandered listlessly among the dead. Dracus reached down, turned over a broken shield and peered beneath it under the hard, radiating light of a globe-torch in his hand. The pale, glazed eyes of a dead dwarven warrior stared back up at him. The warrior was stripped of all its armor and weapons. Even its tunic had been torn open, leaving its bare, unmoving chest exposed. <sighs> There's nothing left, Dracus muttered to himself. They've taken it all. Dracus stood upright and stretching his stooped back, surveyed the results of their victory. The battle had raged briefly below the throne as the various house factions fought one another for possession of the crown. Dracus's aim had been true. He was certain now that the crown had landed among the warriors from his own cohort. In his recollection, it was Jerok himself who had caught it, a proxy bearing the standard of the cohort of the western provinces, no doubt where Tribune Sajenka had secured a replacement for Braun managed to open a fold, and the crown was gone. The outraged other Octia from the various centauri remaining in the great throne room immediately fell to pillaging anything of any worth that they could put their hands on. These were set upon quickly by the larger and now regrouped cohorts, 
who took what they wanted from the hall by virtue of their size and unity. Once they were sated, the centauri of the smaller houses fell to their own pecking order. They cleaned the hall of its treasures, and when there were none left to be taken from the ground, they began to strip the dead. When there was nothing left of value among the dead, they began once more to fight and kill each other over those treasures they had already looted. Dracus and his three remaining warriors from House Timuron had tried at first to secure their own portion of the fortune to be sacked from the last dwarven stronghold, but without a proxy to fold their gains safely away, their choice was either to fight interminable battles with those who did have access to a fold, or give up their spoils. Now all was silent. The Empress warriors from the other houses had all folded out of the hall with their prizes. Dracus and the few living members of his Octian were all that now moved under the enormous dome of the rotunda. Dracus surveyed the scene with revulsion. He had seen many battles in his life, but none had struck him as being so senseless, vicious, and pointless. All these dwarves were dead, and for what? So that Timuron or Tajeran or any of a dozen other houses could have bragging rights about their cohorts? So that they could carry away some metal crown? I fight for a life. I fight for my wife. Draco shook his head. The words weren't right. He looked up into the glaring face of an enormous dwarven king hanging above him. It was one of the nine statues supporting the domed ceiling, illuminated by several fires now burning in the rotunda. Books, Dracus supposed. Dwarven histories or journals or other such nonsense that had no value at all. The flickering light cast strangely moving shadows across the face of the statue, and the smoke gathering in the dome left a hazy distance between him and the face looking down on him with such disapproval. Anyone find Brawn? Belog shouted, his voice echoing in the vast hall. A couple of charred humans over here. One of them looks like it was Brawn. Ethis called back. Why? I want to kill him. He's already dead. Not dead enough! Belog roared. Keep looking! Dracus urged. Nothing, Ethis said with disgust as he kicked over another dwarven body nearly sixty feet away. Starving vermin would have left more. Keep looking! Dracus shouted, his voice echoing slightly and strangely amplified by the dome above. We've got to find something to take back with us as a prize. Lord Timuron invested a great deal in this war. Yeah, Thuri said. He invested us. For a house in the provinces, Dracus said. That was more than he could afford. Listen, the gleaners will be here soon, and once they arrive, nothing will be left. We've got to find whatever we can quickly to bring honor to the house. Honor? Belog snarled. Where is the honor in this? Honor is in battle, and the blood of our enemies— not the blood of our own traitorous allies or these pretty pieces of metal and stone. The manticore threw down the broken jewelry he had just picked up. Hey, Ethis called out. We need that for a prize. Dracus was finding it difficult to breathe. The last dwarven king my death knell did bring. The dwarves have no doors. The dwarves are no more. We had the prize! Belog shouted, his deep voice resonating through the hall. Dracus took it from the dwarven king and stood with it, held it in his hands right there! He pointed up to the platform where the dead dwarf still slumped on the throne. And then he threw it away! Dracus squeezed his eyes closed, pressing the palm of his hand against his forehead. I fight for a life. I fight for my life. Weep for the pain and the loss. The past is our sorrow. The past is our shame. He saved your life, Belog, Thuri said simply as he pushed over yet another dwarf corpse. He saved all our lives. Not all, Belog growled. Dracus turned toward the manticore. "'fixing his eyes on the enormous creature. 
Several quick strides brought him to stand directly in front of Belog, looking upward into the angry yellow eyes set deep in the wide face, a full foot above his own gaze. No, not all. Chukang's dead. Krichan's dead. Braun is gone, and your brother. And yes, you see, I do know all their names. Karog's dead, too. The past is our sorrow. The past is our shame. Dracus began to sweat. Maybe you wanted to join them, but the rest of us are satisfied that we're still here. We kill without cause. We kill without thought. Five notes. Five notes. His hand began to shake. So either fall on your sword and get it over with, or get back to your job and help us salvage something out of this... this... Belog's eyes narrowed. Dracus. They eat here, they love here, they laugh here. Better if left and forgotten. Nine notes, seven notes. Dracus flinched. Awaken the ghosts long forgotten. Recall the love dead. Dead is the hero, dead to all lament. Buried past memory here below. Leave me alone! Dracus screamed as he bent over, pressing both his palms against his temples. Belog drew his sword. Thuri and Ethis both began making their way toward Dracus, picking their path around the bodies that covered the floor everywhere around them. Dracus! Ethis said, his upper two hands gripping the human by his shoulders. What's wrong? Mala will forgive. Mala will forget. It's... It's nothing, Dracus said, shaking off a sudden chill. I... I hear this, I don't know, this music, this song in my head. Song. Belog raised one heavy brow. It's just a song, Dracus said, drawing in a deep breath. I don't know where it came from, but I can't seem to be rid of it. It's just something in my mind. Belog's head raised suddenly, his ears swiveling forward. I think I hear it, too. Dracus shot a questioning glance at the manticore. Hear what? Your song, Belog said in a low, rumbling voice, his heavy eyebrows knitting together. He moved closer to the stairs leading up to the throne. It's coming from over here. Belog drew his long, curved blade, the ringing of the metal singing softly as it cleared its scabbard. Where? Dracus asked on a soft breath. The manticore gestured with the tip of his sword toward the right side of the enormous cone of steps. Dracus shook his head doubtfully, but drew his own sword. He took a step toward the stairs, the melody still there. He was no longer certain whether the tune was in his mind or his ears. One thing was certain. Something was moving in the shadows among the dead. Dracus froze. His eyes suddenly opened wide. It was singing. The words were indistinct, but the tune was unmistakably the same as the one that had haunted Dracus for days. The refrain stopped, replaced by a voice. Is it over? asked the lilting voice coming from the squat figure. Can I come out now? Dracus raised his sword again. The squat figure still remained in shadow. Show yourself! The dark outline stopped and then emerged from the darkness as it held both hands open, its chubby palms in front of its wide body. Belog curled his lips in loathing. By all the gods of the house, what is that? That it was a dwarf was not in doubt, but its clothing was of such a bizarre nature as to leave Dracus to question his own vision. The dwarf had the requisite long beard of its kind, but instead of the usual bushy splay, it was split down the middle, and each side was carefully braided. The ends of this bizarre affectation were tucked into pockets on the outside of, not the universal dwarven brown jacket, but an outlandishly colored and intricately embroidered doublet that seemed a bit too large for him. Colored hose, one green and one red, clung closely to the dwarf's stout legs, which were planted firmly in incongruously heavy boots. 
Topping it all was an enormous puffy hat of purple and orange, nearly overwhelmed with long feathers, beads, and glass, all of which was pulled to one side by a single bell that had no clapper, and therefore could not ring unless struck. Ethis shook his head with a smirk. That, Belog, is a joke. Very nearly on the mark, although it would be better to say a great many jokes, the dwarf said cheerily. He reached up with his right hand and tugged at the hat. It proved momentarily reluctant to let go of the dwarf's brow. Sorry, bad entrance. The dwarf spoke with embarrassment as he finally pulled the cap free. Dracus could at last see clearly the broad face with the high round cheekbones. The dwarf had thick bushy eyebrows above twinkling pale blue eyes, all of which was difficult to see behind a prominent bulbous nose. His long white hair looked as though it was usually combed straight back from his high forehead, but the reluctant hat had pulled it all into a rather messy nimbus. I am Juga, king of dwarven jesters, and jester to dwarven kings. You're the fool, Dracus said incredulously. Well, to be sure, we prefer the appellation court jester or professional idiot, but I think you've got the concept at its core, the dwarf said, smiling patiently. He took a few more cautious steps toward Dracus and then stopped. He looked around the hall, his smile falling slightly as he gazed across the field of fallen warriors in the hall. So, he said carefully, how goes the war? It's over, Belog grunted. You lost. Ah. Jugar took in a deep breath and then turned to Dracus. Well... Then I guess there's nothing left to do but surrender. Uh, where's the king? I don't mean to brag, mind you, but I could probably smooth things over for you. Uh, put in a good word. Dracus gestured up to the top of the stairs. Jugar looked up at the obviously still figure on the throne. I see, he said slowly, then began to speak more quickly. Say, um, how about if I surrender? Hey, there doesn't seem to be anyone else around here to do it. I can offer you the whole dwarven kingdom. Well, except for this hall. I like this venue. Did some of my best work here. The ability of sound to carry in this space is phenomenal. Take, for example, that tune I was just... Dracus leaped forward, grabbing the dwarf by his thick throat. The dwarf stumbled backward and fell, slamming down against the steps. Dracus pressed his face closer to the dwarf. "'sweat breaking on his brow as he spoke through clenched teeth. "'What were you singing?' he hissed at the dwarf. "'A tense silence descended in the hall. "'Ethis gazed questioningly at the human. "'Dracus?' "'But the dwarf was suddenly still. "'His eyes were shifting quickly, searching Dracus's face, "'but the rest of him lay absolutely still. "'I thought, just some old song, really?' Jugar said quietly at last, It's very old, very old indeed. I can't recall right now where it is from. Dracus's hands began to shake once more. Can you? The dwarf finished quietly. Dracus slowly released his grip on the dwarf. Jugar slowly sat up. Look, I couldn't help but overhear your predicament. You need a treasure, and it appears... Jugar said, looking about at the slaughter surrounding them. "'That I am out of a job. Could we strike a bargain? I ducked into a little gopher hole to stay out of the way of this war of yours. It is well hidden, and there's some pretty interesting loot in there, including—' The dwarf paused for dramatic emphasis. "'The Heart of Air!' The impress warriors looked at each other, and then back at the dwarf. "'The what?' Dracus asked at last. The heart of air, Jugar said, this time with as much exaggerated drama as he could muster, his hands quivering as he held them out. He dropped them at once, seeing he did not impress his audience. Oh, by Thelgorfson, you've never heard of the heart of air? Who's Thelgorfson? Thuri asked, rubbing his forehead. Jugar only glared at him. The heart of air is only the greatest, most secret treasure of the Nine Thrones. You could have named your price and still not come close to its value. Where is it? Belog said flatly. The dwarf kept his eyes on Dracus. 
Do we have a deal? My life for the greatest treasure of the dwarves. The human considered the dwarf carefully. I'll throw myself into the bargain as well, the dwarf added. Your master's new slave, eh? Belog rumbled deep in his throat. Uh, beware, Drakus. Dwarves never give a gift without being paid for it first. Drakus flexed his grip on his sword. Jugar swallowed, then spoke carefully. Maybe I could remember that song for you. The human raised his chin. Drakus, Ethis said, shaking his head. Maybe we should just— You have a deal, dwarf, Drakus said abruptly. The other warriors of his Octians spoke up all at once. Are you mad? You don't have the authority. You really believe that this fool literally— The Tribune will never allow. Deal, dwarf! Drakus repeated loudly, his voice cutting off further argument. But if this is all part of your supposedly clever amusement, know that I'm a very picky audience, and that I'd just as soon take your heart to my master as any heart of air. Now where is it? You won't regret this. Jugar grinned as he reached out for the stairs, feeling about the surface for a moment before he found what he was searching for. If you're looking for a treasure to take home to your master's fine estate, and uh, didn't you say you are from the western provinces, and prove how great warriors you are, then you couldn't do better than this. A loud hissing sound erupted from the stairs, blowing dust into the air as the carefully fitted stones of several steps suddenly descended into the floor. It was an opening, but all Dracus could see beyond the obscuring dust was a glowing light from a chamber within. Dracus glanced skeptically at the dwarf, took in a deep breath, and then turned toward the opening in the stairs. The passage behind was wide enough, but he had to crouch down to pass under its low ceiling. It was only a few steps, however, before he entered a larger vaulted chamber directly under the nine thrones. Alcoves surrounded the room, each holding ancient dwarven armor wrought of gold, silver, and platinum decorated with jewels. There were great tablets of gold carved with writing, the ancient laws of the mountain probably inscribed by the first dwarven king, old Brock himself. Many other glistening things lay about the room, but Dracus's eyes were fixed on the central object. It was difficult to look at. The black multifaceted onyx seemed to absorb the light that struck it. It floated between intricately carved white lattices of what appeared to be coral, one curving down from the ceiling, and the other up from the floor beneath. It was terrible and compelling all at once. Dracus hated it and had to possess it. Dracus! It was Thuri. Dracus had almost forgotten entirely where he was. He shouted over his shoulder. Amir! It looks like the Tribune came through at last. Scar has arrived with the Sixth Octian. Fury's words seemed to come to him from a great distance, though the Chimerian could only be a few yards away. They've got a proxy from another cohort, and Tribune Sajenka is demanding that we return at once. And so we shall. But first, get Ethis and Balog to come in here. Dracus shouted back. And don't forget that dwarf. The onyx heart of air spun before him. Dracus smiled. Looks like we're not going back empty-handed after all. Chapter 7 The Way Home Dracus tugged self-consciously at his tunic as he stepped from the command tent of Tribune Sajenka in one final, hopeless attempt to straighten it into a presentable state. He had managed to leave most of his badly mismatched armor with Thuri in the encampment, but three weeks of campaigning had left him looking very much the worse for wear. He also suspected that his smell had been increasingly offensive to the elven tribune with each passing minute of his report, though after the numerous campaigns Dracus had fought down the years of his service, he scarcely noticed it himself. Still, when dealing with the elves it was best to remember such things, and to have a sense about when one's masters were pleased— Though nothing in the elven tribune's words or countenance gave any sign of trouble, their orders were extraordinary. It all felt wrong. 
Now he stood once more outside the field tent of the Tribune, glowering at the cold, wet wind blowing from the west. A miserable storm had moved in earlier in the day. The Tribunes of the Imperial Legions made their encampment outside the enclosure of the common slave herd that made up their legions, finding a location that was both dominant and secure, looking on the battle from afar and remaining untouched by it. For this last of the dwarven campaigns, they had found a place from which they could lord over their warriors from a comfortable distance. Each tribune, for that matter, considered the placement of his personal command tent just another part of the strategy of war, a strategy that extended not only to the enemy, but to the combative politics of the elves among their own kind. Sajenka, tribune of House Timuron, had outmaneuvered the two hundred and forty-three other tribunes, placing his great tent so that it sat at the crest of the rise on the Hyperion Plain, its entrance commanding a view that overlooked the seven-league-wide valley to the north that ended in the abrupt and spectacular rise of the Aryan Range, granite peaks that stabbed the sky eight thousand feet above their base in some places. It was an advantageous position, putting the other tribunes, not to mention a great number of the tents of the various guilds and orders of the Imperium, at a disadvantage. That a tribune in charge of a single centauri in such an obscure house as Timuron should be able to place his tent in such a position was just another of the numerous mysteries about Sajenka. It was best, Dracus thought, to not think too long on questions to which the answers might be both painful and dangerous. He had trouble enough of his own without inviting more. Standing beneath the leaden sky, Dracus watched as the dark clouds hit the tops of the distant mountains and spat chill, intermittent rain and mist at him. He had to admit that he preferred it to the oppressive opulence of Sejinka's tent. Perhaps it was something within the elves, he pondered, that caused them to always go beyond what was needed. Anything worth doing was worth overdoing, was a creed that the elves followed with pride. They always seemed to press beyond all boundaries, he thought whether those of good taste or those of their conquered territories. Dracus preferred an honest, chill rain. He looked down from his tribune's tent onto the enclosure of the legion. The rambling clusters of warriors huddled together against the constant cold drizzle, or crowded into the few lean-tos they had hastily erected for themselves out of scavenged supply crates. Their misery extended well into the valley below, a panorama of spent fury, their fitful fires continuing to struggle against the drizzle. All around the perimeter stood the encircling totems of the Iblisi, the crystalline sentinels of the Imperial Legions. Perhaps that is why I am uneasy, Dracus thought to himself. I'm out where I don't belong. Nine notes, seven notes, the dark prize in sight. The dark prize is light. Five notes. Five notes. Dracus took a few gingerly placed paces down the slope, as much in an attempt to leave the song behind him as to bring himself to within a few steps of the twelve-foot-tall sentinel. It was one thing to let loose the warrior horde on the enemy, but otherwise the herd must be controlled. The sentinels were the totems that defined the boundaries of each slave's world. The face details were obscured by the soft violet glow emanating from within the crystal, and there was something about each of them that grew more repellent and loathsome the closer one approached. They marked the rightful limits of a slave's world, and each knew that to pass between sentinels unbidden was to die. Dracus took in a deep breath. Dracus, Shah Timuron. There passed an uncertain moment, and then the light within the sentinel flashed from violet to pale yellow. Dracus started breathing again and stepped quickly across the line between the sentinels and continued down the slope. It would take him half an hour just to make his way through the soaked army to his own centauri. He knew he needed to get moving faster, but his audience with Sejenka made him uncertain and hesitant. He shook with sudden violence in the rain. It wasn't just that he had been outside the Sentinel's protection and control. It was Sejenka's news that he and his Octian were being afforded a great honor. Dracus shook again. There was definitely something wrong. Hey, Dracus! 
Thuri shouted, standing up slowly from where he squatted next to the sputtering fire. How is life among members of the higher estates? Better than it is down here. Draca shot back as he slogged toward them through the ankle-deep mud between the tents. But when was that ever any different? Why the summons, Dracus? Belog was sullen and testy. The loss of his brother weighed heavily on the towering manticore. Dracus stopped and took a deep breath. His eye was caught by the wet flapping of the Centauri's battle flag from atop a tall pole planted angrily into the ground nearby. Elven symbols intertwined around a pair of crossed swords. What had once seemed so bright and inspiring now looked tarnished and old. He glanced around at the milling warriors all about him, then motioned Belog and the other two Chimera closer to him. We're going home, he said factually, keeping his voice low. Sejinka has ordered us back to House Timuron. We have an hour to secure our gear, resupply the packs if you can, and get the dwarf ready for accounting at Hyperion Fold Number 4. An hour? Thuri scoffed. Dracus, Ethis shrugged. We can't possibly get the entire Centauri ready to leave that soon. We're still missing three Octia. We have heard that they came back from the Dwarven Halls, but they haven't reported. They are coming with us. Dracus cut him off. What? Only our Octian is going back right now, Dracus said, his eyes blinking. But what about our loot? Ethis said. It has to be accounted and credited, prepared for transport. Already done, it seems, Dracus said. Already? What about the crown? Did Jarak get away with it? I don't know. All I was told is that all the prizes looted by every Octian of our Centauri have already been accounted, credited, and sent on to House Timuron. Well, well, that's more like it, Thuri said, the semblance of a smile forming on the featureless face of the Chimerian. A great honor. Perhaps that throwing the dwarven crown from the throne did connect with Jarok after all. <clears throat> Whatever the reason, Dracus said, clearing his throat. We're leaving right away, and there will be no time for devotions either. Not even at the field altar, Thuri groaned. I'm getting headaches. I need devotions. There's not enough time, Dracus said emphatically. Listen to me. We'll get our devotions soon enough, and not from some weak field altar, but straight from the house altar itself. He turned to the manticore standing next to him. Belog, I need you to find Jarok. He's the second Octian leader, and the two of you to round up the other cohort leaders of the Centauri. Bring them here in the next half hour. Belog straightened, lifting his snout into the air. Why should I? Because I was third behind Chukang and Krichan. Dracus hung his thumbs from his belt. They're both dead, which now makes me the Centauri captain. That was true in battle and is still true here. You're welcome to argue the point with Sajenka. I'm sure it would give him great pleasure to explain it to you. Belog's lips curled, but by the slow slump of the manicore's shoulders, Dracus knew he was still in charge. Jarak will be in charge of the Centauri after we've left. It will be his job to get them organized for transport over the next week. Maybe twelve days, depending on how crowded the Imperial folds get. Every cohort on the front is going to want to get home at the same time. Except for the four of us. Thuri's voice was uncertain. I guess Lord Timuron must have really missed your face, Thuri. Dracus spoke as lightly as he could manage. He arranged for our immediate passage, and from what I gather, the Meriden die who are mastering the folds are none too happy about it. So get moving and you may be back in time for house devotions tonight. Belog nodded once in deference to Dracus, before turning to run between the throngs of warriors milling about, his large feet kicking clumps of mud up behind him. Ethis quickly began to douse the already nearly dead fire, as Thuri collected several weapons from where they lay wrapped in an oilskin tarpaulin. Dracus stood for a moment, uncertain as to what to do next. The damnable song had returned again. He tried to push it out of his mind with thoughts of returning to his beloved Mala. What about him? Thuri said, nodding in the direction of the house standard. A waterlogged dwarf in outlandish costume sat with his back to the pole, his hands tied around it behind him, 
Water drizzled down from the leaden Timuron battle standard and directly onto Jugar's once glorious hat. Now the dwarf's entire outfit seemed to sag right along with him. The soaked brim flopped down over the creature's eyes, making it impossible for him to see anything. Hello! called the damp dwarf from under his badly sagging hat. May I help you? I'd be delighted to direct you to the valuables, but there aren't any here. They took them all this morning. Only this sorry dwarf remains. Dracus huffed with irritation and strode over to where the dwarf sat in the mud. He reached down to yank the hat off the dwarf's head, but a pool of water had gathered in its crown. As a result, the hat only came away after sending a sizable body of water splashing down on the miserable dwarf's head. Sorry. Dracus said. The dwarf vigorously shook his head, spraying water about, which, given the conditions in the drenched field, made little difference. He blinked the water out of his eyes, and then looked up. Ah, Dracus, splendid. As you can see, I've been working on a particularly remarkable escape trick for my new act. It's not quite finished yet, but I'm hoping to have the little problems worked out before my next engagement. So, please tell me, my victorious friend, where have you put all that glorious treasure to which I so generously led you? Dracus shook his head and then squatted down, wet dwarven hat still in hand. You dwarves, I'll never understand you. Here you are, tied up and sitting in the mud, a conquered slave of the imperial will. And all you want to know about is where we put some treasure that's no longer yours. Yes, said the dwarf, a strange intensity behind his smile. Exactly. <laughs> so tell me. Dragus leaned back casually, but his eyes were fixed on the dwarf. It's gone, as you already pointed out. Spoils of war are the first to be sent back through the imperial folds. I see, Jugar said quietly, his smile becoming more affected by the moment. Slaves, no doubt, are not as valuable as dwarven plunder, eh? Dracus chuckled darkly. <laughs> the value of each house's slaves is already counted to them, for the spoils of war have to be tallied and accounted to the honor of each house. It's the elven way of power, this counting of honors. Your precious jeweled armor and heart stone. Heart of Ea. Jugar corrected with quiet politeness. Whatever it is called, Draca shrugged. It all belongs to the greater glory of House Timuron now. But it is actually being sent to this House Timuron of yours, isn't it? The dwarf's voice was urging, a strange pleading quality somewhere under all the words. I understand that this has long been the elven way of it, the same house of your elven lord to which we all shall be going. Of course, Dracus said evenly, his eyes narrowing slightly. Why? Oh, just a dwarf's curiosity. Jugar smiled back, his white beard sagging under the weight of the water it carried, and what remained of his hair flat against his head. I thought I might be able to work it somewhere into my act. You know, when you present your lord, pardon me, our lord, with all the glorious trophies you have secured in your battles. After all, I am one of those trophies, and I want to make a good impression, uh, right there along with all the other treasures. Mm, of course, it's going to be difficult making myself presentable, tied as I am to this pole. I'm curious as to why you feel the need to bind me. You're the one treasure we're bringing back with quick legs and a quicker tongue. I just want to make sure you stay with me. The dwarf smiled again. But where would I go? Your Iblisi totems keep you and me both safely confined to this damp and overcrowded field along with the rest of the slaves. Dracus's eyes narrowed. You know about the totems? But of course! The dwarf shifted slightly around the pole so that he could better face the warrior. We dwarves have something very like them, which we use to pen our livestock and hogs. I've often wondered why the slaves of the elves never escaped their captivity, but as a vaunted warrior, such thoughts may never have come to you. Still, you should untie me. You see, I don't want to escape. I just want to be a part of the glory of House Timuron and my, rather, its treasures. Uh-huh. Dracus was unconvinced. Jugu, 
Juga, the dwarf corrected helpfully. Juga, then, Dracus continued. I don't know what you think is going to happen, but there are two conditions for slaves of the Elven Empire, obedient and dead. Oh, I'm not worried. The dwarf grinned, showing wide, spaced teeth that were perfectly even. Heroes die, kings die, monsters and villains, they all die. No one ever kills the fool. That's where you're wrong, Dracus said quietly. I watch fools die every day, for as long as I can remember. Now that is an interesting point, Jugar interrupted. Dracus shook his head and tried again. What I was saying... For as long as I can remember. Exactly! Jugar shouted enthusiastically. You've been on this campaign for what? One or two weeks? Three, but that's not... Three weeks? That's a long time without house devotions. The dwarf sounded impressed. And how long since field devotions at that portable altar of your most noble tribune? Four days, Dracus replied, squinting at the dwarf. What is your point? The point is that I can tell you a great secret that I'm sure is entirely new to your experience. There's nothing you can tell me, dwarf. Oh, but I can, smiled Jugar. I can tell you about that song you have whirling about in your head. Better still, I can tell you with absolute certainty that everything you remember, every kiss, every hurt, every victory, and every failure that happened to you prior to four days ago, is a lie. My <laughs> entire life, a lie, Draco scoffed. Up until four days ago, the dwarf said in a husky whisper, None of it was real. Dracus leaned down, his face so close that his breath shook the large drip forming at the end of the dwarf's nose. The only lie here is your foolish stories, but you're about to learn how real your own life has become, fool. Chapter 8 Myths, Legends, and Nonsense While every tribune was capable, indeed required, to create folds during the battle for the warriors in their command, it was the imperial folds that brought the tribunes and their armies to the battle itself. These networks of larger folds had the enormous power to compress distances leagues long and large enough to march the centauri of the legions through them four abreast, and still never touched the sides. Five of these opened directly to the plain just to the east of the encampment, each one a major tributary to the nexus of imperial military might. Stepping through to the other side of these folds would take the warriors to one of many widely separated staging areas, near the Hyperion and Chenandrian borders. These marshalling fields had tributaries of their own, smaller folds, each of which led to other smaller and smaller tributary rally points, until the final narrow warrior folds of individual elven neighborhoods or settlement communities. These final folds were always located in a small temple well outside the walls of the individual house strongholds, the last step in the long journey home. For the war of the Ninth Throne, the honor of bringing these warriors into battle, of planning the placement of the folds, setting up the fold platforms, linking them to the magical conduits of the Aether Wells, and administering the folds through an organization of fold masters had been granted by the imperial will to the order of the Myrdin Dai. These guardians of the well vied with another order, the O Kuran, for control of the Aether, that magical force that was the foundation of the Ronas Empire. Their appointment to this calling had set many tongues of the court to wagging, whispering in the halls of power that the O Kuran may at last have fallen from imperial favor. The Myrdin Dai responded to the Imperial Nod enthusiastically, and erected a network of folds that drew impress warriors from each house of the Ronas Empire, and delivered them to the field of battle with swift efficiency. Returning them from the field of battle, however, was another matter. I don't care who you are, what your orders say, or who gave them, 
snorted the manticore standing in front of Dracus. A weathered sash that once may have been red was draped across his broad, furry chest. He thumped his big fist against the sash once more for emphasis. I'm the field marshal here, and I've got seven centauri to process before I can even think about letting you near one of my folds. Get back with your centauri and wait to be called. Marshal Korang, Dracus said, his patience nearly spent. As I told you before, our centauri is still at the front. We're just one Octian, but we've been ordered back to our master's house now. We've been through three folds already today just to get to this rally field, and we've got four more to go before we get back to House Timuron. The Myrdin Dai approved it, and the fold masters know all about it. All we need is to bring five of us through the Stelamir fold. Not an entire centauri, just Five of us through, and will be no further problem for you. Mmm, the regular. Korong rumbled. I agree, Dracus replied. Nevertheless, those are my orders. I'm warning you, Korong said, his eyes narrowing. I'm going to check on all this with the fold masters. They won't like it if you're lying. Fine, Dracus shot back. Just get it done. Oh, I will, the manticore roared. And until I have, you go back and wait with the rest of your centauri until I return. But I'm not with my... Oh, just go and ask the fold masters. Draco snapped. Then you come and find me. I'll be on the east side of the clearing. You do know which way's east, don't you? Korong growled menacingly, but only turned away. Draco turned as well, stalking off through the crowded field. The sun had vanished beyond the western horizon, leaving only a rich twilight illuminating the clear skies overhead. Jolnar, the wandering star of destiny, was just appearing in the sky. Dracus considered it for a moment. Jolnar is seen from woeful lands of pain, but also from far-off shores, where call seas of sand, where winds of soft lament... The music filling his mind now seemed to come from a place far away and barely imagined, a better and softer place. He hated the star in that moment, because in its alluring promise he felt a vague sadness and dissatisfaction with his life that he had not felt before. Dracus lowered his eyes to the more immediate concerns of picking his way through the milling warriors crowding the large meadow, each one waiting his turn to pass through the next fold and come closer to home. This place, he thought, may have actually been beautiful once. A great grassy expanse surrounded by tall, beautiful trees. He could imagine it a quiet place, filled only with soft sounds and a gentle breeze. The coming of the marshalling field changed all that. The Myrdin Dai had decided on this place as a rally point, the confluence of several smaller folds to bring impress warriors from other marshalling fields together consolidating their force to move into a single fold to the next field. Since then, an army had trodden down the once soft grasses and the delicate flowers as first they came, and now they left. The leaving may even have been the worst of it, for masses of troops were coming through the large fold, and it was taking time to sort them into the appropriate smaller folds to send them correctly on to the next part of their journey. Unfortunately, the Myrdin Dai had underestimated the area required for this marshalling field and had placed their totems in too small a circle. Worse yet, earlier mistakes required sending units back through the folds, which caused further delays. The result was that many of the warriors had settled into crowded encampments, awaiting their turn to move on, filling what had once been a meadow with listless, uncomfortable, and quarrelsome warriors. At last he came to the edge of the meadow and a small hollow just short of the tree line and the ever watchful crystal sentinel totems. A campfire burned in the center of a circle of stones, illuminating the small group gathered around it. Well, it's going to be a while, my brother Shah Timuron, Draco said as he approached. Why? Belog asked, straightening up from tending the blaze. What is it this time? Would you be surprised to hear I found someone incompetent in charge? Belog laughed deeply. Ha! Ha 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 Among the legions of the Emperor, 
I'd have been surprised if you hadn't. Dracus smiled back at the manticore. The field marshal has gone off to find one of the Myrdin Dai to ask about our special arrangement, and he's the second one today to do that. With four more folds ahead of us, I don't know how long this is going to take. It might have been faster just to come back with the rest of the centauri. Maybe they'll pass us on their way home. Belog shrugged. Dracus nodded with a laugh and then turned toward the chimera. Both were leaning comfortably against small stacks of their field packs. Dracus pointed toward the dwarf sitting between them on the ground. Ah, uh, don't you think that's a bit much? Fury and Ethis each held separate ropes around the bound hands and feet of the dwarf. A gag was tied tightly over his mouth. Ethis considered the prisoner for a moment before replying, No, it seems a reasonable precaution. Why, what did he do? Draca said. The Chimera looked at each other, their blank faces considering for a moment. He kept promising not to escape. Thuri answered at last. He promised not to escape? Dracus asked, his brow furrowed with the puzzle. And so you tied him up? He wouldn't shut up about it, Ethis replied, his large eyes blinking indignantly. He kept going on and on about how we could trust him and how he had nowhere to run and how he was glad it was us who took him as a slave captive of the war. It was unnerving, Thury finished. Draco shook his head. Fine, keep his hands and feet bound if you must, but we've got to feed him. We need him alive, if only to explain to Lord Timuron why the prize we sent to him is a valuable treasure. Thury shrugged and reached over with his second right hand to tug at the knot. After a few moments' struggle, the knot had been tied rather tightly, it gave way. Thury yanked the gag clear. Oh, thank you, Master Dracus. No, Master, Dracus replied flatly. Just Dracus. We're all slaves here, and you had best remember that includes you. Of course, forgive me. Jugar nodded vigorously. Brothers together, bound in war and circumstance. Slaves are we all to the fates. Jolnar himself looks down upon us, does he not? An omen of our emerging destinies? Belog and the Chimera all glanced up into the deepening blue of the sky, the wandering star shining above the darkened silhouette of the treetops. Dracus did not look up, but considered the dwarf. You know of the gods? Oh, I know much of the gods! Jugar smiled, his eyes shining. We are on good terms. All fools are watched over by the gods. Jolna, Sajera, Minera, even Ron himself look favorably upon fools, but most of all, Kin. The wise one, Ethis scoffed. Why would Kin favor a fool? Oh, Kin values fools most of all, Jugar said, tilting his head to one side as he spoke. He trusts the fools to live and learn. In them he holds his trust to remember the things that were forgotten, of the time when the plains of all Chenandria shook beneath the mighty armies of the Manticores, the armor of their fathers and their fathers' fathers shining in the bright sun as they ran to war, singing to the spirits that ran with them and made their armor bright and their weapons keen. Their manes were long, flying behind them, and they ran into glory in defense of their clan pride. Their might was great, and the prides were free to make war as they saw it. Their ships sailed the Sea of Benis, and their justice was feared. This was long ago, long before the Ronas elves came to Palandria and made it their own. The log snorted. <laughs> You are a fool. Ronas conquered Chenandria to civilize the Manticores. We were a backward, violent race, destroying everything we touched. Becoming a part of the greater Ronas Imperium brought justice to my race. Jugar considered the Manticore before he spoke. Of course, so say the Ronas, and thus it must be so. I am only a fool telling the tales of a fool, but that is how the gods have made me, and so I must be. Keen himself would tell you of an ancient time, long before the elves had formed more than tribes, when manticores, chimera, and dwarves— Dwarves? 
Thuri laughed in surprise. Yes, and dwarves! Jugar nodded earnestly as he continued. Together they built a great civilization of their own. Its name is difficult for us to pronounce and lost to the knowledge of the Ronas, but its name meant the peace of reasoned thought, and it ruled in glory for nearly three hundred years. The Ronas have torn down its towers and walls until all evidence of its existence has vanished from its conquered lands, but in the wild lands beyond the Ronas Imperium its glories are said to be found still. An ancient lost empire of invisible buildings. Ethis scoffed, poking at the fire with a long stick. How convenient. Yet that was nothing compared to the humans. Jugar said in hushed tones, leaning forward toward the fire, its light playing on his ancient, craggy face. It was the humans who created the greatest empire ever seen on the face of the world. It was they who fought the dragons of the north and won their respect. They alone stood up against the expansion of Ronas, for their empire was mightier than the dwarves, manticores, and chimera combined. Jugar paused for effect, taking in a deep breath. The silence was broken suddenly by outraged laughter. <laughs> Humans! A great empire! Belog roared, his large hands grasping at his belly as he laughed uncontrollably. Ooh! <laughs> Fear the terrible two-armed beast! Ethis hooted, throwing his four arms up in mock alarm. The brittle-boned warrior in his might! Hey, stop it! Thuri said, through an irrepressible grin that broke into laughter as well. It's not... <laughs> it's not that funny! <laughs> the empire is probably invisible, too! <laughs> Belog snorted loudly, his side beginning to hurt. The gods know their hordes of humans are not to be seen. <laughs> no, you don't understand. Jugar shouted into the hilarity that swirled around him. I can prove it to you. I can show you. Show us your invisible kingdom. Ethis nearly choked. We're probably in it right now, eh, Thori? <laughs> Belog shook with laughter. What a fool! <laughs> Jugar sighed and caught sight of Dracus. The human was not laughing, but rather staring angrily back at the dwarf. I can show you! Jugar said emphatically to Dracus, his words nearly buried by the laughter that still rang around him. Believe me, I can show you! But Dracus just turned and walked into the complete darkness that had finally fallen over the meadow.